I got my PhD from the Stockholm Royal Institute of Technology and finished my postdoctoral work at the University of Bern in Switzerland in 2015. I won't go into detail, but my work centered around electromagnetic disruption and practical electromedical application. Chances are that if you check Google Scholar for these keywords, my name will pop up as a co-author on at least one of the top five results. However, in early December of 2016, I was in an accident. I was staying overnight for a conference in Copenhagen, where a colleague of mine had rented a large apartment. However, due to an electrical error, there was heat buildup in the main water heater, causing a steam explosion. I was sleeping pretty much wall to wall with it. My face and shoulders took the main brunt of the boiling water, steam, and pressure. The last thing I remember seeing was a bright light, followed by a sudden and complete dark. I had to go through evisceration and enucleation of both eyes. I lost eight teeth on the right side of my face and most of my nose. At least 20% of the body fat in my right arm was burned off. The reconstructive surgery of my face took a team of surgeons 18 hours. This was followed by months of just trying to survive. Moving back in with my family and going through cosmetic surgery, mainly for my face. To this day, I still have no idea what was said at the conference. After a few months, I was fitted for double eye prosthetics. It took a total of three months before I was even given the option to start the therapy. I'm not going to lie, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Most people who are legally blind can still perceive some kind of light, but complete blindness, about 7% of us, is one step further. One day I could be suicidal, and the next day I was determined to learn Braille. Because of the damage to my eyelids, the surgeons opted to connect new tear ducts to my nose so crying just made my nose runny. Three years later, I was in a much better state of mind. Although sudden blindness isn't something you ever really adapt to, I was doing better. I still wasn't ready to go out on my own, but with a friend or family member just to help me along, I could go pretty far. I also learned to appreciate all those weird accessibility options that come with most computers. You have no idea. In autumn of 2019, I was contacted by a man who told me he represented a group associated with a renewable energy research. Living in Sweden, renewable energy is a big deal, and it is something I've personally been interested in. In fact, it was going to be the subject of my next article just before the accident. The man offered me a job. He told me that he worked at a lab with disabled scientists and that my expertise was in high demand. The pay was more than generous, and as a benefit package, I would be given a personal assistant. Pay for an off-site, two-bedroom apartment was also part of the benefits. I agreed to have an interview. The man who was going to interview me was clearly from another country, but he was ready to fly out to meet me at short notice. He came to visit the very next day. We had a private conversation at my parents' house. He asked a lot of questions about my work, and I could hear him tapping away at a touch screen. We discussed some of the details, but there was one thing he consciously seemed to avoid. Where the main labs located. He seemed uncomfortable talking about it, but he promised that I would be given a private flight wherever I wanted during downtime off-site. There would be four weeks of work on-site, living in the apartment outside the main lab, followed by two weeks off-site, kind of like paid vacation. I would be in rotating shifts with one morning, midday, evening, and night shift. The weirdest thing was revealed just as I was about to accept the offer. Every single scientist at the main lab was completely blind. I accepted the offer. The next week I was picked up by the same man, let's call him Samuel, and taken to a private flight. I still had no idea where we were going, but other passengers were speaking an Asian language. In Indonesian, I think? On the flight, I was introduced to my personal assistant, Mila. I think she was Australian. Mila was a darling. She knew exactly what to say and when to help me, but most importantly, she knew when to give me space. It was as if she could read my discomfort on my, albeit reconstructed, face and just acted on it immediately. She must have had a lot of experience working with the visually impaired. 
My first few days were mostly orientation and introductions. I would be working with a team of two other scientists and seven assistants, two each, one general. Apparently our personal assistants would not be available while in the lab, but they would be on call as soon as we went off site. They would also help us with cooking, cleaning, whatever we wanted. It was a big operation. A total of 40 people just in the main building, all completely blind. At least a hundred others. With the pay we were getting and the benefits, this was a very expensive project. We were talking millions, possibly tens of millions. My team would be working with material research. As Samuel explained, they were developing a new type of material as part of a renewable energy tech. They weren't completely clear on the possible end result, but the metal we would be testing was told to be unique, extremely valuable, and uncomfortably bright. Apparently it could cause blindness during prolonged exposure, which was the main reason they'd put together a team of blind scientists. During my first day at the facility, I was given plenty of time to adapt. The other members of my team were just as new as I was, but we were given radio instructions how to move through the various corridors. There was a decontamination room, without protective suits, and we were told to follow guiding pipes along the walls. On the left were cold pipes, on the right were warm. Three pipes on each side, leading to a total of six rooms. The pipes had square, circle, and triangle engravings, making it easier for us to find our main room. We were team warm triangles. The work itself wasn't that bad. Mostly just repetitive. The test object was isolated in a separate room, but we could check it through samples, material exposures, and readings. We were all given separate workstations and hearing equipment so we could isolate the sounds of our specific assistants, and just to make sure our computer equipment wouldn't read over one another. We had buttons on our headsets to adjust who could listen in, and to mute certain sounds. It took a lot of time to adapt to it. There were at least 50 codes to memorize. I got to know my assistants fairly well. There was Aaron, an American, and Holger, a Norwegian. They were both older than me and both had master's degrees. They were quick to follow directions and equally quick to offer suggestions. I could tell they were having some authority issues, but they didn't make it a problem. And the first three week-long shifts were fine. We went from midday to evening to night. The night shift was, of course, the toughest. By now, I was getting to know the place and the routine. I had noticed a few things during my testing, but also just from the context of what was being talked about in the facility. The seventh assistant would come down with lunches for us, and we ate in a small common room, warm circle, where we would talk more freely about what we'd learned. We never changed from warm triangle as our main room, even when we changed shifts. The whole setup was weird. The material was extremely reflective. From the way it was tested, it seemed rectangular in shape and thin. My colleagues talked about it possibly being similar to a pane of glass. The material had several strange properties. It would absorb light, but dissipated almost instantly. It would, to some degree, also absorb electric energy, low-level radiation, and radio waves. I'd never seen anything like it, if you pardon the expression. By chance, we also discovered a peculiar feature. The object, by now called the pain, briefly absorbed sound waves and would reflect it back after a few seconds, like a delayed echo but slightly distorted, kind of like it had been run through an underwater filter, bouncing between sheets of metal. If I said hello, I would hear a clear but lower hello right back after about eight seconds, this being despite me standing no less than ten feet away from the object made no sense. Once during the night shift, Holger fell ill. It wasn't bad, just a light case of pneumonia, but the company had a zero-tolerance policy for sickness in the workplace. He got the week off at his apartment, and I had to work with one less assistant. It delayed my progress somewhat, but Aaron was eager to make up for lost time. Too eager, it turns out. On the second to last day of the night shift, Aaron accidentally caused a power outage. We were pressure testing the object when Aaron slipped and knocked over some volatile materials at another workstation. Nothing happened explosion-wise, but the entire room went into immediate lockdown and the power was shut off. 
the door shut and locked from the outside. I didn't notice the lights go off, but I could feel the room quickly growing cold. It occurred to me that the object was probably absorbing the warmth, and there was no climate control to compensate anymore. Then something weird happened. We were all quietly sitting, and our headsets being turned off, and waiting for the power to come back on. And that's when I heard something. Hello? It was the same off-putting, distorted voice that I had thought was a delayed echo. One of my colleagues, Gertrude, responded with a hello right back. I heard four quick footsteps like the start of a drum roll, and something slamming into the glass separating us from the object, something squishy. Hello? Now we stayed quiet. The footsteps came in quick bursts, pacing back and forth, looking for weaknesses in the glass. We usually use small airlocks to put in samples to test. We had two airlocks, and the leftmost one was attacked. I could hear something rattling the airlock, trying to rip it loose. Hello? I could hear the grinding sound of metal being bent. I pressed myself against the wall, holding my breath. The power came back with a vengeance. My headphones were full of people screaming. Evacuation protocol initiated. Proceed to... Get out! Get the fuck out! Warm triangle. Respond immediately. I repeat. Half the voices were in a foreign language. We ran for the door. I didn't need to follow the pipes to get back to the decontamination room. But only then did I notice we were one person short. We'd lost Gertrude. Once outside, we were separated and isolated. Standing outside in freezing temperatures, I was stripped naked. Several people, all screaming in a foreign language, lifted my arms and legs to check me from my feet all the way to my hair. I was forced into a plastic tent where they shaved my head, forced my mouth open, and checked my teeth. My ears were cleaned with some sort of antiseptic, and my eye prosthetics were discarded completely. It was quick, violent, and terrifying. I was locked inside my apartment for the rest of the night. Mila came around to help me, but she told me she was instructed not to talk about my work under any circumstances. That's when I first suspected that my apartment was bugged. I spent a week in that apartment with daily checkups. I felt fine, but the entire ordeal was stressing me out. Having my head shaved was uncomfortable, and I was scared they might find something they wouldn't like. After that one week, I was suddenly told that it was necessary to terminate my position. I didn't recognize the voice of the man telling me this. I was given four months of full pay, an apology, a non-disclosure agreement, and an immediate flight back home. Mila was holding back tears, trying to help me pack. She seemed frightened. I've been home ever since, but I come to you to share my story. I've been doing my best to stay financially independent, but life hasn't been treating me well. I'm still having stress reactions. And there's been a recent development that I don't know how to deal with. Last night, as I was brushing my teeth, the power went out. I could hear the air conditioner and dryer suddenly go quiet, and the entire room felt colder. Except for the bathroom mirror, which radiated a slight heat. I stretched my hand out to touch it. This might be hard to understand for someone who doesn't think about their sense of touch too often. But I've touched that mirror every night for years... I knew exactly where my hand was in the space of the room, and there was there was no mirror where my hand was. Still, I touched it. Every part of my finger touched something extruding from the mirror's surface. Something with rounded edges. And then it made a sound. Hello? The murky shoreline was swarming with cops and crime scene officials, their voices mingling with the droning buzz of mosquitoes and the bellow of bullfrogs in the marsh. As I approached, I heard the sound of someone retching and spitting into the nearby weeds. I spotted the source of the noise and went over to find my weak stomach deputy throwing up in the reeds. Whether it was from something he'd seen or from his drinking the night before, I'd find out soon enough. Last thing we need is more DNA fouling up the crime scene, I told him. Get back in the car if you can't keep your breakfast down. His eyes were red-rimmed from lack of sleep, which confirmed to me he'd been drinking. But that was nothing new. 
Randy always wound up with a bottle in his hand after hours. He was a functioning alcoholic, but just barely. And I needed a reliable deputy for this case. The things this psychopath was leaving behind in his wake were disturbing, to say the least. Sorry, boss. I'll be alright, Randy said. Prepare yourself, that's, that's all I'm gonna say. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and took a deep breath. Then the two of us approached the crime scene together. Immediately I understood why he was sick to his stomach. And despite what drinking he might have done the night before, the vomiting wasn't the result of that. A man's pale, waterlogged face stared up at me from inside a boat which had been dragged into the water. Only his head, hands, and feet could be seen poking out from the hull. The rest of his body was obscured by another boat which had been laid on top of him, crushing his torso, arms, and legs. What the hell am I looking at here? I asked, feeling last night's dinner rising up in my gorge. The coroner gave me an odd look, then hooked his thumb over his shoulder, pointing at the man behind him. Ask Sherlock Holmes over there. Slightly annoyed at the deferral, I looked to see where Bill was pointing then noticed for the first time the navy blue jacket with the letters FBI on the back. Hey, you with the bureau? I asked, holding out my hand. I'm the sheriff. The man stayed stubbornly hunched over, ignoring me while he examined some clue. I cleared my throat to no response. Tapping on the man's shoulder, he finally turned around, and I saw he had a pair of wireless earbuds in and was listening to music. When he saw me, he pulled the headphones out of his ears and stuck out his hand to shake mine. Sorry about that. It helps me concentrate. I'm Leonard Finch, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your boss called for us, said you didn't want the help, but he thought you needed it. I tried not to wince. Well, we appreciate any assistance we can get. Uh, Bill, the coroner, he, he said you could give me something to go on here. The man motioned with his hands toward the victim boats, he said simply, as if that explained everything. I I'm sorry, what about the boats? The boats? You've never heard of it? Fairly straightforward as far as Roman torture methods go. At least, I'm assuming that's what we've got here. We'll have to lift up the top boat to be sure. He took a minute to explain briefly what he meant and what would need to be done. Alright, let's do it. Everybody get what they need? I asked the coroner and crime scene investigators. We need to lift this off the victim to get a better look. After several more minutes of formalities, some final pictures were taken, and then several of us went around the size of the boat to lift the top vessel from its position where it had been left, crushing the man. As we began to heave and lift with all of our strength, the agent talked in the background, almost to himself. Invented by the ancient Romans, the boats was a method of torture which involved crushing a man by sandwiching him between two boats, the top one to keep him in place for part two of the procedure. The boats are dragged into a swamp with the man's hands, head, and feet hanging out from the end. His extremities are painted with honey to attract the insects and animals. The Romans would then force-feed their victim warm milk and honey, a powerful laxative, and with that the real entertainment begins. Drawn in by the smell of food, swamp vermin enter the boat and begin to feed on the victim. He is kept alive through the entire ordeal, so that he feels everything. Essentially, the subject is eaten alive by rats, mice, and swamp creatures, while buried up to his neck in his own shit. The process takes a long time, prolonging the suffering of the victim. We lifted the top boat as he finished speaking, and hundreds of rats... Mice, insects, and snakes suddenly began to pour and tumble over the sides, scurrying away from their prize. The body was exactly as described, partially eaten by vermin and submerged in a cesspool of body fluids. It stunk worse than anything I'd ever experienced in my life. The sewage smell mixed with blood and the sweetness of honey that was cloying and made my head feel like it was swimming. The faces around me turned pale and slightly gray at the horrifying sight of the victim and all of us hurried out of the algae-coated water. I saw rats swarming in the green muck by our feet, racing back onto dry land, and away from all the lights and commotion. 
Several people who I knew to be consummate professionals ran away from the scene, screaming and cursing loudly. A moment later, I ran over to vomit in the exact same spot where Randy had been when I arrived. When I looked back, I saw the FBI agent was shaking his head, looking annoyed. Thanks for adding some more DNA to the crime scene, Sheriff. That's very helpful. Later that morning, with the crime scene sufficiently scoured for evidence, I began heading back up the slope towards my car. Agent Finch was calling me from the water, hurrying to catch up with me. Sorry about earlier, Sheriff, he said. Sometimes I forget that not everyone sees the same things I do on a daily basis. That's no excuse for being an asshole, though. I think I'm being funny sometimes when, really, I'm just being obnoxious. At least that's what my wife tells me. I laughed at the self-deprecating comment. She's a smart woman, I thought to myself. Hey, it's okay. I told the same thing to my deputy when I caught him puking his guts out in pretty much that exact same spot. I guess I shouldn't be so hard on the guy. That's your job, isn't it? You're his boss, after all, aren't you? Yeah, I guess that's true enough. Hey, where are you headed? He asked. I was thinking maybe I could share a ride with you, if you don't mind. That way I can pick your brain a little bit. Find out what you know about the investigation so far. I've read your paperwork very thorough, by the way. But there's no substitute for a face-to-face -face debrief, in my experience. Of course, I replied, holding the passenger door open for him. What about your car? Do you, do you want me to get somebody to drive it back to the station for you? No need. I got a ride here from the diner with someone. Very friendly town you have here. You should see it after dark, I thought to myself. On second thought, maybe not. Hollow's End was not particularly kind to outsiders after dark. Was I the last one to find out that this FBI agent was in town? Suddenly it seemed to me like everybody knew about him but me. Alright, hop in. I'm going to the morgue, though. I, I wanted to look at the other body for comparisons. Good thinking. I was considering doing the same. Great minds, Sheriff. Great minds think alike. I reversed and turned around on the narrow dirt strip which led through the forest. The birch trees were close on both sides of the car, and occasionally the branches of bone-white saplings scraped the glass as we drove. So have you ever seen anything like this? Agent Finch seemed to think about this. Once. A couple hundred miles from here. We got called in to consult on a case, and the M.O. was similar, to say the least. Same guy, you think? It feels like it. They never did catch him. We stayed in town for a few weeks, but by then he must have gotten out, knew we were looking for him, decided to skip town. How long ago was that? A year and a half, give or take. Long enough for the sick bastard's urge to become overwhelming again. It was only a matter of time before he came out of hiding. The really talented ones can never stop for very long. They crave the next kill, and that craving gets to become a hunger. A hunger they can't ignore. How do you know it's him? Agent Finch sighed, looking out the window at the passing trees. I don't. Not for sure. But there aren't many serial killers who use ancient Roman torture methods to murder their victims. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's only one. So your guy's in our town now? Looks that way. And I don't think he's going to pack up and leave quite so quickly this time. He's gotten bolder. More brazen. It's like he wants to be caught. What do you mean? Simple. For the boats to work, he'd have to stay with the victim. He'd have to have stood there, force-feeding him the milk and honey for hours until he died. It's not a slow way to go. Shit. Just imagine the screaming. Listening to that for hours. Not getting scared of being caught. Not running. Just continuing to torture this poor, innocent man. Despite his pleas for mercy and the chances of becoming arrested. He's committed. 
He's emotionless. Psychopathic. And you're positive it's the same man? What about a copycat? The details of that case were never released to the public. And what are the chances of two perps using ancient torture methods to kill people totally independent of each other? Slim to nil. Exactly. Hey, that reminds me. Why don't you stop by the motel where I'm staying on the way? I can grab my case files from that one and we can compare notes. We can see if anything lines up. Anything to catch this freak. I said, spotting the motel up ahead and turning into the gravel lot. Pull around back. The owner said they're paving the lot today. I asked if I could keep the car out of the way for the estimate. No problem, I told him, pulling around to the back of the building. The motel was abandoned. Joy Burton, the owner of the place who ran the desk, wasn't in by the looks of things. There were some old stacks of scrap wood and cardboard leaning up against the back of the building, behind a tattered couch. I parked next to it and put the Crown Victoria in park, then turned off the engine. As I turned the key, I felt a sting in the side of my neck, like a bee. I looked over at Agent Finch and saw him pocketing the hypodermic needle he had just injected me with. My eyes started to blur and my arms grew heavy as I tried to take a swing at him, realizing too late what was happening. The punch I threw landed in his lap, soft as if I were trying to pet a cat. Despite my efforts, I felt my eyes closing, and the world went dark. When I woke up, I was strapped to a bed. My own sock was stuffed into my mouth to create a foul-smelling gag. I coughed and tried to spit it out, but found it was duct-taped securely to my head. You small-town cops really are stupid, you know that? The voice from across the room was mocking and unkind. I recognized it right away as Agent Finch although I had a growing suspicion that that was not his real name. Another noise was constant beneath his voice and the hum of the furnace below us. It was the squeaking sounds of rats in a nearby cage. It's funny how you can just show up in a blue jacket, screen printed with an FBI crest and some letters on the back, and everybody believes you at your word. You didn't even ask to see my ID. And your subordinate couldn't tell the difference between mine and a real badge. The feelings of self-loathing at that moment were severe, but I tried to ignore my own internal judgments about myself. This was not the time for a pity party. My life was in the balance, and it was likely about to be ended by this maniac in a horrifying and gruesome fashion. I have studied history for decades, Sheriff. I have immersed myself in literature covering... Every area, culture, creed, race, and dynasty since the beginning of recorded history. But one area always specifically piqued my interest, surpassing all others. Torture. All the various methods we've come up with to inflict pain and suffering and to prolong that pain, to draw it out endlessly. I was getting a feeling those pet rats were not meant for companionship. The Spanish Inquisition had some inventive techniques. The heretic's fork, for instance, he said, holding up a long, thick fork with tines on both ends. This is wedged between the subject's chin and breastbone, preventing them from speaking or sleeping. Any movement causes the blades to dig deeper. Great for interrogations, but dull. Simple. One note, like a plain cheese pizza. No complexity. He threw it over his shoulder as if bored with it. Now the Romans and the Greeks, they were the most creative, debatably. The brazen bull, leather-peeling, pile-driving, wheel-breaking, sawing people in half. <laughs> I mean, who comes up with this shit? The man looked to be enjoying himself as he pulled a squeaking rat from the cage and brought it over to me, settling it down on my stomach as I squirmed. This method is by far my favorite. There isn't really a name for it. It's just called rat torture, more or less. We're not even really sure who came up with it. Maybe the British. He took a steel bucket from the floor nearby and set it over the rat on my belly. 
It immediately started to squeak and scratch at my skin, scared of the dark. I tried to scream, but no sound came out as the sweaty sock muffled my voice. Essentially, as you might have guessed, you place a rat on the victim's belly. Then you put a bucket over the rat. Can you guess what happens next, Sheriff? He picked up a large torch connected to a tank of butane. I shook my head violently back and forth as he smiled. Sure you can guess. Here, I'll show you. He turned on the torch and held it up to the steel bucket, singeing it black. The rat inside the bucket squeaked curiously a few times, then began to pace, scratching at the corners where the steel met my skin. It was already starting to get hot. With nowhere to go, the victim will begin to dig down instinctively. Don't worry, Sheriff. That rat will be just fine. They aren't harmed during this procedure. You see, once it gets warm under that bucket, he'll burrow into you, and pretty soon he'll find his way into your belly, where the temperature is kinder. His eyes betrayed no emotion. It didn't look like he was enjoying this. He was simply doing it, as if this was his job. I started to scream and tear at the bedsheets beneath me, terrified as the rat started scratching at my flesh in earnest. There he goes. See, I told you he'd be all right. Blood began to pour out from beneath the lip of the bucket. It dripped down my sides as I thrashed and bucked, trying to free myself. But the straps holding me down were tight, bound with the sure knots of a professional who has done this many times before. The bucket was hot as hell now, starting to glow faintly pink in places. My belly was on fire, a constant agonizing pain growing there. I bit down hard on the sock in my mouth and began to bang my feet against the footboard violently till it came free from its place, landing hard on the floor. Agent Finch didn't even blink. He just kept holding the torch to the bottom of the bucket as it grew hotter and hotter. You won't die right away. It will take time for infection to brew and kill you. And during that time, you'll have a new friend. A little rat buddy living inside your belly. Doesn't that sound nice, Sheriff? Just as I felt ready to pass out from the pain, I heard a sound at the door. A polite double rap of knuckles on wood. And then a voice. Familiar. Hello? Agent Finch? Are you in there? The man didn't move. He just kept holding the torch to the steel bucket as the rat burrowed and chewed desperately. It felt like burning nails were being raked across my insides as it made the hole it had created bigger and bigger. A sound could be heard of a key turning in a lock, and suddenly the man's expression changed. He looked surprised for the first time, and I guess that didn't happen to him often. Luckily for me, my deputy Randy surprised the hell out of me by being a damn fine police officer that day. Even luckier for me, his family just happened to own this little motel. It's a small town, and some people have two or even three jobs. Randy's second job just happened to be working at the desk when his mom, Joy, was off-duty. But she wasn't supposed to be off-duty today. And the vacancy sign out front wasn't supposed to be turned off. He saw these things and started to get suspicious. And he didn't want to go through the hassle of a warrant to check out the out-of-towner calling himself an FBI agent. A fact I would thank him for later. Randy had the key for every door on the property. A grand master in his pocket. And if not for that fact, I'd probably be dead right now instead of in a hospital. But that didn't make the next few moments any less scary. As soon as the door was thrown open, Randy saw what was happening and drew his pistol. I was impressed at his ability to do so under such duress and with such an obvious hangover. The fake agent Finch threw the butane torch at him, missing wildly and hitting the door frame. With that momentary distraction, he ran across the small motel room to the bureau where he had set down his gun. Again, luck was on my side. If Finch had the gun in his possession, he would have easily taken me hostage and used the bed for cover. But I was fortunate. And guns are heavy. Nobody likes carrying them around indoors, not even serial killers. Randy took three shots of the man as he ran for his gun, without giving any additional warnings. The first one missed. The second grazed his thigh, and the third hit him in the shoulder, dropping him before he could make it to his firearm. After securing the weapon and the perpetrator... Randy unstrapped me from the bed and pulled the bucket off of me. 
much to his disgust, causing him to vomit for at least the second time that day. The rat was already well inside my abdominal cavity, still burrowing deeper and deeper, looking alive and well. Despite his madness, the man had not lied. The rat was not hurt, as it would turn out. It was just fine. I wish I could say the same for myself. Randy managed to get me to a nearby hospital. He saved my life and couldn't help but remind me that he'd done it before as well, and I still owed him for the first time. I'm pretty sure this means you're my manservant now, boss. I didn't make the rules. It's in the Bible or some shit. Unfortunately, no one took the prisoner seriously enough. Since he had been shot, they assumed he wouldn't be a threat anymore. But this was no ordinary prisoner. Agent Finch, as he called himself, escaped from police custody, breaking the back window of a squad car by kicking it out. He was seen a short distance away on a CCTV camera, wearing no police handcuffs. Like a magician, he had already escaped them. He was walking briskly towards the bus station with a slight limp, his wounded arm hanging in a hastily assembled sling on his way to the next town over. I lived across the street from Harold for more than a decade. It's amazing what you see about people when you catch swaths of their life in passing. It was never that I intended to watch him or anything like that. This was merely a matter of living near him. I was there when they had the movers, when they renovated their house, and when they became just Harold. It was a dark morning with thick moisture in the air that served to let everyone know of the approaching storm. I was fighting off a cold of epic proportions, chewing lemon cough drops like candies and drinking cup after cup of peppermint tea. The mixture of these flavors tasted awful, but at least I could taste something. It wasn't very often that I'd call out of work like that, so I guess it was purely dumb luck that made it so I saw him across the street. Even being sick, I tried downing a few slices of toast just so I'd have something in my stomach. This made it so I ended up reading Reddit on my phone while nibbling on the edge of a piece of burnt toast. There was Harold, rushing across his lawn with his robe hanging open to expose his white briefs, dead-eyed with scuff growing around his throat. He bent down to lift the newspaper at the end of his driveway and shook it from the plastic bag that had collected the morning's moisture. After thumbing through it, some fit overtook him and he began ripping the paper till it all fluttered away on the wind, catching along sidewalk crags or bush branches like flags signaling his surrender. I felt for the man, honestly. I'd seen the whole thing when Patricia stomped across the lawn over there and peeled out of the driveway. We all liked her. Most people that brought sweets to welcome people to the neighborhood could be overbearing with their niceties. But she had a way with it that made everyone comfortable. I could only imagine the misery Harold was living with. Rumor said that it was an ongoing thing, as these things tend to be. A culmination of symptoms till they had to be exercised from each other. People tried getting Harold to come out to functions, but he said no a lot after she left. Poor fellow was taking it exceptionally hard. I watched him as he moved back to his front door and slammed it shut behind him. By the time I'd given up on the toast, Harold poked his head back out the door and peered around to make sure no one was watching him. The coast was clear, or so he thought, because I could see him well enough. He went chasing after the strands of paper he left behind, this time taking precautions to tie his robe shut. I remember thinking then how weird a grief that must be to lose someone like that. Makes you do weird shit. As for me, I've enjoyed my own company too much to muddy the waters with anything beyond platonic. Once he'd collected most of them, he trod out of sight once more, giving me enough time to look at a few more wholesome memes and finish my cup of tea. Finally, at some point that I'd not even seen, because I'd become so engrossed in my scrolling, Harold was in his yard between the two maples, angled against a spade with effort. Even from a distance, I could see that the morning sprinkle was making quick work of his bedhead, so it conformed to the shape of his skull. My brain took minutes to realize what he was doing, but as the pile of wet earth beside him grew, it registered. But why? What the hell was he thinking? Was he planting something? I watched him like that for at least half an hour, sipping through two cups of tea. 
He was in the hole, halfway up his shins and caked in mud. As I polished off the last cup, I moved to grab my umbrella and stepped outside. Harold didn't even look up at me as I stood in front of him. He was a man possessed. Groans escaped him each time he drove the spade into the ground. But as his loafered foot came down on the foothold and his arms pried to jimmy the dirt loose so he could toss it to the side, he let out a satisfied grunt. Standing there on the sidewalk, just on the other side of his hedge, with the rain coming down light, I looked on. Whether or not he noticed me, he did not make it known. Hey there, buddy. What are you doing there? How are you, neighbor Reno? He asked me without even looking up from his work. It came from him like a jaunty, self-aware joke. Um, another shovelful met the pile. Do you need me to call someone? He laughed and continued shoveling. For a minute, it seemed like he wasn't going to respond to my question. Clay. I jumped at the sound of my own name coming from his mouth. You're a nice guy. He spat and wiped his forehead, leaning against the handle of the spade. At least he'd stopped digging, if nothing else. His eyes were lucid like he'd never before been alive, and it was only now that it had found him. Or maybe he was just fucking crazy. I used to make these little ships. You've seen them before, right? Whenever Patty threw her parties, I'd show them off. I'm sure I've shown them you before, haven't I? They were in the bottles. He put out his hands to demonstrate the size of the bottles. I nodded. You see, making those little ships is a real pain. For me, the hardest part was always raising the mast. I hated building those things, but that's what I was supposed to do, right? Does that make sense? He gestured to the house behind him. I've got really shaky hands, so putting those tiny pieces in just the right places always drove me straight up the wall. You understand. It was rough, but whenever I'd finish one, I'd carefully take it to wherever Patty was in the house and show it to her. She loved those fucking things. They were cute, she'd say, or, or some variant thereof. It's cliche, but it was happiness, too, and that's what I always wanted, this. Again, another manic gesture to the house. It was the American dream they tell you about before your balls drop, kiddo. Do this, get this degree, buy this house. Marry this lady because she makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, then... Poof. One day it's all gone, and... Do you know what you have to do then? I shook my head. It was early autumn and the air was giving me chills. Or maybe Harold was. You gotta smash those fucking bottles. You have to, you know, because it makes you feel something. You throw them across the room, you watch them explode like... <sighs> so many hours. He shook his head and laughed. I'll tell you, man, those things were a lot more fun that way. Felt good and bad at the same time. Cathartic? I said. I guess, man, whatever you want to call it. But that's what you gotta do sometimes. He looked at the hole he was standing in and then... At the yard as a whole. White picket fence my ass. But Harold. Yeah. You don't have a fence. He cut his eyes at me, but slowly a smirk started to slice across the lower half of his face until it evolved into a hearty chuckle. Thanks, I needed that. Sometimes you gotta dig a hole. I asked. Harold snapped his finger. God damn right. I can't explain exactly what it was that jumped into me at that moment. Looking back on it, it's the most indescribable sensation. I looked back to my house across the street beneath my umbrella in the dreary rain and even in the cool weather. I could feel fire in the pit of my stomach. Perhaps he infected me with his madness, but I'd rather state my case as this. Sometimes you gotta dig a hole. Because that's what feels right. Splashing through puddles as I ran through the rain toward the shed in my backyard, I found my old worn-out shovel. It was rusted from years of disuse. 
I bolted back towards Harold's, forgetting my umbrella completely. I must have lost my mind, running around in the rain with a cold to go and dig a hole with my neighbor. When I say it aloud, it sounds insane. But when you're in the moment, things are different. I jumped into the small hole he'd created and began chipping away at the edges and loosening the dirt so we'd have a wider area for us both to work comfortably in. He said nothing to me as I joined. My tired, cold-riddled body ached with each passing moment, but then something else joined it. I've heard people talk about getting a runner's high from pushing beyond your limit, and that seems as good an explanation as any other. The light rain gave way to a sunny midday lull, as each shovel push felt less like the last and more like we were doing something important. It couldn't have been a few hours or only minutes before I looked up to examine my surroundings. Regardless, when I did look up from the ground, we'd cleared out enough dirt so we were standing in the hole up to our waist. Harold continued his digging, but I took a moment to catch my breath. And when I did, I heard a familiar voice say, Clay, what are you doing? I looked up. Standing in nearly the same spot as I had been earlier that morning, there was Rogers and Margaret. Rogers was a man in his mid-thirties who wore sweaters everywhere and walked his dog around the neighborhood to shit on other people's lawns. In fact, in his right hand, it was a leash drawn taut as the little mutt most likely watered Harold's hedges, hidden in the leaves. Margaret, on the other hand, was an elderly runner. In her bright, sick green and purple sweats, she hardly got any workout. If you ask me, I think she just went around the neighborhood hoping to catch or dish the latest gossip. I grinned at the two of them. You know how it is. Sometimes you gotta dig. You're more than welcome to join us if you'd like. They looked at one another and then back at me. This time Margaret spoke. What are you digging for? Digging for? I thought the question over for a moment. We're not looking for anything, if that's what you mean. Harold, I turned to look at my compatriot for support. Tell them what you were telling me earlier. Harold barely looked up as he heaved another hunk of moist dirt out of the hole. It's all bogus. You work for things. You want to be loved and to love in return. And that's where you mess up because you should have been doing that to yourself the whole time. And not searching for it in someone else. Then he sighed and looked up while leaning against the shovel handle. What I'm trying to say is there's no reason to dig. But focusing on the task at hand... Sure does let my mind wander. Who needs therapy? It's expensive, and you could have been digging all along. Digging for the truth. It might look like dirt and roots to you, but to me this is where I'm figuring my shit out. As the two of them listened to him, I could see the light in their eyes return, and it felt once more like they were humans with a spark of initiative, and not plain, boring suburbanites. Rogers wiped his hair back in contemplation, totally messing up the perfect widow's peak he'd developed. He lifted his dog and ran down the sidewalk, screaming over his shoulder, I'll be right back! I watched him go for a moment, then shifted my attention to Margaret, but she too was gone. When the two of them returned, I was not surprised. What did surprise me, however, is that while Rogers showed up with a shovel on his shoulder like a rifle, Margaret came jogging back with a wheelbarrow full of tools. Shovels, axes, pickaxes. Among the things she brought was a gas-powered auger, and I must admit that did surprise me quite a bit. There was a feverish tinge in her face, one that said she meant business. I swear when Harold heard the auger fire up, he grinned from ear to ear. It was contagious. It felt like the deeper we got, we were compelled by an external force of some kind. Whispers from just around the corners of our faces. Everyone began talking about it. Our team of four quickly grew to ten, then twenty, then thirty by the time the people started getting off work drove by. Babysitters were called for those that had children. When asked how long they'd be gone, they did not give an answer and doubled the pay. Terry, Rogers' husband, showed up at the hole, trying to urge him to drop this craziness. But it wasn't long till he found himself in the hole digging along with the rest of us. We hacked the maples to pieces in the yard and Move those pieces into the street. By the time it was getting too dark to dig, Linus, a single dad, 
hauled over his grill and started cooking hamburgers and hot dogs for the tired diggers. It got to the point that when I was standing in the hole, the top was nearly 15 feet over my head. The diameter was at least 25 feet. We lounged, dirt covered but smiling and joking and talking about the weather as we ate and cracked open a few beers. If not for the massive hole in Harold's front yard, it may have been a regular cookout. Gathering together string lights on poles and tiki torches, we brought the yard alive and setting up plastic sunbathing chairs to bed down for the night. What was the plan for that? I'd say it was obvious. All of us had the intention of continuing the project the following morning. I caught sight of Harold near the sidewalk peering down into the hole. He sipped from a beer bottle and a little satisfied smile played out on his face. On approach, he greeted me with a simple nod. Sure is something, isn't it? I said. That it is. Can't believe we made it this far. How long do you think it'll take till we can't go anymore? He said. I glanced at the gathered crowd, falling asleep in plastic chairs or chatting amongst themselves in groups of three or four at a time. I've heard people joking that they won't stop till we hit China. That's the sort of stuff only kids talk about. I think it's magical that full-grown people can play pretend like that. There was a pause as I too stared into the pit, admiring it in all its glory. We've certainly done a good thing here, haven't we? Certainly. Harold took a quick swig of his beer. This is fucking crazy. He laughed. He had a tired look in his eye that I could sympathize with. You should go home and get some rest. He checked the watch on his wrist. If we hope to make an impact tomorrow, we should start early. I put up two fingers and gave him a lazy, jokey salute. Good night. Night. Never before in my life have I slept like I did that night. It wasn't just the tiredness or my cold either, if I were to guess. In black dreams, I heard what can only be described as electric bubbles in my ears. The screeching in the night filled me and hollowed me out, same as we did that pit. It was a nightmare. I, I should say that much, but it was so much more than that. The best way I could put it is that it felt like... It felt as though my soul, even if I'd never been one to believe in such a thing before, was leaving my body. And I was a nothing person. Less than human for it. Then the screeching in my dreams woke me and I realized that I was not hearing the sounds of dreams, but the sounds of screams. I propelled myself off the chair and staggered around, bleary-eyed. It was still night or early morning. What's happening? I tried screaming. My neighbors were running towards the pit and there was already a crowd of them gathered at its edge. I followed, slapping my face awake. As I came to the edge of the hole among the others, I froze. There was a place at the opposite end of the pit where the dirt floor had given out to some unknowable chamber. From it sprang forth whipping, glistening tendrils, bright red and thin as paperclip wire. Each one writhed independently from the others, but must have come together on the end of some great unseen beast in the dirt. Several of them held Rogers well over our heads as I looked on with extraordinary horror at what I was seeing. The tendrils cracked like whips against his body, sending out shrill, pus-curdling screams. They shed him out of his clothes and then began stripping from his skin as well. My eyes shot to Terry. He looked on entirely helpless at what was happening. I could see the frozen tears in his eyes, not quite accepting what was in front of his face. All our faces. I saw it and I can tell you still that I have dreams of it or... Sometimes I will try to tell myself that it was all some fever image from my cold. But I know that's not true. It's impossible to retract. Rogers, more red runny muscles and exposed bone than anything else, hardly looked like a human anymore. The tendrils lifted him ever higher and twisted his body like a rag, then dropped him dead before recoiling into their subterranean lair. The hole in the pit that went deeper place it had spawned from echoed a gurgle to signify that the chamber was large, exceptionally large. Terry screamed finally, taking towards one of the ladders protruding from the hole. Margaret tried reaching for him, but he was too fast. In moments he was in the pit on his knees before his husband. I 
couldn't bear to watch him cry over Rogers like that and started scanning the area for Harold, but he was gone. Instead, my eyes fell on the flaps of skin that caught along the crags on the sidewalk and the debris we'd created in our endeavor to dig our fucking way to China. They flapped like flags in the wind. I couldn't help it. I stepped from the hole and kneeled over, throwing up the hot dogs I'd had earlier. A few people joined me. By the time I wiped the muck from around my mouth and looked back up, Terry was already at the ladder again, at the bottom of the pit and screaming at somebody, anybody to help him as he carried Roger's corpse in tow. He was covered in his husband's blood. One of the corpse's legs moved across the ground like a piece of bald lint on the end of a string. Then I heard the noise from my dreams. It was maddening. It seemed to be coming from inside my own head like a musical popping. It sent a shiver down my spine. At some point, tears began to flow as I looked on the crowd of gathered faces and I could tell that they heard it too. And we all knew what it meant. We marched towards the ladders, pressed around the edges of the hole, our feet no longer our own, each of us with a tool in our hands. Terry dropped the corpse and began walking towards the place the dirt had opened up, just as we all did. We were going in, totally transfixed. I remember looking at the faces that came along, and I could not help but notice that Harold was not among them. I wondered briefly if he had the sense to run away when he had the chance. As we filed into the chamber, one by one, the slanted dirt of the cave-in made for arduous moving. It must have taken us down another hundred feet at least. Finally, our feet met with solid stone. In the distance, there was a city of spires and ancient stone, with firelight snapping intermittently. There was no logical reasoning for its existence. Seeing that place from even as far away as we did, I felt a sense of dread. I was sick. I was tired. And I was shaking from the existential horror before us. The city in the distance, beneath the impossibly high ceiling of the cavern, called us nearer. Among my neighbors, there were whispers of the most unfathomable possibilities. As we moved along, carrying tiki torches and pickaxes, wet schlepping sounds came from overhead. And as we peered over our own heads to see what creature it was coming from, the ropey red tendrils of the thing that had killed Rogers dangled from the flat ceiling. The ropey limbs of the thing hung from its bulbous, fat body. It seemed to be breathing, but otherwise did not move. As Margaret removed a flashlight from her person and shone her light around, it became obvious that the ceiling was covered in those monstrosities, spaced out from one another by about twenty yards. Jesus Christ said Linus. I can't believe this has been under our feet this whole goddamn time. I don't think this was under our feet, I said. Hearing it aloud like that, it made too much sense. You'd have thought we would have heard these eldritch horrors kicking around before then. I don't think this place was here before. What the fuck are you talking about? Linus cut his eyes at me, the fire from his tiki torch illuminating his face. He was scared, I could see it. I just mean, I think we did this. Margaret interjected. Look! Our eyes followed where she pointed, and I felt a shiver run up my spine. Up the way, through boulders and sharp debris, we caught sight of watchers patrolling from the edge of the city. Twig spider legs that bowed out with each step from atop round seats with spotlights scanning the area. The detail of them from so far away was blurred, but... I can promise you that they looked like monstrosities ripped from a Beksinki painting. What are those? Even as I spoke the words, I knew that no living human could have looked upon them before, because every aspect of their anatomy seemed to defy all understanding. Seeing them made me so uneasy that I reached out for one of my neighbors in the dark so that I might have someone to hold on to. What are they? I repeated. Let go of me. Daryl, a devout member of the Neighborhood Watch, slapped my hand away. I offered him a weak smile. I'm sorry, I've just... I've never seen anything like it. None of us have. It's... phantasmagorical, I said, totally awestruck. Daryl and Margaret both looked at me funny and responded by simply peering ahead at the Watchers. We walked as we did, and 
I began to feel the cold I'd been suffering from prior begin to take hold over me. My nose began to run, my muscles ached, and I sniffled. I believed that working in the rain the previous day had done little to improve my situation. No one mentioned it, but I kept glancing overhead at the stringy things dangling from the ceiling, wondering if they could hear the noises I was making. My mind continuously went back to the way they'd utterly destroyed Rogers, and I could not help but shudder to think what they might do to me. How much longer till you think we've reached them? I asked Linus. No one answered him. The echo of the infinite seeming chamber was the only thing. It seemed that we went on for perhaps hours, slipping or tumbling across the bent, moist rocks that the floor became as we neared the city of Spires. All the while, those unnameable beasts overhead never left our visage. Whimpers escaped from the crowd when we passed by one, edging around the limbs while giving them a wide berth. One of the tendrils curled on itself, sending a shrill cry from Linus. The thing took little notice of us, and we hurried along. The outline of the city ahead became even more clear. It feels like we've been walking forever, I said. Whether this was due to the fact that I was more tuckered than the others, or it was that we had trod over the rough terrain for a vast, immeasurable time, I couldn't tell. We met a great rock face that stabbed towards the ceiling. It seemed our best bet at finding a place to rest, and I mentioned it in passing. With grumbles over how we should continue moving dispersed, we sat with our backs to the flat surface of the rock. The others, too, began to express discontent with our journey. We never should have come here, hushed Margaret. Daryl scanned the surroundings from a position atop a waist-high boulder. I can't remember where the exit is. I don't think we can go back. The exit doesn't exist anymore. The anxiety in his voice crept up my spine. It was true. Why had none of us thought to leave behind guideposts for the journey back? Or was it that we had collectively accepted our fate and subconsciously decided none of us were going to leave anyways? I sat against the rock among a few half-familiar faces. That's not possible, said Margaret. She moved to the rock he was standing on, reaching up a hand. He hoisted her bony frame up, her gray hair catching around her face. As she swiped it back, she pivoted in all directions. That's the city. We've come in a straight line. It should be somewhere over there. She pointed an inconsequential finger towards the dark shadows. Right? Daryl shook his head. Why have we come here? The teary madness was evident in his tone, but I was too tired to look up from my seated position against the big rock. I stared at the ground and wished I had something to blow my nose into. The others began setting up a makeshift camp, positioning torches and stone cracks and lying out jackets to sit on. When I finally did look up again, I could see that Margaret and Daryl moved from their position on the rock and took up among the others. The ceiling, alien and starless with those monsters, made me uneasy. I spent my time counting the people in our camp. Twenty-eight scared faces each of them looking wearily over their shoulders at every small noise. Margaret moved from person to person, and when she came to ask me if I was feeling all right, I shrugged it off. She left me and continued roaming the camp with her hands on her hips, scanning further vicinities. Margaret pulled a hairband from her wrist and pulled her hair back into a ponytail. For a long moment, I was surprised at just how agile and full of energy the old bird was. Perhaps those daily walks through the neighborhood were paying off for her. I wish I'd felt the same in that moment. After glancing around to make sure no one else was watching me, I quickly took the long sleeve of my shirt and blew my nose into it. A few people looked my way, but quickly went back to whatever conversations they were having. I was so tired. Rubbing my temples, I rose to my feet and moved to the same rock that Margaret and Daryl had been standing on. After shifting myself slowly up, I began to look around. Near the city, perhaps a mile away, were the watchers with the spotlights. I could just make out the vague, shadowy figures riding atop them, and I briefly wondered whether they would be able to see me if they were to shine their lights in my direction. I rubbed my eyes. They felt tender to the touch, and I could scarcely keep them open. How I wished for the warm comfort of my bed in those hours. How I wished I'd never checked on Harold. It would have been better for me, better for everyone, if I'd only left him be. 
The urge to leave that place was ever growing, ruminating in murmurs. Some of the group wanted to inspect the city, still transfixed by its spell, while others wanted to leave. It seemed the half that wished to carry forward had it in their heads that the only way out was through. Margaret was one of the more vocal about deserting whatever horrors lurked in that place, and I was right by her. Daryl and Linus both were vehemently defending that we continue. Once everyone's rested up, we should head on, said Linus. It's just like Harold said. There's some truth to be found here. It was all that digging, if not for this. Daryl, with his arms crossed, nodded alongside Linus. I shook my head. There's no reason for it. We've been duped, guys. Harold didn't know what he was talking about. He was grieving. There was no reason for us to jump in and start digging, too. What were we even doing it for? This was true. I couldn't even remember why I decided to help dig in the first place. It was all so pointless. That's Bubkiss, said Linus. And you know it just as well as I do. It's a general discontent with the state of affairs that's brought us here. And I only intend to resurface once I've found the purpose I've been looking for all my life. There's a, a magic to this place. And it exists for a reason. It would have been nice if that were true, but looking around at the deep shadows of the massive cavern, I could only see desolation. Margaret cut in. I don't care what you do, I'm going back. She studied the group. Those of you that want to leave can come with me or not. The mixed expressions of hopefulness and fear made me sick. It seemed that we were destined to split up with half of us going on and half of us going back. I only hoped in that moment that we'd actually be able to find our way out of the cavern. Just as it seemed that Linus was going to respond, the first fish fell from the cavernous ceiling. It was some cod. Upon seeing it there, I blinked to make sure I'd not merely conjured it from my imagination. It came from seemingly nowhere at all, but it landed on the flat ground in the center of us gathered. It flopped and its mouth sucked and puckered at nothing as it reversed round. I reached a timid foot forward to nudge it with my shoe as Margaret peered up at the ceiling. As the words where did that come from, came from my mouth, another fish fell directly onto Margaret's upturned face. She shrieked and kicked the thing away. Within minutes, wet plods surrounded us as it began to rain down a waterfall torrent of ocean fish. A flounder bounced off my shoulder, slapping me with its tail. We took up with our arms over our heads to cover ourselves from the incoming barrage of sea animals. It was the most insane thing I'd seen in my entire life. The air smelled of salt and the pattering of the fish landing on the ground is a noise I wouldn't soon forget. The screams of my fellow human echoed all around, barely above the sounds of the fish storm. We began to take cover near the great flat rock. I dove across people and wriggling fish to reach it, pushing and shoving and getting shoved in return. In a panic, my shoulder met the rock and I turned to look back at my neighbors frantically searching for shelter. In the uproar, I could see that Daryl was fighting with something clinging to his face as it wrapped its snaky limbs around his throat. He attempted to wrench the thing off, but it only pulled itself more tightly around him. It took far too long for my brain to realize what I was seeing. The thing holding itself to Daryl was an octopus with a head roughly the size of a Doberman. No one came to his aid, and he quickly fell to his knees. The last few screeching breaths left his lungs. I watched on and concentrated frozen terror through the last few still-lit flickering torchlights as Daryl's right hand came up in an arched claw to dig into the thing's chewy flesh. And then Daryl went still altogether. Margaret launched towards the thing, totally ignoring the falling fish, arching an axe as she might a baseball bat, and swatted the octopus off Daryl's prone head. Snapping out of it, I sped forward, grabbing a hold of Daryl's wrists, and grabbing him to the relative safety of the big rock as Margaret stood guard. He did not kick or scream, and I wished that he were only unconscious. As Margaret returned to the shelter of the rock, we went to shine a light on Daryl. His face was no longer a face, but a skull with open optic holes through which only pink brain could be seen. I recoiled. That's not normal said Margaret, shaking her head and kicking the rock face as she planted a flat hand against it. Looking back now, I think to myself what a strange thing that is to say. But in dire circumstances, the thing that needs to be said is so far from one's grasp that it, too, becomes fleeting, illusory, and 
There was nothing save the obvious and concrete. No, this was not normal. What are we going to do? My voice was small, caught in my throat. I was surprised that anyone could hear me over the sound of the fish rain, but Linus did. We moved to the city where it's safe. There's no going back now. It wants us here. Even with the mad twinkle in his eye, I could nearly hear the fear in his voice. What exactly it was and why it wanted us here, I couldn't say. We stayed pressed to the rock till the fish stopped falling. By the time they did, we were nearly up to our knees in them. Their dead eyes looked up at us, and sometimes their tails would twitch, forcing me to double-take to make sure there was not another tentacled creature among them. As we pushed on, stepping over or around the dying and dead fish, we came to a flat, open area of ground that encompassed the city of Spires. It seemed it had been intentionally worn down. With every step, I felt we were more vulnerable. A spotlight from one of those horrid watchers passed over us as we marched, and I could nearly feel the heat off it. We froze, and the watcher ignored us, pivoting the light in another direction. I wondered if it could even sense our presence at all. My legs began to feel heavy, my arms too. But this wasn't the normal sort of tiredness I'd been experiencing up until that point. It felt as though I'd been drugged. Looking around at my neighbors as we went, I could sense a daze in them as well. I watched as their limbs moved in slow motion, and it occurred to me that we were hardly making any leeway whatsoever. Does anyone else feel tired? I asked. Yeah. I twisted my head around to see it was Linus. Now that you mention it, I am really feeling tired. It's like all I want to do is lay down and sleep. God, I've never felt like this before. I felt like someone was trying to pull my eyelids closed with pinched fingers. Something was amiss. The city of spires ahead grew foggy, and the fires that illuminated it flickered. No. I was blinking. The slow blink of someone on the verge of sleep. Someone's cries met my ears. I turned my head to the right to see the Terry was sliding his feet along the smooth stone floor. Why'd Rogers have to die? It should have been me. He said the words so much like facts, while his ankles shifted forward in stumbling steps. The pickaxe he carried grinded along the floor of the cavern as he dragged it with a limp wrist by the handle. A chorus of other tools soon followed as we all began to carry our tools this way. Terry's eyes welled up with tears. I should have died. He was losing his mind. It was all too much. No amount of what I said would be able to snap him out of it. He was giving up. He choked. I just want to die. It was the wail of a dying critter. Hey, I tried. It's going to be all right, Terry. It's going to be okay. Just push on. Don't give up. We're going to make it out of here. No. For the briefest of moments, his eyes grew lucid as they met mine. No, we're not, Clay. That's okay, though. I'm just going to lie down for a little while. I heard the handle of his pickaxe clang against the floor. He was no longer dragging it. I'm just going to lie down and catch up with you later, all right? Don't do that. I tried shaking my head quickly to jumpstart myself out of the strange affliction. Margaret called out from somewhere behind. Don't go to sleep. She sounded like she was having a hard time speaking. It's trying to make us go to sleep. I'm... Terry fell to his knees. Just gonna close my eyes. It'll all be over soon enough. He fell onto the solid ground with a dull thud. Another body ahead of me fell. It was the lady who ran the salon down the road. I could never remember her name. Then someone else off to the left. It wasn't long till we were dropping like flies. Every thud of a body on the hard ground was another stake to the heart. It made me wonder how long I would last. Margaret called out from somewhere behind again. Clay? You, you still awake up there? Yeah, I'm still here. I don't know how much longer I'm going to make it, Clay. 
can you do me a favor? I have a granddaughter. If, if you make it out of here, will you tell her I love her? There were a series of snuffles. Will you tell her I love her and that I'm sorry I couldn't see her grow to a woman? Can you do that for me? No. I was surprised how much command I still had over my own voice. Even though I could no longer turn my head to look behind, and could only see the rotating watchers and city behind, I did not want to lose Margaret. I can't do that. Because you're... You're going to make it out of here, same as me, you hear me? A few more bodies struck the ground, and the sound of my own heartbeat in my ears was the only thing for miles. I waited and waited and waited for her response. Every step forward I took was met with nothing but the sounds of my neighbors dropping. Was she already asleep? Had she succumbed to the wicked magic of the cavern? Was I the last one standing? Would this become my eternity walking toward a dark city suspended in infinite time? Okay, Clay, said Margaret. At hearing her voice, I felt a new strength in my legs, and even as my muscles met resistance like I was pushing through water, I began stomping defiantly towards the watchers, and the sounds of others' footfalls came too. Then the sinking feeling I'd had in the pit of my stomach began to disappear, and I was sprinting. I'd broken the threshold of the spell, it seemed. As my muscles felt normal once more, I stopped and turned around. Laid out before me was mostly bodies. The only ones left were me and Margaret and Linus. He pushed on, slapping his face while she blinked repeatedly and rubbed her eyes. I've never felt anything like that before, said Linus. I can't believe I made it. There was nearly a cheeriness in his voice till he met me and looked out onto the bodies. The many dead forms of the group fallen behind. My God. God, said Margaret. Red tendrils spilled from the dark recesses of the ceiling, reaching for the extremities of the dead or sleeping, and suspended them in midair like puppets for a moment before carefully, almost delicately pulling them up and from our eyes into the shadows. As the bodies disappeared to the ceiling, a sound followed. The sound of grinding bones, of stripping wet, of those creatures above devouring them. There was nothing left in that open stone field but the torches and tools they left behind. I bit my lips shut to keep from screaming. It wasn't much further till we passed the Watcher's patrol, and there were only three of us left. We were all as good as dead. This is fucking madness, said Linus, shaking his head. I can't believe any of it. He was right. I couldn't believe it either. I couldn't believe any of it. Margaret was busy examining the Prussian blue walls of the firelit city as one of the watchers stomped their spindly legs over us, giving me a perfect view of the undercarriage of its bulbous top. Beneath what must have been a cabin with some fashion of mechanisms were twisting tubes that pulsated as though they were attempting to emulate the bladders of a living thing. The watcher's spotlight illuminated the faraway darkness in a perfect circle as it lifted its foot once more to proceed in its never-ending patrol. At the base of those thin legs were wide, bird-like appendages precariously balancing its top-heavy body. The screech of unseen gears broke the silence. It passed over like we were nothing more than inconsequential bugs. Jesus, I said, glancing over to see that Margaret too had removed herself from the wall. She turned her face up to the thing. We looked at each other with our mouths hanging open. What are these things? Margaret shook her head. Linus interjected. Big assholes, he spat. There was a new air about him, unreserved. More than anything else, it made me extremely uncomfortable to meet his eyes. Something was amiss there inside Linus. It was more than a vigor, the thing humans find in extenuating situations. It was like he'd lost something along the way. A piece of him was gone. And it was only then that I could see it. Why are you looking at me like that? 
he grinned at me, as though we'd not just witnessed the death of half the godforsaken neighborhood. No reason? I wiped my nose. Damn it, well, cold. Just tired. Margaret lifted her axe over her head as she stretched. The wall's too high to climb. Looks like we'll have to go around until we find an opening. Though, there was a pause that hung in the wet air. I'm not so sure we should. I looked to the general direction I thought we'd perhaps enter at the cavern, and then at the vibrant blue color of the city walls. I don't think we'd make it back if we tried. I could not vouch for the other two, but I was uncertain that I'd be able to walk back through whatever aura protected the place. Not for the first or last time, I silently admonished myself for encouraging Harold. This was a hell of my own design. I brought it on myself, after all. I brought it on us all. Linus, with those wild, mad eyes, grinned. Clay's right. Only way is through. That's what we've got to do. It's the only thing that makes sense. In fact, I don't think anything has ever made more sense in this whole crazy world to me. Margaret looked to me, shooting me a glare that told me I probably shouldn't be saying things like that around Linus. But then her shoulders relaxed and she sighed, puffing up a wild gray strand of hair as she did so, before shaking her head. I can't believe I'm saying this, but you're probably right. This is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Nonsense, said Linus. Look at this place. He put his arms up to accentuate his point. It's beautiful. A -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. How many people do you think have ever seen anything like this before? Too many, said Margaret. A smirk took over Linus' lower face. I'm telling you, he was grinning like a maniac. There was something going on there, but for the life of me, I could not figure out what it was. Something was wrong with him. I've read things about the Uncanny Valley, and I feel as though that's the best way I can describe it. He was no longer the friendly neighborhood barbecue connoisseur. It was like a new thing had jumped into him, and whether it was the dark magic of the place or his own mind that had done it, I don't know till this day. We took off to the right, following along the curvature of the city's outer wall, Linus brushing the ends of his fingers intimately over its surface as we went while me and Margaret studied him. The huge open cavern shouldn't have felt so claustrophobic, but it did. The darkness lingering over our heads where the foul creatures hid, clinging to the ceiling, forced my chest to tighten. It felt harder to breathe. Or perhaps it was just my clogged nose. I skirted away from the line we'd created as we walked to blow my nostrils open with my finger. Under any other circumstances, I may have been embarrassed, but something told me we were far beyond that. So many had already died. I glanced to my two traveling companions and hoped I would not have to see any more suffering, but could sense that was unlikely. I rejoined them, and no one mentioned a thing. They instead opted to stare ahead without saying a word. The three of us had gone perhaps twenty minutes in silence before Margaret began to fall behind, taking slower steps and keeping a distance behind us, of about fifteen yards. "'What's keeping you back there?' asked Linus. Margaret waved us off. "'Just not as young and spry as I used to be, is all. Nothing to worry about. I think I just need to catch my breath.' I went to her and touched her on the shoulder. It's all right, we can take a break if you need to. She latched onto my hand and pulled me close, whispering in my ear. Keep an eye on him. I don't trust him. Before I could even respond, she shoved me away. Linus took his hand off the wall and turned completely around. What are you two talking about back there? Margaret offered a smile. Nothing. Clay was just asking me if I needed a break. I'm fine. He raised an eyebrow at the pair of us. Okay. Then he placed his hand on the wall again, possession taking over his steps. It wasn't long until Margaret fell in line with us once again. I couldn't get what she'd said to me out of my mind. Until that point, I'd been worried I was the only one noticing Linus's strange behavior. This should have served to quell the anxieties I had of him, but it only made it so they flourished. I kept him in my eye line. A patrolling watcher stepped over us, and we stopped to let it pass. I could see them a million times in my dreams, and they would never cease being alien to me. 
In fact, I have, and they remain that way. The watcher's strange bulb briefly lit the high ceiling as it shifted up, and I could see a mess of wicked things. Tightly bound skin and faces sewn in frozen torment served as an appropriate juxtaposition to the Sistine Chapel. Before I could check to see if the faces matched any of the ones we'd left behind, the watcher groaned in its mechanical way and left. Linus was smiling. Beautiful. A shiver went up my spine. I think I see the entrance up ahead, said Margaret. Squinting, I could see she was right. Just around a bend, the wall opened. How long had we been walking? The repetitive nature of our footfalls had long since taken me off to another place like hypnosis. If not for her signaling it, I might have walked right past it. The archway was magnificently tall, constructed from an assortment of cyclopean stones. I was left to wonder exactly what sort of creature could have carved them. I could not have imagined the watchers doing so, urging the massive stone blocks across the ground with their thin legs. No. It seemed to me that there was only one explanation. They were of an ancient imagination, withdrawn from the recesses of a mind far gone. We passed through the archway only to be met by the ruins of a lost civilization. I was immediately struck by the dizzying way the walkways spun through the spired structures. The streets, if one could call them that, were worn thin as though they'd been once traversed by living things. My mind went to the Sumerian cities created long ago, and I wondered if perhaps this was something similar. I knew this not to be the case. No human would have found comfort in that place. No sane human, anyhow. The inner side of the wall surrounding the city was onyx black so dark that I felt if I were to reach out and touch it I might fall directly into it. Linus whistled up at the tall buildings that seemed to have no entranceways of their own. It was as though they were nothing more than hollowed-out slabs. Who would construct buildings that could never be used? You guys ever see anything like this? He asked. No, said Margaret. As we passed by the massive thorny building striking up at the ceiling of the cavern, we were cast in shadows. Margaret and I both removed flashlights, but it hardly cut through the blackness ahead. It was a constant fear that something would slither from the darkness and snatch us away to some torturous fate. Thinking of the faces I'd seen in the ceiling, I felt my arms spring alive with goose flesh. Linus caught my uneasiness, and he reached out to pat me on the shoulder. I flinched. Oh, he said. Calm down there, good buddy. There's no reason to be so jumpy. I'm not. I shrugged while turning my attention back to the shadows in front of us. I'm fine. We moved by the first few structures, glancing down the snaking, thin alleyways, but deciding in our silence to continue our way down the street we were on. Each time we met one of these openings on either side where the buildings broke open to those dark corners of the city, I could feel unreal eyes on me. I felt so totally vulnerable in those moments, like my lungs might rupture and exhaust all the oxygen from my body. But we pushed on and the spires opened up to some kind of abandoned market square, where flame lights flickered the shadows away. Among the torchlights were booths where people had once sold wares, and I was once again confronted by the fact that some intelligent life had in fact dwelled there sometime in the distant past. In the center of the square was a massive black tower that rose well above all else. Everything was silent but our own steps for a blinking moment. A single fish fell from the sky and landed near the black spire. Linus went to it and Margaret and I both followed him. He hunkered down over it and prodded it with the end of his index finger and then looked over his shoulder. Again? He asked apparently to no one. Linus stood and looked to the black expanse above. We've seen this already, he shouted and his voice echoed back at him. Did you hear me? You've already done this. Whether or not Linus summoned what was to follow, I'm unsure. But when I look back on the words I've written so far, I want nothing more than to reach through the words and throttle him. There's no changing the past. A great groaning escaped from somewhere in the shadows overhead, and I half expected the great red tentacle beasts from above to come down and make us their playthings. But they did not. Instead, shattering glass rained from above. I was left frozen as the shards seemed to materialize from seemingly nothing. I put my arms over my head and hurried to the black spire, 
hoping to find some cover from the falling glass. But the tower did a little. A few darting shards caught my legs, but I felt nothing through the rush of adrenaline. Linus stood in the center of the market, face up, screaming. His voice could scarcely be heard over the shattering glass. As he twisted around, gripping his face, I could see that a thorn of glass had driven its way into his left eye. Blood rushed down the front of his shirt. Margaret clung to me and I to her. Shit, shit, shit! She was yelling directly into my ear, eyes clenched shut and fingers digging into my arm. I began feeling around the wall of the flat-sided tower as we inched our way around it. My fingers met an opening and I pulled Margaret in there with me. We fell in and she scrambled in the dark to withdraw her flashlight while I peered out from the crevice in the tower to scream towards Linus. I saw him dancing in the square with his hands at his face. Over here! Come over here! As the words left my mouth, Linus twisted to face me and I caught another good look at the gory mess. He latched a hand onto the shard of glass jutting from his eye, and his fingers slid down the sharpened edge of it, cutting his hand and causing it to slip as he attempted to pry it from his face. He latched on with both hands and finally launched the thing from his eye socket. I did it! He said, torrents of blood rushing from his head. The glass rain did not let up, and he seemed not to even notice as it diced his exposed arms to flayed ribbons that hung off him in cords, exposing the tissue beneath. Linus! I was too late. The ship's mast fell from the ceiling, landing directly on top of him. It crushed him, and I recoiled back into the dark recesses of the crevice we'd found. My stomach lurched, thinking of the way he'd become no more than a stain. The sound of clinking glass continued, and I dared to peek once more, ignoring the spot where Linus's raspberry-squashed remains were. There, crashing over the towering structures and sending up plumes of debris and hunks of stone, was the bow of a ship whirling through the air. Margaret looked at me, dark circles forming around her eyes that I'm sure I reciprocated. A handful of short red streaks ran the length of her face where the glass had caught her. A stinging soreness in my own cheeks confirmed that I must have looked much the same. The stress we'd been under was beginning to take its toll. It's just you and me now, I informed her. The frankness with which I delivered the news scared me. I know, she sighed. There's stairs over there. I grabbed her by the shoulders. We're both going to make it out of here, aren't we? When had I started shaking her? She ripped herself out of my hands. Clay, goddammit, get off of me! I caught her stern expression, but it was quickly replaced by a look of concern. You're not going to start acting crazy too, are you? My shoulders slumped. No. I shook my head. I just don't want anyone else to die. Margaret grabbed my face. Her cold, bony hands grounded me. I'm not going to die. You're not going to die. All right? I was losing my mind. She was right. I, I, I couldn't be thinking like that. It would do neither one of us any good. She shone her light into the shadows to reveal a plain, carved staircase that spiraled up through the center of the spire. I choked out my words. I don't want to keep going. She shifted to shine the light on me. I felt extraordinarily small when she did that. I don't think we have any choice in the matter. The shattering of the glass just beyond the open doorway and the splintering hull of the wooden ship flying through the air drove away my final protests. We were going on, and we had no choice. But to what end? What did we hope to find? There would be no way out. The stairs seemed to go on forever and it felt as though there was a physical presence pulling me, weighing me down. Margaret's heels kicked high as she ascended the steps ahead of me with the axe out in front of her chest. Our flashlights illuminated the small space we traveled through. The higher we went in the spire, the closer the walls around us grew, as though the building tapered near the top. My chest grew tighter with my cold working against me. I believe in that climb of that staircase I became delirious. I tried with my spare hand to feel my forehead, hoping that I'd not come down with a blistering fever. But somehow that felt ridiculous. Who cared if that was the case? I couldn't imagine that it would matter. What would happen if I were to just take a seat on one of those steps and refuse to continue? 
With everything in me, I believe I could have taken a seat and died. Wasting away in a dark tower would have been a fate less abominable than the unimaginable horrors beyond, surely. I'm afraid that if I had not had Margaret ahead of me, pushing on with her wiry, persistent limbs, that may have been what happened. Whatever the opposite of concentration, that's what I found in those lingering, dark moments in the stairwell. It became a steady zombie walk of doom, where living ceased being a thing and there was only movement. The repetition of it lulled me to a place in my mind where things were better. On our way up, we went by slitted openings in the stone like ancient fortress windows that allowed us to look upon the city of twisted buildings. The glass had stopped coming down. I could no longer hear the sound of the ship crashing over rooftops. Somehow the silence was worse. Things would never be the same. I would forever remember that place in those quiet nights I'd find my eyes going out of focus. Daydreaming would become a thing of the long-forgotten past, because I would always be returned there when imagination came. Are you all right? asked Margaret without looking over her shoulder or slowing her pace. I think so. Just making sure I'm not alone. I know what you mean. She angled her pace around the middle pillar of the stairwell, ever tightening its bend. What if there's no end? What do you mean? I mean, what if it goes on forever? There's always an end. My mind was programmed from a lifetime of constructed narratives that forced a sense of purpose on me and my actions. There's always an end. How do you know? What if we just keep going on forever? Her voice was shaking. I don't think that's going to happen. I hoped aloud. That's... that's not how it works. We're gonna get out of this, remember? Just like we talked about. You and me, Will. I really hope you're right. I know I am. I said this in the most reassuring way that I could without actually believing it. Even if I wanted to. She stopped. I think I see it. The opening. It's just up ahead. There was hope in their voice that twisted my entrails. The truth was evident. Beyond her silhouetted shoulder, I could spy dancing warm light. Our pace quickened as we broke the surface at the pinnacle of the spire. I slammed into her without meaning to. We were holding hands not as lovers, but as humans. Because we were scared. At the clean, flat top that stretched to a diameter of twenty yards, we stood together aghast at the creature there. The unmoving, half-human-seeming thing gurgled as its chest rose and fell. It sat in a chair of the same onyx I'd seen on the inner wall of the city, like it was made of a bitter, sick soul. We wagered a few steps towards the thing lined in rows of standing torches. Its eyes were wide open, white, forgotten by sunlight so the pupils and irises had taken on a milky blue quality. The thing's arms were snapped into the chair, black snaking tubes gored into the forearms, frozen so hard that it could not move. The opposite ends of the tube snaked into the ceiling. It stared directly up to the dark shadows or clouds above. Not even its mouth was free of its own cord that no doubt plumbed the depths of its stomach. As we grew nearer, I could see dry tear stains trace the creases of its crow's feet, and its beard was no longer full but kinked and thin from duress. Harold? I choked out. The thing in the seat did not respond to my voice. On approach, I could see the reason for this. Its ears had been clogged and locked in place by those same black tubes. My God, hushed Margaret. We went to Harold then, not knowing what to do. As I touched his cool, naked skin, he seemed to respond in a mumble groan around the thin tube trapped in his throat. Why was I crying? I reached for one of the tubes while Margaret watched me with steady eyes. Neither of us knew what to do, but that was not going to stop me from doing what came next. It was a panic that had jumped into my fingers as I clawed at one of the tubes in his left arm. I yanked it and he let out an awful scream as sludge shot from the place I'd freed the tube, spraying me in the face. I let it fall to the side, totally stunned. What was I going to do? Would he die if I pulled him from the chair? Was he too far gone? 
Then a whirring began that echoed. The sound of suction filled my ears, and I watched in horror as the tubes attached to Harold began sucking something out of him. His eyes closed, and he cried, whimpering tears. I could not see through the vacant black tubes, and to this day I do not know what it drew from him. But when the silence came, it was maddening. Margaret looked at me. She held her hands to her forehead, perpetually swiping her hair back in a frantic manner. What's happening? Jesus Christ, what's happening? And then it began to rain again. No, not rain. It hailed, and thousands of pinking little balls fell from that black sky and rained down on our heads. I closed my eyes and went to Margaret, and we tried our best to shield one another from what came, screaming like we'd screamed in that place so many times already. The twinkling glow caught my eyes as it gathered around our feet, and I could see that the hail was not ice or rocks, but they were made of gold. I snapped from my terror and brought one of them up and held it to my face. Through squinted eyes, Margaret shouted at me, What are you doing? I held up the circle. They're... wedding bands. She opened her eyes and looked through the hole in the center of the ring I was holding. I glanced toward Harold. This is... his place, I think. What? There are things darker in the human mind than there are out there in space. No dark gods compare to the inner workings of a human mind. The potentiality of our own terribleness cannot be overstated. Those previous sentences are a post-rationalization. In that moment, I couldn't put the words in place like that. I simply shook my head and dropped the ring. I don't know. The rings came down, and I pattered to the opening at the top of the spire toward the way we'd already come. Margaret had been right. There was no end. But I was going to try, even if it killed me. Her fingers dug into my arm, and she whipped me around. We can't leave him. She glanced over at the thing in the chair, still sputtering, gasping for air around the tube fixed in his lips. Not like that. There was a pause before she looked back to me. I wouldn't want to be left like that, would you? I looked to the axe in her hand. How was it that she'd kept it so long? Through everything? Not like that. We can't do it like that. We were screaming to one another over the clinking of the metal rain. What choice is there? Her fingers tightened around the handle of the axe. I... We could do it quick. I looked to the pitiful herald and nodded. She moved quickly. It was a task no one wanted a part in, and the faster it was over, the better. Margaret launched the axe into his chest with a quick heave. His body lurched and spasmed before going still. She ripped the axe away, and blood sprayed as his chest opened wide. The wedding ring stopped falling, with the last few ringing out somewhere far away. All was quiet, with Margaret covered in Harold's blood like war paint. The cavern air changed. There was nothing. We were standing in a vacuum that might crush us at any moment. Then the world began crumbling. A cave-in was my initial thought. That, that was ridiculous, of course. Cave-ins didn't happen in places that didn't exist. Such tragedies were for the real world. We parted there long ago. The world was shaking. The spire trembled, threatening to give away at any moment. The rumbling was all I could hear. Margaret screeched out something, but I couldn't understand. She hung onto the edge of one of the tubes attached to Harold's body. She was waving at me. I stumbled over and fell onto my knees, trying to crawl to her. Her mouth moved as I tried deciphering what she was saying, and a great boulder fell from the sky and sheared away the opening of the stairwell behind me. I twisted around on my back to watch it fall away as spider crack lines shot in my direction. I'm certain I was screaming as I moved. I felt a pair of ice-cold hands on my neck and craned around to see Margaret. She screamed over the roar of the falling debris. I can see light! She pointed in the most unexpected of directions. She pointed at Harold's chest. She shifted to the front of him that had been pried open by the axe. I watched dumbfounded as she pushed her fingers into his chest and opened them more. Indeed, natural light spilled from there. 
I was immediately reminded of the mumbles of my dead neighbors. The only way was through, so they said. Margaret placed her knee on his thigh and ripped his chest open. I crawled over on shaking arms and pulled myself up to gander in. It was a dream. That I could see trees and perhaps even a touch of real air. I am not proud of this. I pushed my fist into him and began worming my way in. Freedom was so close I could nearly taste it. Swimming in the visceral ooze in the place between here and there is a feeling I will never wash clean. Digging my claws in, I propelled myself forward like a deranged newborn pulling itself free from its tense mother. There was no longer a Harold or Margaret or even me. There was only the ravenous, growing urge to escape. And I kicked my way through intestines until I tugged away at clumps of dirt and took in labored breaths of fresh air. The sun splintered overhead as I sat choking in the open hole of Harold's front yard. I hawked up a lump of wet mud and scooted onto my knees to peer into the place I'd come from. There was no opening leading back there anymore, and its place there was only a grouping of loose dirt. I watched and waited and was all alone. I wept and swiped tears away with dry, cracked hands. Come on, I said at the pile. Come on. The words spit from my mouth. The dirt remained still with no trace of life. Please, I begged whatever it was that had created such a cruel world. I screamed like a madman. It started out small. The pebbles of minuscule bald clay fell away and rolled like children down a grassy hill. A finger with splintered caked nails sprang forth. And then came the whole hand and the forearm. I wrapped my hands around the thin wrist and tugged with everything I had. Then Margaret's head came forth. Hair clinging to her head. She gasped, open mouthed and eyes closed. Once she was free, she wiped at her face. After a brief coughing fit where she put her head between her knees as I patted her on the back, she began crying. We made it. I said, the elation in my voice reaching a point of absurdity. There's no reason for that anymore. We made it. She looked at me. I know. Margaret patted the dust off her shirt. There was a time in there I saw your feet just above my head. I saw you kicking. You were going to make it out. Then I felt something grab me from behind. And I was stuck. And your feet disappeared and I couldn't move anymore. I almost died. I could feel whatever it was squeezing the life out of me. There was a thought I had, though. I looked at her, puzzled. At least you were going to make it out. That's what I thought. That'd be something, at least. Margaret, I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't. We sat there, curled up on that spot in the bottom of the pit for too long. There was an investigation into the matter by the police. You can't have half a neighborhood disappear without it raising a few eyebrows. Neither me nor Margaret told the whole story, but the police received what we knew they'd believe. There was a mania caught among the crowd of people gathered in Harold's front yard, and we couldn't stop digging. We told them that much, and that much was enough. The official record went that we were victims of hysteria. We told them of a cave-in, and that most of the people were caught in it. They excavated the lot Harold's house stood on and never found a thing. I never figured they would. We each got our share of fines and community service. In the courtroom, I recall the judge sneering at me from her high chair as I pled my case. There was jail time for me, but Margaret's lawyer was better. She visited me sometimes. It was time well spent in comparison to what I'd seen. When I got out, Margaret introduced me to her granddaughter. As me and the old lady who once jogged around the neighborhood grew closer, I came to realize her granddaughter was all she had left. And it finally made sense to me that her last request would have something to do with her. We don't talk about that place often. But when we do, it always ends in long nights, 
where we chat over four or five bottles of wine or whatever else is nearby. She's a fair amount older than I am, and I know that I'll be the last, unless by some miracle the old bird outlives us all. Given what she's capable of, I would believe it's possible. I joke like that to make it seem far and away. Do not let this serve as some fable of morals or fault. It was never about blame, anyhow. This was about one man's inability to let go of the past. Darren, did you know they opened a Target in Owingsville? My wife Deborah asked me excitedly. Grab the car keys, let's go check it out. I rolled my eyes. It was almost six in the evening, and I had a long day at work. The prospect of an hour's drive there, two hours of shopping, and an hour's drive home wasn't appealing. They didn't open a damn Target in Owingsville, I replied curtly. Only about 2,000 people live there. Why in the hell would a multi-billion dollar corporation open a store in the middle of the sticks in a town that isn't even big enough to support a McDonald's? Squealing wood on tile penetrated my ears as she pushed the bar stool away from the kitchen counter. Her footfalls approaching my chair were heavy like a pouting child's. I should have known better than to start an argument with her about Target. She dropped something from above me. A glossy red mailer advertisement sailed through the air over the top of my head. I looked down at my lap to see the familiar red and white logo. The cluster of red-vested employees smiled up at me from the shiny cardstock. Target would like to welcome you to our newest location in Owingsville, Kentucky. Bring this ad to the register for an additional 10% off your first purchase. Uh, she worshipped the damn place. We lived in Lexington, Kentucky, and she made the rounds between all three. The clearance queen, she called herself. Deb would buy clearance items by the carload from any Target within a reasonable drive and resell them on Amazon. Retail arbitrage, I think she called it. Don't get me wrong, she made some decent money with it. We were middle-aged and empty nesters when she started. Her entire life had been devoted to raising the kids. When Dustin and Jessica left for college, she struggled a bit, stirred around the house like a caged animal. I pushed her to find a hobby. It was a few years until I would retire. Most of her friends worked. And that's when the Target clearance spree started. Owingsville is almost an hour away, and there are three damn targets here in town, I said, irritation building. Why do we need to drive out to the middle of nowhere to get what we could find in town? My wife went back to the kitchen and started washing the dishes. Every movement she made was exaggerated to show her displeasure. Cabinets closed so hard they were just shy of a slam. Glasses hammered on the counter so hard I expected to hear them shatter. She sighed at least three times a minute. I wish I hadn't given in. If I would have just stood my ground, maybe everything would have been alright. Our family would still be whole. Police detectives wouldn't stop by the house every week for just a chat. But I did give in. I agreed to go. Grab your purse, put on your shoes. I huffed, pushing myself out of the recliner. We can go, but no more than an hour of shopping. I've got to work in the morning, so we can't fool around all night. She squealed with excitement and ran off to the bedroom. Why the hell did I even agree to go? The drive to Owingsville was uneventful. NPR news stories played on the radio as my wife fidgeted with her cell phone. While I had been mildly irritated before we left the house, I was almost to a raging boil by the time we got to Owingsville. An hour's drive to the middle of the county, and my wife looked at Amazon's listings the entire drive. We had already reached the center of Owingsville, and the GPS said there were still two and a half miles to go. From the overhead view on the map, the address was a good distance outside of town, headed towards Moorhead. The location of the store was making less and less sense at the moment. Are you sure you put the right address in the GPS? I asked Deborah. She didn't answer, still scrolling through her phone. Deborah, I said a bit louder. She looked up at me and smiled. The sweetness of it cooled my anger down to a dull simmer. I even felt bad for being angry. Her life had changed so much in the last year, and this was something she did to pass some lonely times. Sweetie, are you sure you put in the right address? 
I really don't think this can be right. Deb leaned over and pulled out the cardstock advertisement from her purse and looked at the address. Reaching over, she pulled the GPS from the dashboard and punched a few buttons. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see a confused expression consume her face. Yeah, she said. It's the right address. The weird thing is the GPS just corrected itself. It was down to two miles and jumped back up to two and a half miles. Still says straight ahead on the right, though. I wasn't concerned yet, just confused. The GPS clearly said two and a half miles when we pulled out of Owingsville onto the dark country lane. We had been on the road for nearly a minute. It could have been a glitch in the software, but it still left me with an uneasy feeling. My eyes darted back and forth from the GPS screen and the darting yellow lines in the center of the road. The mileage was decreasing as it should have, and I felt relieved. Only a mile ahead. We should be there soon. I looked back at the road and looked for parking lot lights in the distance. You missed your destination. Please make a U-turn when able and head back two and a half miles. Your destination will be on the right side of the road. What the hell? I said in a panic. The GPS had just said one mile only minutes before. There was no way I had driven a mile and a half past a huge department store on the side of a dark country highway and missed it. You've got to be kidding me. I pulled the car onto the shoulder and made a U-turn. As we drove back in the direction that we came, my heart fluttered with nervous energy. Something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Was I zoning out while we drove? Was the GPS malfunctioning? Did the damn store even exist? Just a moment before I was going to tell my wife we were heading home, I could see an unnaturally bright light ahead in the woodline. The tops of parking lot lights peeked over the top of the forest. I turned to Deborah to voice my concern, but her face was painted with a satisfied grin. I told you we'd find it, she exclaimed with excitement. We pulled around the tree line to see an immense parking lot in front of the brightly lit store. There were maybe three cars parked at the far side of the lot. The cart returns were empty. It looked like no one had been there other than a few employees. See, you were all worked up over nothing. I pulled the car into a parking space closest to the door. We got out and started walking towards the entrance. There was emotionless elevator music playing in the parking lot. I looked up towards the tops of the light poles, but didn't see any speakers. None of the targets in Lexington played the canned music, and it filled me with a strange sense of dread. It was as though it was coming from nowhere. Even the entrance to the building was strange. While most stores have an entrance directly in the center of the building, or two mirrored entrances on each end of the building, uh, there was only one here. It was almost directly at the far right-hand corner of the building. I looked to my left and saw the other three cars in the lot were parked all the way to the right. Maybe there was an employee door on the side of the building, but I couldn't see a walkway. There were four or five feet of grass between the parking lot and the edge of the building. Something about the exterior was off-putting as well. Every other store I had seen was a cream or beige color with a few red awnings and a red Target logo next to the store name. Not this one. The entire building was fire engine red. It reminded me of the unrealistically bright blood from the old 80s slasher films. Where there would usually be only one Target logo, this building was covered in them. Hundreds, maybe. All different sizes. Some of the larger logos had smaller ones between the red and white circles. A few overlapped. Strangest of all, there was no sign that just said Target. Deb, something about this is weirding me out, I said hesitantly. Let's come back tomorrow during the day. Looks like they might be closed anyhow. Not many cars in the lot. She stopped and turned toward me. The exuberant grin had vanished from her face and was now replaced by a set of furrowed brows. Her body was slightly rigid and her head turned slowly from side to side. We drove an hour to get here and you nearly got us lost twice, she said angrily. Don't you think for a second we're going home. If you're going to act like an ass the whole time, go wait in the car. I was a bit dumbstruck. Deb was usually soft-spoken and sweet. Only a handful of times had I ever heard her curse, and never at me. 
She turned and went through the sliding doors at the front of the store. Hurt and angry, I went back to the car. For the first 30 minutes Deb was inside, I scanned the parking lot like a prey animal searching for a hunter. No cars passed on the main road, and no one pulled into the parking lot. There was no motion that I could detect through the glass doors into the building. Occasionally, a light would flicker in the parking lot, but otherwise things seemed relatively normal. I tried to call Deborah once or twice, but didn't get an answer. Halfway through a lengthy, apologetic text message, I decided to leave her alone. She probably needed time to cool off, and Target bargain shopping was probably the best medicine for that. At some point, I fell asleep. It wasn't intentional, but there's only so much aimless scrolling on a smartphone I can do before I start to nod in and out. Once I started to drift, an involuntary nap is always in my future. I had been asleep for around 45 minutes when my cell phone began to buzz in my hand. Startled by the sudden motion, I looked down at my phone. There was a text message from Deb. I thought it was just Deb telling me she was running behind, but checking out. Help me. The message was confusing. Did she want help carrying something out to the car? Was there something she wanted my opinion on? I sent a reply. What do you need help with, sweetie? No response. Three minutes passed. I tried again. You okay? Another few minutes and still no reply. I'm getting worried. Do I need to come in? I waited for another minute, but she never texted me back. Unsnapping my seatbelt, I pushed the door of the car open and felt resistance and a loud smack. Looking to my left, there was a yellow car next to me. It hadn't been there when I went to sleep, and I had just slammed my door into the side of it. There was just enough room for me to slide out, so I wedged myself sideways and closed my door. Bending over, I looked at the side of the yellow car where my door had made contact. Uh, there was no dent or mark. With relief, I stood and turned to head toward the door. I was startled by an ocean of yellow cars. There were dozens of makes and models, but each vehicle in the lot was yellow. Almost every single parking space was filled. But there was no one in the parking lot. When I turned to head toward the door, there was no one moving around inside that I could see from here. My stomach dropped. Something was wrong. When I passed through the entryway doors, the store looked like it should, with a few exceptions. All of the registers were self-checkout with no place for an attendant. Where you would expect to find a customer service department, there was an empty red wall. There was a cart corral, but it stood empty. All of the products I could see on the shelf had no writing, just the Target logo and a picture of what was inside. Strangest of all was the lack of people. The only noise in the building was a keyboard version of the girl from Ipanema. It had a tinny quality to it, as though it were playing from a World War II era radio. Crackles of static pierced through occasionally, causing me to wince. Hello? I said loudly. It wasn't quite a shout, but there was more volume to it than my normal speaking voice. It took most of my willpower not to scream at the top of my lungs, but... I didn't want to make myself seem unstable if it turned out there were other people in the store. There has to be someone else here, I thought to myself. Why the hell would the parking lot be full if no one was inside? No one answered my call. Excuse me, I said a bit louder. My footfalls seemed to echo as I walked into the store. Deborah, can you hear me? Silence. Is anyone in this damn building? I screamed. My temples were throbbing and it felt like the canned music pouring from the speakers grew louder to drown out my calls. I was running down the aisles, looking side to side frantically, passing row after row of generic shelves filled with red packaging. I screamed my wife's name over and over. My phone vibrated in my pocket and I pulled it out. Another text from Deborah. Please get me out of here. A chill ran up my spine. Can you hear me screaming for you? The ellipsis bubble popped up, showing she was typing a response. No, I can only hear the red men. I'm hiding from them in the bathroom. P 
please come help me. I didn't have time to register what she meant by the red men. Breaking into a run, I headed toward the back of the store. As I passed by the clothing section, I panicked and jumped back, slamming into a rack filled with clothing. A red, faceless man was standing on a platform between the rows of clothing. Terrified, I pushed myself backward and hid behind a shelf. There was no sound of movement, only the tinny music playing from overhead. I couldn't decide if the red man hadn't seen me. After a few moments, I slowly peeked my head around the shelf toward the clothing section. The man stood stoically behind the rows of clothing. Bright lines of light reflected off his smooth body. He didn't move at all. It's a mannequin, I thought. Move your ass to find Deborah. I stood and walked back around the shelf. Without the lens of fear, I could see that the shiny red man was only a mannequin. There were no clothes on it yet. Maybe the store opened before they were able to finish setting up the store. As I walked past it, my pulse slowed. I could see the bathroom sign hanging from the ceiling overhead and moved in that direction. As soon as I got Deborah out of the bathroom, we were going to get out of here and blow every stoplight between Owingsville and Lexington. Then I heard footsteps. When I turned to face the clothing section, I could see the bright red mannequin was off the pedestal. It stood on the bright white tiles of the walkway. In only a moment, the thing had moved at least 15 feet in my direction. There was no one around. What the hell? I said aloud. Slowly, I began to walk backward toward the bathroom, keeping my eyes locked on the mannequin. It didn't move, but I had the uncomfortable feeling that it was watching me with its featureless face. Sweat began to pour from my forehead. Suddenly, there were footsteps behind me. I spun around to see another red mannequin standing about 100 feet to the other side of me. As I looked in its direction, I could hear more footsteps behind my back. When I turned, the mannequin from the clothing department was a few feet closer to me. Before I could collect my thoughts, both of the shining red mannequins burst into a sprint toward me. I panicked and ran to the aisle behind me. Their hard feet clacked on the floor, making easy gains on me. Twenty years past my prime, I wasn't used to much physical exertion anymore. I hadn't run more than two aisles, and I had already lost my breath. Entering an area of shelves, I turned to face the oncoming red mannequins. Desperate, I searched the shelves next to me for a weapon. It was a home goods section, I began to scan the shelves. At the end of the shelf to my right was a cheap-looking red-handled chef's knife. I lunged for it just in time. As I pulled off the plastic cover, the two red men came around the corner. I extended the knife toward both of them, and they stopped. Both of them tilted their heads side to side like confused dogs. They turned toward each other as one of them began tapping a hard finger against their palm. It sounded like Morse code. The other began making the same clicking noise. They simultaneously turned and walked toward a red support pillar a few feet behind them. I watched cautiously, scanning the area behind me occasionally. Their sudden disengagement made me as nervous as the pursuit itself. When they reached the red pillar, they both turned and placed their back against it. Stretching their arms straight over their bodies, they tilted their heads back. The overhead speakers began to increase in volume rapidly. I watched as the two red men fell backward and vanished into the pillar. My mind struggled to comprehend what I had just seen. The store was quiet again. I could feel the throbbing of my temples intensify. Once I snapped myself out of the momentary daze, I began moving cautiously towards the bathrooms again. I moved slowly, checking each aisle before I passed to the next one, always looking for the red men, always listening for the slightest sound of another person. It felt like an eternity, but finally I made it to the bathroom hallway. The lights there flickered wildly as the music dissipated. On the left was the men's bathroom, and on the right was the woman's. I ran quickly toward the door, gripped a handle, and pulled it open. Behind the door was a red brick wall. I slammed my fist against it in frustration. Darren? I heard a muffled voice say from behind the brick wall. Darren, is that you? Deborah, I shouted. Are you okay? I'm right outside. Is there a way to get out? No, she whimpered. But I think I hear... Her sentence was cut short by a blood-curdling scream. I could hear thrashing and dull thuds through the red bricks. 
I screamed her name over and over, but she never replied. The room behind the brick wall fell silent. Then the clicking of footsteps began to sound at the end of the hallway. I turned my head to see dozens of shiny red men blocking the hall. Their heads all tilted at different angles. Some had lengths of pipe in their smooth grips while others held assorted kitchen knives. A chain was swinging lazily from the hands of the red man in front of the horde. My eyes darted back and forth between the crowd and the brick wall blocking me from my wife and the group of demonic red mannequins. I began to cry loudly, accepting that I couldn't save Deborah. Hell, I couldn't even save myself. In resignation, I fell backward. As my back met what I thought was the dead end of a hallway, I was surprised to feel the push bar of a door that wasn't there moments before hit the small of my back. The door gave way and I tumbled backward, slamming hard against the ground. My vision was swimming as I watched the door marked Emergency Exit Slam Closed. And I blacked out. When I came to, I was in a field. The tall grass was brushing against my face and the rustling sounds of nocturnal animals filled the night air. My head was throbbing and for a moment I couldn't recall why I was on the ground. I pushed myself up and reached forward to grab the door handle but found nothing. There was only an empty field in front of me. Moonlight reflected from my car windshield in the distance. The building was gone. The hundreds of yellow cars had disappeared grass and weeds replaced the parking lot. That was seven months ago. I called the Owingsville Police Department, who came to the scene to investigate. They took my statement and looked at me in bewilderment as the story of the now-absent Target store became odder with each passing sentence. There's never been a Target in Owingsville, said one of the officers. Not the kind of place that sets up shop around here. Deborah never returned. She's been listed as a missing person the entire time. Detectives from Owingsville and Lexington have interviewed me more times than I can count. They've served me search warrants for the house and both of our cars. Interviewed every damn person both of us knew. No one talks to me anymore. Our friends won't answer my calls. My family won't talk to me. Her family hired a private investigator. I see the greasy bastard following me sometimes. Hell, I even quit my job. They couldn't fire me, but they made sure I knew I wasn't wanted there anymore. I miss my wife. But everyone thinks I killed her. My life is falling apart. But maybe it will change. I've got to call the detective soon. When I checked the mail today, there was something strange in there. Something that gives me a little hope. It was a Target mailer. The same one Deborah showed me all those months ago. Just advertising a different location. Target would like to welcome you to our newest location in Paris, Kentucky. Bring this ad to the register for an additional 10% off your first purchase. There was the same group of red-vested employees smiling at the camera. Cheesy grins and everything. And right in the middle was a face I knew so well. She was smiling that same smile I'd seen a thousand times. Deborah. Back in my final year at MSU, I was invited to take part in a research expedition to the Hanya wetlands in northern Sweden. It was part of an exchange through the AWC, Arctic Wellness Cooperative, funded by members of the Arctic Council and private actors in the area. Me and Roger, Raj Dawson, took a flight in early May. During the 55-minute layover at Arlanda, Stockholm, we met up with Helene Angermark from the Royal Institute of Technology. When we arrived at the Umia airport, we met up with the last member of our expedition, Camilla Ostermo from Lulia University. From there, it was just a long drive north. The Hanya wetlands are enormous. We're talking about 700,000 acres of mire and wetland just above the Arctic Circle. In optimal conditions, and excluding factors such as sleep, food, terrain, weather, it'd take about 11 days to walk across. 
In my head, it conjured up images of the dead marshes from Lord of the Rings, but Helene assured me it was nothing quite as dramatic. Raj and I had no idea what to expect. We'd gotten our equipment pre-purchased. The Swedes were in charge of everything practical on site, excluding our personal equipment. We were scheduled to spend four days in the actual mire, and four more days accounted for travel. And sure, we had wildlife and camping experience, but you can't prepare for something like the Arctic mires. May is a strange time in northern Sweden. While technically spring, it can still dip in sub-zero temperatures, Celsius. The weather can range from blazing heat in the afternoon to frost in the early morning. So while we had a variety of clothes, we still had to be flexible enough to change throughout the day. There's no one thing fits all up there. The further north we drove, the more things started to look the same. Long stretches of road through the wilderness that seemed to go nowhere. Nothing but moss, undergrowth, and sprinkles of spindly trees. I was chewing on my last Slim Jim when Helene brought up her laptop. So we have eight designated sites where we need to do some sampling, she said. But Camilla and I have been talking, and we think we ought to be able to get one further in. We have to go a bit off-road to get some reliable results. When did you talk about this? I asked. Gotta read the group chat, said Raj. I told you to get in on that. I'm in, I'm just not getting notifications. Then you're not in. I'm telling you, I'm in. Either way, said Helene, if we take a detour north after Site 3, we ought to get some reliable samples before we reach 4. It should work with your schedule. You're the locals, you got this, said Raj. I leave this to your judgment. We're not locals, said Camilla. I'm from Lulia. That's like a four-hour drive. Stockholm is like a 12-hour drive from there. So we're going in blind? I asked. None of you have been there before? That's kind of the point. To get acquainted with it, said Camilla. To get something for the next group to compare when they do another expedition in five or so years. All about long-term cooperation, smiled Helene. Like it says on the website. Raj leaned over and patted me on the shoulder, holding up his phone. I just checked. And you're not in the group chat. We were stuck in the car all day. We reviewed our notes, plans, equipment, and route. Much of what spurred the expedition to begin were reports of wildlife changes. The indigenous Sami people had moved their reindeer herds north, claiming that the animals were getting sick from the soil. There had also been reports of reduced fish population and increased bird migration in the southwest. We were there to measure possible toxins and soil changes to, if possible, determine a cause. But first we needed samples, which was the meat of the expedition. There started to pop up little villages along the forest road. Well, maybe not villages, more like loose collections of houses within view of one another. Red houses with white corners and metal roofing. How anyone could live that isolated was beyond me. Still had great phone coverage, though, somehow. We passed through a town with a name I won't even begin to pronounce or spell. Too many vowels. It was our last stop before we got to the wetlands, so we made sure to stock up. Camilla got us some extra batteries. When we finally arrived, it was dark. We'd been following a gravel road for the past 40 minutes. There were six houses in a semicircle along the road, one of which we'd rented for the night. The rest were abandoned. Camilla dragged her stuff in and collapsed on the living room couch. Helene took the downstairs guest room. There was a second bedroom upstairs with three smaller beds for me and Raj to occupy. I was asleep the moment my head hit the pillow. The following early morning, it was all hands on deck. Helene was preparing sandwiches in the kitchen while Camilla checked our equipment. All batteries charged, all containers properly marked and sorted. She was meticulous, and at 5.30 a.m. we were ready to go. I took a moment to soak up the atmosphere. The smells felt alien yet familiar. The air was buzzing with insects, and I could hear nesting birds in every direction. Despite the four of us being the only people in the area for miles and miles, it felt very much alive. It was a vast forest with a canopy and with the waking sun gazing down on us from an endless sky. Helene took the lead with Raj following suit. Then there was Camilla and finally me. There were paths marked with orange flags showing us the intended way. 
Anyone know any good songs? Asked Helene. Uh, you could teach us some, said Raj. Preferably something we can pronounce. As long as we make noise, said Camilla. It keeps the bears away. We began our rendition of Sma Grodona as we began trudging along the path, going deeper into the wetlands. Minutes later, it was clear to me there'd be no way to navigate the mire without those little flags. Everything looked the same. The same trees, the same bushes, the same moss, and no clear paths to follow. We weaved and bobbed through the mire. We all wore these tall rubber boots and pants, along with backpacks that only reached halfway across our backs. There'd be spots where we'd have to wade through water that would reach over our knees, so we had to keep as dry as possible. It was a pain to walk through, and I could feel a rash growing on my thigh within the first 15 minutes of walking. We reached our first site at 7 a.m. Camilla brought out the testing equipment. She and Raj took turns calling out what kinds of samples they were getting while Helene recorded it all on her laptop. I cataloged and stored everything. It took us about 30 minutes all in all. As we packed up to move to the second site, Camilla pointed out something in the undergrowth. Lots of animals here, she said. Look. She pointed at the ground, but I saw nothing. I shrugged. How do you say it? Hjortan? Helene, what's what's that in... Cloudberry. Right. There should be cloudberries here. See the petals? What the hell is a cloudberry? Chuckled Raj. Never heard of it. Makes great jam, added Helene. Maybe we'll see some further along, said Camilla, where there's less animals. It took us another four hours to get to the second site. We spun around in circles for a while and had to get the sat-nav to find our way back. Standing out there with water up to my knees, looking for those orange flags. It was scary. Camilla seemed confident, though. At worst, we'll just go straight southwest, she said. As long as we can see the sun, we can navigate. Sure enough. When we got to the second site, there was a stretch of dry ground where we could rest. We stopped for lunch. Helene set up a portable stove to make us some coffee while Camilla and Raj got some samples. Soil, water, vegetation, all kinds. Still nothing, said Camilla, poking around the moss with her feet. No Hyartron. Cloudberries, Raj added. Right, cloudberries, all gone. Is that strange? I asked. Sort of. Reindeer usually don't go out this far. We finished up and moved to site three. We were finished just after dinner time. We had a few more hours until sunset, so we decided to move north. Camilla and Helene had mapped out a place where we could get some more reliable samples, and it'd be just a few hours off the trail. There'd be plenty of dry land to set up camp as well, so it didn't mess with our schedule too much. When we stepped off the trail and left the orange flags behind, I got this itch along my spine, like I was stepping into something out of my control. Those little flags were the only trace of civilization left. Without them, we were in the deep wilds. And still, no cloudberries. We set up camp around 8 p.m. The sun was getting low, but we had plenty of flashlights with us. We changed our clothes, set up our tents, and crawled into our sleeping bags. Camilla read an article on erosion, and Helene uploaded her best images to Instagram. Even now, we still had great cell phone coverage. Raj was taking notes and double-checking our batteries. I twisted and turned back and forth for hours, but I just couldn't get any shut-eye. My eyes kept popping back up. Long after the others were asleep, I was still up. It was useless to keep trying, so I decided to walk it off. I stepped out of the tent and wandered around for a while. The horizon was blood red, and the sparse trees cast long, gangly shadows across the camp. A thought hit me. We'd forgotten to set up the mosquito lights. This place ought to be flooded with mosquitoes, but there was nothing. It was all quiet, not a bird, not an insect, nothing. Just creaking branches carefully swaying in the wind. Compared to what we'd felt when we first stepped into the mire, this was... dead. It was almost midnight when I saw something in the distance. There was this long stretch of ankle-deep moss water next to our campsite. I looked out across it for at least ten minutes before I realized that one of the trees was not a tree. 
It was a reindeer. The thing had been standing perfectly still, not even moving its head. I'd mistaken its antlers for branches. I sat there looking at it for at least half an hour, and in all that time it didn't move a muscle. Not a twitch of the neck, nothing. Never seen anything like it. Eventually, I got back in my tent. I barely got any sleep. The reindeer was gone by morning. I told Camilla about it, and she insisted that they were skittish creatures. They'd stay away from us. Maybe it was just curious. We got the extra samples early in the morning and started to move east towards our main route. By then, we all had soggy feet and a sour mood. Camilla and Raj had a long and intense discussion about preservation efforts and EU regulations, while Helene kept stopping to take pictures for her Instagram. At around 9am, we all heard something in the distance. The discussion died down as we all tilted our heads and listened. At first I thought it was a wounded animal. There was this rising and falling squeal like a big bird call. It took us a few seconds to realize that it was a person. A monotone scream over and over. The exact same pitch and tone. This desperate, heart-wrenching death scream. Help, said Helene. Someone's calling for help. We circled back and tried to locate the sound, but it just seemed to get fainter and fainter, as if whoever called for us moved further away. We tried yelling back, but they didn't seem to get any closer. After about half an hour, we couldn't hear them anymore. Raj was visibly shaken, his cheeks flushed and eyes watery. We were all a bit uneasy about it. Camilla tried to make sense of it, saying it might have been an animal, but we couldn't figure out which one. Still, it had to be an animal. It had to be. As we made our way to Site 4, we shared our thoughts. There were a lot of things out there that didn't add up. No birds, no insects, no animal droppings or markings. It felt off. We found our way back to the main route with the orange flags. Following them, we spotted something that would come to haunt us forever. On the path ahead was this large, overarching tree, much larger than others in the area. And from the tree hung no less than four reindeer carcasses. They were seemingly placed there, the antlers tangled into the branches. Dry and tattered flesh dangled like sick fruit hooves gently tapping against one another in the mild breeze like a nightmare wind chime. Helene put away her phone and Camilla stared, slack-jawed. Raj looked at me for reassurance, but I had none to give. Camilla tried to say something, but lost the words along the way. Composing herself, she gave it one last try. Sometimes the, uh, the bears, they hide their prey. This isn't... This isn't hiding, said Raj. This is full display. I don't know what to tell you. We looked around, spotting strange markings on the bark. Mostly hoof marks, but also something else. We were all shaken after seeing it. It haunted me. I could almost imagine hearing the dead hooves if I stopped to listen. Helene had gotten her phone back out and didn't look up from it. We got to Site 4 at 1pm. Same procedure as always. Camilla and Raj took the samples, Helene took notes, and I catalogued and stored it. We had a late lunch, but couldn't find anywhere to set up the kitchen to make coffee. We were going into the deeper mire. The dry land was getting sparse. Following the orange flags, we had to stop several times to navigate. We were coming up on what should be a large lake, but there was nothing there. A slope into more moss with no trees. If anything, it looked like the water had been drained. Helene took some pictures, but Camilla was convinced we were off track. There was no way a lake would disappear on its own. We had to be going the wrong way, no matter what the satnav was telling us. Still, we followed the flags. And just past 2pm, we got to this enormous open space where the trees spread out. We could see for miles ahead. And somewhere out there, we heard it. Again, someone calling for help. The same monotone scream, the same pitch. This time, we didn't call back. Instead, we just stood there, listening. We identified at least two sources, one to the northeast, one to our west. The screams were coming from two completely different directions. 
It has to be a bird, said Camilla. A mating call or so. Uh, that's not a fucking bird, whispered Helene. That's a person. What's more likely, Helene? asked Camilla. That a pair of identical twins are following us and calling out to us, or that we're hearing the echoes of a nesting bird. I don't think anyone here is an ornithologist, said Raj. So we can't tell for sure. But yeah, I don't think that's a person. It's saying help. Birds can't pronounce L or P. Say what you want, but that's something else. We went through Site 5 and stopped for the night halfway to Site 6. I was getting nervous. I kept imagining that repeated call for help out in the mire. I thought I saw antlers among the dead trees a few times. I was getting paranoid. Site 6 was our furthest point before we started to circle back. But this was dangerous territory. One sprained ankle could mean aborting this whole expedition. The orange flags had stopped some time ago. They didn't reach across our whole route. We were on our own from this point forward. Camilla was confident, though, and with only three more sites to go, we were ahead of schedule. There was barely enough dry land for us to set up our tents, but we made it work. The ground was moist, and I had a puddle of something cold next to my feet. It was uncomfortable, to say the least. I collapsed into an uneasy but welcome sleep. Raj gently shook me awake sometime in the middle of the night. He held a finger to his lips and motioned his hand to his ear, as if telling me to listen. There was that scream again, and it was much closer. I dressed myself and got out of the tent. Camilla and Helene were already up. We all huddled together at the edge of our camp, looking out across the mire. It was too dark to see, but the screamer couldn't be far off. Camilla held up her flashlight and gave us a nod. We nodded back. We had to see what this thing was. She turned on the flashlight. There were a dozen reindeer about 60 feet ahead of us, all standing at the exact same angle looking directly at us. No one blinking, moving, or recoiling from the light. We all froze, not wanting to make any sudden movements. These were supposed to be timid woodland creatures, but something was off. One of them slightly opened its mouth, stared at us, and called out in a perfectly human, Help. Helene covered her mouth, holding back a scream. The reindeer, one by one, called out to us, all with the same mechanical movements and identical voice. Help. It was fucking eerie. Raj decided enough was enough and got up. He tried to make himself big, stretching out his arms and waving them up and down. He huffed and yelled, trying to scare them off. They didn't react in the slightest. That is, until the reindeer at the very front turned its head to look directly at him. It slowly raised its front legs and leaned backwards. In a matter of seconds, it was standing upright like a human. The others coalesced around it, circling like a school of sharks, all while screaming out over and over, calling for help. Don't... don't provoke it, whispered Camilla. They're... they're sick. They look sick. We should go, said Helene. Right now. No one argued. Camilla stood guard while the rest of us packed up as quickly as possible, all to the sound of constant screams for help. We were sloppy, but considering the panic I had building in my chest, it was a miracle we got anything at all. Raj and I were halfway through stuffing the tent in its bag when we heard something. Movement in the woods and another scream for help. This time from the west. Raj got another flashlight and checked it out. As he turned it on, I could see a dozen more eyes looking back at us. They were much, much closer. They're everywhere, gasped Raj. They're everywhere. It's a herd, said Helene. The samey, they used to move herds through. She was interrupted by another scream, this one by a reindeer right next to us, within arm's reach of Camilla. But the scream was lower, drawn out, and much clearer. The upright reindeer in the middle of the mire was still standing there, staring at us. As the scream died down, we all held our breaths. No one wanted to move. No one wanted to act. 
It all hung on a threadbare balance and anything could tip the scales. Then, chaos. Hooves came trampling through camp, these massive 300-pound creatures running completely wild, knocking into one another, crashing through bushes, running headfirst into the trees, stumbling over rocks and roots. They were like frenzied sharks smelling blood in the air. One of the reindeer reared up and bore down on Camilla over and over again. I could hear her chest snap as all air was pressed out from her lungs. Her flashlight tumbled from her hands, rolled into the mossy water, and was swallowed by the dark. Raj took off running, but didn't get far. One of them bit into his arm as he tried to get past, sending him reeling into the ground. From there, they had no trouble pounding him into a pulp, heavy hooves breaking bones like they were dry pasta. It was absolutely dreadfully morbid. I crawled on all fours, trying to keep out of sight. There were so many of them, but they only seemed to attack what was directly ahead of them. Still, one might stumble over me and decide to kill me, but I was running out of options. I kept to the ground and moved slowly, my hands sinking into the inch-deep moss, the ice-cold water floating to the surface. My veins ached. There was screaming all around me, and somewhere in the torrent of whales, both Raj and Camilla had gone silent. One of them almost tripped over me, giving me a mild kick to the chest. I say mild only because it didn't kill me, but I'm pretty sure it bruised a couple ribs. Another stepped on my thigh, ripping open a two-inch-long cut along the side. Still, little by little, I made it out. I kept going forward, no matter the sound, no matter the pain, I kept going. As the sun rose, I couldn't hear them anymore. I'd collapsed in the moss, panting like I'd run a marathon. There were no songbirds, no insects, nothing. Just me, the sun, and the mire. I used the elastic band from my underwear to make a makeshift bandage using dry moss from a tree to soak up the blood. It wasn't a deep cut, but it could easily get infected. I could still stand, but I felt the sting of pain in my chest with every breath I took. I could see a deep bruise forming, going straight from blue to reddish purple. I was lost. I was in the middle of nowhere with little to no equipment. I've never been so freaked out in my entire life. I screamed and cried, I, I don't know for how long. One moment I wanted to lie down and just wait for someone to find me. The next moment I wanted to run blindly straight ahead. After a while, I composed myself. I thought about what I'd learned about the area and what I'd seen. I knew there were flags put up along safe routes. I could also use the sun to navigate. If I went straight southwest, I should stumble upon the flags again. From there, I'd just have to follow them. I'd either pop back out where we started or on the other side of the wetlands. Still, either way, would be a long walk, and there were no guarantees that I'd make it. But I had to try. I tried not to think, not to reflect. I, I focused on the road ahead and the position of the sun. Everything else was secondary. But every flash of what happened that night felt like a cut in my stomach. The way Camilla's flashlight disappeared, Roger's scream with that first bite, the only one I couldn't account for was Helene. I hoped against hope that she got out. That she had the same idea as me. Maybe I'd meet her down the line. If not, I could tell the police there was at least one person unaccounted for. They'd have to send a rescue party. I must have walked for hours. It is surreal to walk in a space where all you hear is yourself. There's usually some sort of external sound, a car passing by, a squawking bird, a humming motor, something somewhere off in the distance. Out there, there was nothing. Just the ever-present crackling sound of dry branches snapping under my heels as I limped forward, step by step. I lost all concept of time and swayed back and forth between single-minded purpose and scatterbrained despair. But in a moment of clarity... I stopped to listen. The screams again. They were ahead of me, so they weren't following. They were merely in the area. I flinched as I saw branches move in the wind. My reptile brain thought they were antlers. I hunkered down and listened. Helene. This scream wasn't like the others. It wasn't the same sound over and over. They were different and irregular. She wasn't screaming for help, but in pain. She was alive. Now I had two choices. 
I could try and keep moving until I found the flags and just hope to get out somehow. Or I could try to find Helene and her things. She had the sat-nav, last time I checked. It was a battle between my instincts and my reasoning. I'd be putting myself in danger either way. But if I could help her in any way, I had to try. At the very least, I could try to fetch some supplies. I followed Helene screaming. She was heading straight north, deeper into the mire. She was on the move, slowly but surely. I measured the distance. After a while, she stopped screaming. I figured she'd passed out. It took me about an hour of searching before I found something. There was a young tree that had been stripped of leaves and covered in blood like someone had grabbed the bottom of it and dragged their hand along it. There were clear red stains across the leaves. There was no trail to follow, but I could hear something moving to the north. Maybe more reindeer, maybe Helene. The ground started to get muddy. There were algae and reeds drying in the sun. I could hear screaming in the distance. Not just Helene. Not like a person. Just those creatures. Pretending to be people. But there were more of them now. So many more. I could hear dozens of them screaming back and forth. Screaming for help. I pushed on. I had to see. To know. There was something up ahead and I needed answers. There was a small hill. And after that a sudden drop. I crouched at the edge, looking down. There was this dried-out lake with a deep crack in the ground going down the middle, revealing parts of a dark underground cave through the mud and debris. I could smell the moss drying in the sun. It must have been midday by then, and the sun was casting harsh shadows across the mire. There were hundreds of reindeer. Hundreds. Some standing up, others shuffling along on all fours all moving in a circle around the crack in the ground where something massive moved. Some of the reindeer were dragging things along, pieces of flesh, dead birds, and fish. I could have sworn one of them was dragging parts of Camilla's tent. They were neatly lined up and took turns dumping whatever prize they had into the crevasse. Those who had nothing to contribute stayed on the sidelines, eating. Everything looked so different in this light. I could have sworn most of the moss and flowers they ate looked strangely blue. And there, among the debris, was Helene. Her unconscious body was being unceremoniously dragged through the mud and dumped in front of the crevice. I could see her head moving, struggling to regain consciousness. I could see her mouth moving, but there was no way to hear her over the wailing screams of the creatures. But for just a short moment, I could have sworn she saw me. Just a moment of recognition. Then, without a sound, something emerged from the crevasse. A long, bone-white hand, large enough to wrap its fingers around her chest, carefully dragging her into the dark. For a moment the reindeer got quiet. An awful crunch echoed through the makeshift clearing. And seconds later the reindeer made a new sound. This time in Helene's voice. A tired, barely conscious voice. Come down, it said. Help me. Those four words were repeated over and over by all of them. In her voice. In all constellations and combinations. Come help. Help come. Down, help. Help down. The horrid screams replaced by a dying whisper. A whisper intended for me. I was too afraid to move. I stayed there looking down. Every now and then that large bone-white arm would emerge. Sometimes to put away something inedible. Sometimes to grab hold of a reindeer to drag into the deep. At one point a white finger touched the forehead of a reindeer making it stand up on its hind legs like a humanoid. Those who stood up seemed to be of great importance as the others encircled them. But there was no one to save. There was nothing left for me to gather. All that was left was for me to leave and never look back. I kept going south. Every now and then I'd hear them, a whisper of, Come help me, finding its way through the sparse vegetation. Come. 
Come help. Help me. These things were everywhere. And they were looking for me. Reindeer have a great sense of smell, so I took a short dip in stale lake water to hide my smell. My leg would definitely get infected. I limped my way through the undergrowth, stopping only to listen for clues on what paths to avoid. By nightfall, I still hadn't found any flags. My leg was in such a burning pain that I couldn't lean on it anymore and my muscles ached. I was constantly out of breath, not wanting to draw too much air into my lungs. But I had to keep going. There was a good chance that I'd die out there if I had to spend the night in the open. Temperatures could easily dip into freezing. Once the blood-red sunset started to gleam in the distance, I knew I was short on time. My hands were shaking and I could barely stand, I could barely move. Everything in me wanted to just sit down and hope for everything to be okay in the morning. It was so easy to trick myself into doing so, but I just kept going. I stopped. There was something up ahead. I caught a glimpse of eyes reflecting the setting sun. For a moment, they locked onto me. And a second later, it burst into a sprint. I thought I was done for. I had no fight left in me. I turned to run, but only made it a few steps before I tripped. Then a gunshot. The reindeer collapsed next to me, those big black eyes meeting mine. It struggled to breathe. Help. Help me. It whispered in Helene's voice. Come down. Come help me, come. It didn't understand what it was saying. It was just noise. But there was something there, and as that reindeer opened its mouth to speak again, I caught a glimpse of it. Something thin and bone-white lingering far down its throat. Something vaguely humanoid. A second pair of eyes looking up. Then, another gunshot. I was blinded by a flashlight. There were these three men all speaking Swedish, all dressed in some kind of logging company jackets with trucker caps. They all had these yellow reflective vests on them. I told them I didn't understand, and they changed to heavily accented English. British? American? One of them asked. American, I said. We... there was a... I... Attack, yes. They attack. He nodded. We know, we know. Come. The three men dragged the reindeer away, tied a rope around its antlers, and made a great effort to hoist it up to a nearby tree, just like the tree I'd seen with the others just days prior. Keeps them here, said a man who'd helped me. Makes a... Uh, grands. Border? Like a... Like a warning, I added. Yes, like a warning, he nodded. They understand. He looked up at the dead body hanging from the tree. They smarter here. No more. I was taken back to their base camp. About eight people living in caravans. They gave me fresh clothes, hot dogs, beer, and warmed me up by the fire. They disinfected my thigh and stitched me up while I tried to sleep off my upcoming fever. They called the police and the embassy in Stockholm. And the next day I was back on a plane to the States like nothing ever happened. The aftermath has been pretty much nothing. It was classified as an animal attack and dismissed. I talked to a few people from the AWC about it, and they called it a sincerely regretful incident, and asked me to remain discreet as to not discourage future climate change studies. The AWC still operates in that area, by the way. I've got no answers as to what they've done with the soil samples, or if they ever looked into what I saw in the mire. All I know is that no one wants to talk to me about it. The only people I've gotten answers from were the hunters. They were eager to share their stories, claiming that the government refuses to listen. I'm still in email contact with some of them, and there's a lot to unpack. But in short, there was a quake in the mire. Something came out of the lake. It did something to the wildlife in the area, stole hundreds of reindeer from local Sami herds. It seems to be expanding. Stopping only where it finds immediate and violent resistance. And over time, it seems to learn. This was some time ago, and I don't feel comfortable revealing the entire timeline. 
I don't want to give anyone more reason to silence me. But I know this is bound to happen again. Something similar happened in West Virginia back in 2013. A lake drained in Greenbrier Valley and then all hell broke loose. It's only a matter of time before it happens somewhere more public. And when it does, remember. It seems to learn. Today's bonus story is brought to you by Campfire Tales. If you haven't checked out Campfire Tales' channel, Zach is an amazing narrator with a ton of videos over there. So I hope you guys will listen to this next story and check out his channel if you enjoy his work. This next story was written by Random Appalachian 468 and it's titled, I'm an oil field worker in Barron County, Ohio. We're under attack. Please enjoy. They'll never tell you about the war. It'll never appear on the news or in the history books. No countries will petition our case in the UN. We'll never get any aid supplies or vast shipments of weaponry from the government. I doubt the internet will even notice my little post. But I figure it's worth a shot. At least someone out there might find it and try to do something, even if that something is coming down to pick up all the bones once it's over. I suppose by then you won't be able to recognize any of this. That's okay. Just dump us in a pit together and make sure someone other than the government gets to inherit our stuff. I'm not trying to be tough or melodramatic, just honest. My name is Ethan Sanderson. Right now, I'm sitting around the fire with the others, shoveling down a bowl of unsweetened oatmeal and typing this while I have time. To think my world was sane only a few hours ago. Everything normal obliterated in just over 60 awful minutes. There's no way I'll ever get back to my old job. Not with the roadblocks during the day and the attacks at night. Nope. I'm here to stay. And so I figure I may as well share my story while this bout of decent cell service lasts. It all started when I was driving home from another round of the night shift at the Brighton Smith Petroleum Refinery, tired, covered in grease, and ready for a hot meal before bed. The radio crackled, auto skimming through various channels, looking for anything other than twangy country music, self-pitying pop songs, or yet another news report yammering on about how close we were getting to nuclear war with the Russians. My truck's engine rumbled with a comforting, quiet regularity, and I let myself smile in pride at that. One thing I can do, and that's getting an engine running smooth as silk. As an only child, with my father dying from lung cancer when I was 15, and my mother hooked on drugs since I was 12. I had been on my own for most of my life. Engines had been the one thing I excelled at, school being my nemesis. And after I had fixed up an old F-150 bound for the scrapyard, I had took the first oil rig job I could find and left town. I had done well for myself, staying away from the dealers that had wrecked my mom's life and accumulated enough money to buy a camper, several firearms, and a little solar power setup that allowed me to travel all over the country and relative comfort. Despite never having gone to college, I considered myself successful, and if I ever found a woman who didn't mind the grease on my overalls and wasn't a total lunatic, maybe I'd settle down and have kids of my own. Whatever the case... I swore to myself I'd be a better parent than either of mine had been. No cigarettes, no meth, and no throwing chairs when I got angry. My thoughts were shattered at the sight of several white and orange plastic barricades stretched across the cracked asphalt, completely blocking my path. Behind them, 
two massive slate gray trucks were parked nose to nose across the roadway. Just in case someone did get the bright idea of pushing past the flimsy obstructions. Five men dressed in similar gray uniforms and carrying shiny black rifles stood at the roadblock, with two more perched in the turrets of the armored trucks, manning belt-fed machine guns. I hadn't seen any signs of warning of construction, and never a road crew with armored vehicles, which made something sour twist in the pit of my stomach. As a ghetto kid from Pittsburgh, I'd learned to know that I was in a bad area, and this was all kinds of bad. Look at Barron County trying to be Chicago. I grunted to myself and slowed to a stop in front of the barricades, waiting for the nearest soldier to walk up to my driver's side window. He approached, rifle at low ready, and I noted the automatic switch on its receiver. Nope, these guys weren't regular civilians out for the LARP. You need serious cash to have that kind of firepower, which meant I had to be dealing with some branch of our murky federal government. Just stay calm. You've got nothing to hide, and you've done nothing wrong. Play it cool. Hey, man. I put on a friendly smile, scratching at my beard and pointing at the roadblock. Is there uh, some kind of accident up ahead? Train derailment. From behind his dark face mask, the soldier casually threw out what must have been a predetermined lie, because I knew there was no railroad line near this stretch of the road. A real bad one, I'm afraid. We've been tasked to keep all the civilians out of the area until it's all clear. Which way you headed? He seemed friendly enough, confident and relaxed, though I noted the beginnings of a tattoo that poked from under his uniform sleeve. Rangers lead the way. Something prickled in the back of my mind. A low warning that had saved me from many a muggings in my younger days. These guys weren't local. They didn't have any identifying patches or marks on their vehicles. And with how nice this gear looked, they weren't here as part of some hazmat team. Besides, if they were so hellbent on keeping people out, then why was one of the machine gunners facing the road behind them, as if waiting for someone to try and escape their ring of steel? Collingswood. I rested my elbow on the truck window and jerked a thumb back towards the way I'd come. I work at the oil refinery up the road. You guys military? The soldier chuckled and shrugged. Once upon a time, my dude. We're with the cleanup teams providing security. Like I said, there's some bad stuff down this road. Don't want people tracking through it and getting sick. Interesting timing. I hadn't even heard about any accident, and yet there's already a cordon? Never saw the government move so fast. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I played along, and eyed the rest of them for any symbols that might tell me just who I was dealing with. Well, I'll be honest, this is normally the road I take home, and it's going to take me way out of my way to go around. You sure I couldn't just... From behind his mask, the man gave out a sympathetic sigh. Sorry, man. I've got my orders. No one passes unless they're official personnel. But hey, it should be all clear like in a few days tops. Putting my truck into reverse, I stuck out my hand, doing my best to put them all at ease, and keep the rifles pointed away from my head. Well, hey, thanks for letting me know. I'll tell the other guys at the rig, and we'll try to keep out of your hair. I appreciate it. Despite the mask over his face, I could see the ends of his grin as the soldier shook my hand, and the others relaxed, their guns staying pointed at the ground. Like I said, we'll be done in a few days at most, so if anyone starts getting riled, just let them know we've got this. Uh-huh. Sure you do. I eased backwards into a U-turn 
and drove until I was well out of sight of the roadblock. As soon as they left my rearview mirror, I killed the lights and drifted into the grassy berm, coming to a stop with minimal brake squeal. My trailer sat just on the outskirts of Collingswood in a small, unkept campground that was free to the public. It should have been a short commute, but the local police had been cutting off a lot of routes lately for seemingly no reason at all. However, these upgrades at the roadblock weren't the usual sheriff's deputies. I knew a few guys at the refinery who were ex-military, and the soldier at the checkpoint had the same polite but deadly mannerisms that told me I was dealing with professionals. Whatever was going on out here, they certainly weren't cleaning up a train derailment, especially since there was no train tracks near this road. Wonder what they need to hide so badly that they hire mercs. Pulling out my phone, I checked my maps app and scanned the spiderweb of small gravel roads around Collingwoods for an alternate route. Some of the roads looked so small that I wondered if they would be out of commission, as was the case with many of the neglected coal mining roads in this forgotten part of the Appalachian foothills. Of course, my pickup was four-wheel drive, and if the authorities thought that the road was impassable, then maybe they wouldn't have it guarded. But with dawn only an hour away at best, I'd have to be quick or risk being spotted in the daylight. There. My eyes caught a road called Bethesda Ridge that ran around a large chunk of land on the map labeled New Wilderness Wildlife Reserve. I had heard a few of the locals in Collingswood talk about that place. How pretty it was in the daylight, full of exotic animals and blooming flowers. I'm not much of a flower guy, but always figured maybe someday I'd take a tour to see what all the fuss was about. There had been something in the news a few days ago about some guy named Richter being involved with a scandal connected to the park, but I never paid attention to it. At any rate, this road looked like it should be well maintained, and would only take me five minutes longer than my usual route. With any luck, I'd be back at my camper squeaky clean and eating hot raviolis in no time. I followed the directions my phone reliably spat out, winding up and down steep inclines through narrow overgrown mining roads, and past farmhouse after dilapidated farmhouse. It depressed me how this area was so run down, the opioid epidemic really throwing the community for a hard loop. Part of me knew just by looking at the faded paint and sagging roof lines that these buildings had been beautiful ones, but poverty, an indifferent government, and the unending flow of narcotics poisoned that beauty, turning it into something like a theme from some 90s analog horror movie. Randy, tell me you're seeing this. Swearing under my breath in surprise, I almost jumped out of my skin and stared at my shortwave walkie-talkie. We use them on the various work sites to communicate between crews, but I didn't recognize this voice. It was a young man, and he sounded scared. Yeah, I see him. An older man's voice came through, low and rough, like he was whispering into his mic. Hold fire until they get closer. My curiosity spiked, and I slowed, still driving down the bumpy old coal road in the dark. Most people don't know, but even rudimentary shortwave radios sometimes experience a phenomenon called skip, where the right atmospheric conditions relay radio traffic from somewhere else. Sometimes traffic from different frequencies, channels, or even long distances. I've heard messages as far away as California before, so it didn't surprise me that I could get radio signals like this. Still, they were so clear, so loud, that whoever was talking had to be close by, within 20 miles at least. My God. A woman's voice came through, shocked and tense, as if she were watching a building full of children collapse. 
There's so many, Randy. What do we... Stay calm. The old man barked back. And I got the feeling he had some background in police or military, with the way he seemed to take command of the situation. Just stay put and conserve your ammo. We'll be fine. Head cocked in confusion, I almost didn't look up in time, and slammed my boot down on the brake pedal. Mud slushed under the knobby tread of my truck tires, and brown fur blurred past my headlights. Stunned, I watched in wide-eyed fascination as no less than 50 white-tailed deer bounded across the decrepit road at full speed, not even paying attention to my rumbling truck. Birds darted overhead, not just owls and crows, but all manner of daytime birds as well. Pigeons, sparrows, songbirds, and even bats. Tens of thousands of bugs seethed over the dirt in the dark sheets of wriggling legs, parting to allow the stampede of possums, raccoons, red foxes, and even a pack of coyotes to flee past them like a tidal wave was hot on their tails. Neither stopped to attack each other, prey and predator running together, all with their ears laid back, limbs moving at breakneck speeds without a glance backward. What the? I had never seen animals act like this, not once in all my travels across the U.S. Something seemed to have spooked them, something bad enough that even the insects weren't hanging around to weather the storm. Now! Kaboom! Milliseconds after the old man's voice echoed through the radio, a bright flash lit up the horizon to my left, and a huge fiery orange ball rose from behind the hills bordering the road. My truck rocked, the shockwave rippled through the ground even from this far away, and I ducked out a reflex. What the hell is going on here? My heart roared in my ear, and I pushed the accelerator to the floor, heaving through the horde of wildlife to fly down the dark road like a bat out of hell. Take the next left. The map app on my phone chirped in its neutral, pleasant female voice. And I drifted around the turn without even slowing down, spare sockets from my tool set rolling over the floorboard across my feet. Gravel pinged against the undersides of my truck cab, and the landscape opened up around me, more grasslands than trees. Flickers of orange light filled the sky, and the radio vomited a cacophony of human voices all ranging to be heard about the hiss of static and faint echoes of what sounded like gunfire. On your left! Phillips, watch out! Randy, we need help on the right side. My gun's jammed. I swallowed and dodged potholes as sweat trickled down my scruffy face. Being in the oil field, nothing much scared me after working around some of the scum the companies recruited. But now my pulse thudded against my thin flesh in my temple. My heart rammed into each rib like it wanted out, and the air constricted in my lungs. Above me, the grim clouds reflected seething red and orange flames. The gunshots became audible in spite of my rolled-up window, and I caught the rattle of a Kalashinovic rifle, along with the deep boom-boom-boom of a real-life M2 machine gun. Take the next left, then proceed straight for two miles. Yanking hard on the steering wheel, I rounded the bend, and my jaw dropped. The gravel stretched on a long, back-and-forth, swerving path that was as straight as you could get for the most rural southeastern Ohio back roads. On one side, tall wire mesh fence lined the quiet ditches and grassy meadows, with a sign to my left not ten yards away marked New Wilderness Wildlife Reserve. On the other side, a large open section of grassland stretched out into the distance potmarked by little tractor paths and clusters of short trees, a few ponds interspersed in between. I could see where, in the daytime, it would have been beautiful, 
full of multicolored wildflowers and flocks of butterflies. But it wasn't beautiful now. Fire chewed through the tall grass and slow-moving walls of hungry orange and red, sending sparks skyward and bathed the entire area in shifting shadows. Heavy gray clouds clotted the night sky, and I smelt burning rubber on the wind. Bright yellow muzzle flashes cut through the dark in the mist of the field, and a row of cabins burned on the other side of the plain, billowing back smoke rising like a pall of doom. Dug in across the field with their backs to the road, a thin line of people fought with desperate brutality. I saw Armalites and Kalashnikovs intermixed with bolt-action hunting rifles and shotguns along with flaming bottles of gasoline and pipe bombs covered in taped-on nails. Explosions went off every few seconds. The improvised grenades tossed in waves, and one man shouldered what looked to be a homemade rocket launcher made from a fire extinguisher with fins welded onto it. The entire scene looked like the 4th of July on steroids, but the feral desperation of the fight told me this was no rifle range. These people were fighting for their lives, and I felt like I had stumbled into something awful, a horrible nightmare that wasn't meant for the outside world to see. And then, as I gripped my steering wheel in dread, through the tall grass, they came. Like lions throwing themselves at the herd of trapped gazelle, Hunched figures loped forward, their shadows otherworldly in the light of the flames. Long, slender gray limbs ended in three-fingered claws at each hand, the legs shorter than the distended forearms so that they ran like gorillas. Their muscled shoulders propelled them forward in frightening speed. They didn't have tails, their skin the texture of smooth birch bark with twig-like extensions poking out from their warty elbows and spines like prehistoric spikes down their backs. Each creature's head was long and narrow, like a crocodile's snout, but with a crown of more branch-like spikes around the skull in a fan, and no eyes that I could discern. This can't be real. In an instant... The screams came through the glass of my truck cab, and cold, bone-chilling shrieks echoed across the wide fields. Not the pained, frightened squeal of an animal defending itself, but an ancient, hate-filled war cry that held no humanity in it whatsoever, repeated by dozens upon dozens of long-limbed predatory fiends. The roar of a diesel cut through the night, and I barely reacted in time to avoid T-boning a massive green combine that burst through an open gate on the left side of the road, its front blades whirling. Someone had wielded sharp angled iron all over it, and gleaming chains that had been bolted to the blades at the front, tipped with shiny bits of razor blades. Black exhaust gusted from its smokestack and a young man with blonde hair piloted it from the cab, enclosed by a rebar cage into the brushy field. I'll clear the right side. A man called through the radio, sitting in my cup holder. Jamie, you take the left. Let's go wrap them up. Wrap them up. Behind the combine came a big yellow backhoe, also covered in spikes and rebar with long rubber hoses running from the oil drum mounted on the back to a flaming nozzle affixed to its iron bucket. Right behind you! The girl's voice crackled amongst the chatter, and the two machines diverged to swing around on either end of the lane of fighters, their tracks and tires churning up the muddy ground like mechanical dinosaurs. Even from my speeding truck... I heard the impact of the first creatures being mowed down by the combine, its blade and chains ripping into flesh and bone with vicious fury. Opposite it, the backhoe moved its craned arm like the neck of some giant monster and spewed bright yellow flames onto the onrushing horde of pale beans, lighting up the field for hundreds of yards around them. 
dozens of mutants fell, either burned or diced to pieces, and the ground shook with the triumphant roar of the diesels. The sickly sweat stench of burnt flesh filled the air, machinery clanged and banged, and the guns roared with chemical delight. Pained creatures from the bizarre creatures echoed, and above the gunfire, a cheer rang out from the line of people. Bill, get out of there! The girl called Jamie cried over the radio. In an instant, the triumphant moment turned the chaos, as a creature jumped almost twenty feet into the air and landed like a cat atop the combine. The iron spikes sank deep into the already bleeding feet and hands, and ripped into the rebar around the cab with abandon. Metal squealed, bent, and then sheared off as the glass of the cab shattered. A man's scream briefly pierced the radio static, and the combine was overwhelmed, tipped onto its side by a wave of snapping monsters. Fall back! The old man's shout came through the radio, even as I watched a figure that may have been him continue firing the M2 into the onrushing waves of creatures. Fall back to the ridge! Whoa! A white pickup truck lurched into the roadway, and I locked up my brakes to slide around it. A chestnut-haired girl around my age sat at the wheel, blood running down her forehead, with a black polo shirt on. In the bed stood an old man with glasses and gray hair, gripping the handle of a fifty caliber machine gun, its barrel cherry red with heat. Others streamed across the road in full retreat, all in black shirts with the New Wilderness logo on the front, and they all dragged wounded comrades away from the burning field. My truck ground to a stop on the side of a dirt embankment not five feet away, stalling from the sudden downgrade in RPMs. The people in the white truck blinked at me in shock, and I stared right back, both sides seeming confused as to why the other was there. What are you doing? The old man astride the fifty caliber shouted, and waved at me as if I was an airplane attempting to land in the wrong airport. Get out of here! Go! Jerked back into the present by his raspy command, I scrambled at the ignition, the stubborn motor choosing this moment to chug-chug-chug instead of fire. Horrid reptilian chittering clicked nearby, and I whimpered like a trapped puppy, terror seething through my mind. (sighs) Jamming the stick into reverse, I punched my boot to the gas pedal. The transmission whined, my tires spun, and a sinking feeling ran through my guts. I was high-centered, my wheels caught on either side of the bank, the dirt lodged underneath my truck chasis holding me in place. It didn't matter if I had four-wheel drive or not if my wheels couldn't get purchase. I was stuck. Wham! My world lurched sideways as a massive fist had slammed into the cab of my beloved pickup. Gravity inverted, the seatbelt dug into my chest, and broken bits of glass sprayed across my field of vision. Everything seemed to move in slow motion and I watched spare sockets and old candy bar wrappers and my handheld radio float in the air in front of my face. Crash. Reality snapped back like a gunshot, and the mutilated Ford rolled down into the ditch of the opposite side of the gravel road. I looked down at the cab ceiling, my arms hanging suspended from my shoulders, and registered a metallic taste in my mouth. Well... That's not good. Somewhere across the road came the dull thud of a heavy footstep, and I turned groggily to see what it was. The creature stood not yards away, tall as a horse, and its crocodilian eyeless head swiveled from side to side, tasting the air. Red blood glistened on its dagger-like yellowed teeth, bared in the firelight, and a long, black, serpentine tongue flickered in and out rhythmatically. Something about its gray, sinewy form echoed into my head, 
stirring a part of me I hadn't known existed. I had been scared before as a little kid when my mom would get crazy about her drug habit. I had been scared on the streets when the older boys tried to sell me to some homeless guy. And I had been scared the day one of the men on our rig down in New Mexico came to work with an axe and killed four people. This was different. This was something else. Something deeper. A primal, extinctual fear, one older than engines, skyscrapers, and radios. A fear born on instinct. The fear of prey when it sees its predator. Jerking its head around, the creature seemed to lock onto me, as if it could smell the terror seeping from my pores and opened its marrow jaws to reveal row after row of jagged, steak-knife-sized teeth. It roared a colossal prehistoric sound that made the skin on my arms crawl with dread. I gotta get out. I thrashed, clawed at my seatbelt buckle, my sweaty fingers slipping and sliding over the metal button. Both my lungs felt like they were too small to get enough air, and all the blood rushed to my head in a wave of panic. A shadow fell over me, and I whipped my head around. Foul breath reeked from the torn flesh of a hundred corpses blasted my face. The open maw of the creature right outside my window. Thick gooey strands of saliva threw little rainbow reflections in the light. And the teeth that poked out from the modded gray gums held bits of flesh and clothing stuck between them. A broken shoeless wound around one like a stuck noodle. I could see right down the dark cavern of its throat and it almost resembled the inside of a rotten log, bumpy and grooved with black flesh instead of rosy pink. I watched as the teeth headed right for my exposed face. Bam, 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 bam! Letting out a howl of pain and anger, the monster staggered back, and dark black spots appeared on its bark-like hide. Smaller silhouettes dashed into the firelight, their guns spitting little streams of flame, while the heavy machine gun thundered on behind them. My mind still spun in horrified confusion, and I hung there motionless as the creature tumbled to the ground in a twitching heap. Hurry up! Grab my hand! Let's go! One of the men in the road dumped several more rifle rounds into the head of the fallen beast. His comrades scuttled towards my truck. A muscular form crouched outside my window, and a man leaned in, about my age, with close-cut black hair and bloodied lip. Hey, you still alive? So far. Blood surged in my skull, giving me a headache, and I shouted to be heard above the hammering of the big gun just outside. My belt stuck. A steel knife blade flashed in the dark and I plummeted to the cab ceiling, barely managing to break my fall with both arms outstretched. Someone grabbed me by the collar and dragged me out into the wet grass. Get up, man! We can't stay here! I got to my feet and scurried with the rest of them for the white pickup truck, spent brass casings sliding under my boots like marbles. All around me, the creatures devoured anyone they caught up with, and it seemed the guns never stopped firing. The night sky filled with smoke from the fires that raged across the open grass fields, and screams of torment from dying people rang in my ears. Driving over the side of my rusty truck bed, I huddled down behind the low wheel well, and the vehicle lurched away from the hill, plowing through a set of reinforced gates at the top. The instant I saw the barbed wire top swing shut behind us, I sat up and the breath stuck in my chest. A crudely built log wall surrounded a cluster of single-story buildings with a large asphalt parking lot in the center. Four towers stood at each corner of the fort, two looking like they had been used for zip lining at one time, and the other two likely built the same time as the wall made from dented red shipping containers stood on end. 
From every direction, people carried green ammunition cans, dragged stretchers with wounded on them, or rushed to man the ramparts of the wooden palisades with all kinds of weapons in their arms. Many were young, likely no older than their early twenties at best, their faces sheet white with fear. What the hell is this place? Darren, grab some gloves and help Richard get this gun on that wall. Barking at the top of his gravely smoker's voice, the old man waded through the sea of hot brass casings in the truck bed and leaned down to offer me a hand up. On your feet, son. No time to waste. I... what are... what's going on? Phyllis, grab some ammo and top everyone off. Oblivious to my sputtered protests, the old man jumped down from the truck bed and continued pointing people to their stations. David, get on the radio and tell the martyr crews to start laying hate. Sean, find this guy a gun and check on Carter's men. The dark-haired guy who had pulled me from my Ford jumped down from the truck and gestured for me to follow him. Come on, this way. Confused and terrified, I ran after him, dodging five girls in blood-stained clothing who ran to carry a wounded man back into a long rectangular building to our left, with a sign marked New Wilderness Visitor Center beside the doorway. We ducked through the door, then down a narrow hallway to the left, and the man named Sean pushed open the door to what looked to be a storeroom. Green ammo cans were stacked to the ceiling, with black plastic crates on the side marked medical, and a mostly empty weapons rack bolted to the brick wall. Various bits of vests, holsters, and tactical gear hung from the hooks beside the ammunition, and a row of black gas masks dangled next to them. Did a doomsday bunker explode in here? You know how to shoot? He tossed a woodland camo-patterned bandolier at me. The pouch is already filled with gray steel magazines, and yanked one of the few remaining rifles from the weapons rack. Wide-eyed with stock, I blinked down at the web gear in my hand. I mean, yeah, but what's going on? Sean pushed the gleaming black rifle into my arms, and held my gaze with wild bloodshot eyes. I don't have time to explain, all right? If you want to live, follow me and do exactly as I say, got it? Woof, woof. Outside, the dull roar of something like a propane cannon split the air and Sean grabbed a few more ammunition cans before he slipped past me out the door. Come on, the martyrs are up. We've got to reinforce the left flank, or the freaks will be inside the wire. Put your stuff on, man. Let's go. Running while pulling a poorly adjusted chest rig on provoked to be nearly impossible, so I slung the morass of nylon over one shoulder, gripping my rifle as we sprinted through the courtyard. We passed two circular sandbag pits, manned by a couple scrawny teenagers who feverishly dropped homemade rockets into a couple of green-painted steel pipes, dirt flying with every shot. Eerie roars echoed just on the other side of the wall, returned by the fighters atop the ramparts pouring in lead at the beasts without pause. The crack of rifles blending into the never-ending wave. The stench of coppery blood and acrid gunpowder filled the air, along with pillars of black smoke from burning fuel bombs. Medics staggered around the yard, some of them girls who looked no older than sixteen pressing white gauze to spurting wounds, and leaning over their wounded patients to shield them from dust kicked up from the martyrs. It was absolute bedlam, and all I wanted to do was find something solid to crawl under. Carter! Sean charged up a set of steps and into a log pillbox built atop the leftmost corner of the wall. Ammo! Inside, a few older men with silver in their hair and beer guts beneath their weather worn army fatigue snatched up the ammunition cans from Sean, empty magazines covering the floor around them. Despite their bulky physiques, 
I got the impression from how they moved that these men had worn those uniforms before, in a different time, when they had darker hair and slimmer waistlines. Looks like a VFW meeting on cocaine. One of the men, a thinner guy with a short gray ponytail and Viking-style beard, crouch walked over to us. Where's the 50? He shouted. The incessant bam-bam of guns enough to make my ears hurt. Randy set it to the front gate. Sean howled back and jerked his thumb at himself and I. Where are your reinforcements? The gray-haired man pointed to his right, through the firing slit of the little fighting position. Dawn's not far off. We just gotta hold him off until then. Pick a spot and get to work. Sean scuttled to an open spot at the firing line, racking the charging handle of my rifle with clammy fingertips. I flicked the safety switch off and peered down the dimly lit iron sights into the darkness. Dear God. There had to be close to 200 of them, surging over the burning field past the fallen combine and up the slope to the walls in fluid, deadly speed. Like ocean waves, they rolled forward, dozens upon dozens, a never-ending tide of long-limbed, reptile-faced monsters, with wood skin that seemed to eat bullets. Without fear, they threw themselves at the wall, oblivious to the danger, almost immune to the pain. Driven by an insatiable urge to rip and tear, their ancient battle roars enough to chill me to the bone. I blinked and caught sight of one as it crawled up an incline of its dead fellows, reptilian teeth bared, moving so fast it was almost a blur. Placing the front sight post over its bark-like hide, I pressed the trigger over and over. The rifle buckled in my arms obediently. Gunfire from our position peppered the oncoming monster and it fell with an agonizing shriek less than 30 yards away, black blood oozing from dozens of wounds. In my hands, the smoking rifle yawned with an empty chamber, and I ducked down to reach for a fresh magazine. Just before I could reload, however, something in the distance caught my eye. Pinpricks of light flickered in the far tree line, yellow sporadic flashes that looked vaguely familiar. It occurred to me that the beasts outside weren't fleeing from the gunfire, even as we mowed them down, almost as if they had nowhere else to go but run through the hail of lead. By all accounts, they should have turned tail and ran for the woods like any other animal. But why weren't they? Squinting hard, I focused on the lights, and something inside my brain clicked. Muzzle flashes. They were concealed just inside the cover of the dark pines, as many as sixty more guns firing into the herd of crawling nightmares. But they weren't moving in to help clear the beasts from the fort walls. Instead, they stayed where they were, turning any stray monsters that tried to escape away and sent them lumbering towards our position. They're hurting them. They're hurting them right to us. The tree line! I snapped Sean's arm until he stopped firing and pointed to the distant gunfire. See that? There's guys over there. Sean yanked a black handheld radio from his chest rig and clicked the talk button. Marksman, hit the trees. I repeat, muzzles flashes in the tree line. Hit them hard. I pressed the trigger several times in the general direction of the flashes, emptying mag after mag in an effort to keep both the monsters and the mysterious human instigators at bay. Others on the ramparts with scoped hunting rifles seemed to be having better luck, as cries of, Got one! and I hit him! echoed from every position. One by one, the flashes started to fade out, either due to retreat or the marksmen finding their target. A soft warmth tickled my left cheek, and I turned to see the sky begin to lighten, the first long ray of sunshine slipping over the dark horizon. 
dawn. Cheers went up from all down the line. With the unknown attackers in the tree line suppressed, some of the monstrous creatures turned from the tide of lead and made their way for the forest. Their flight started a rout, as more creatures followed like a flock of birds, and soon, the last of them disappeared into the trees at the far side of the scorched grassland. The gunfire started to slacken off, and I slumped down with my back to the wall beside Sean, the two of us grinning with relief. Not bad, newbie. He leaned his steaming rifle against the wall to cool off and stuck out a hand. Sean Hammond. Ethan. I shook it, heart still racing and set my own rifle on the floor, waves of heat rising from its now purple barrel. Ethan Sanderson. He pulled out a small flask and unscrewed the cap to offer it to me. Well, Sanderson, cheers. You didn't die. Glad to know that's a celebratory accomplishment out here. With my limbs shaking from the adrenaline wearing off, I cast back my head to gulp down some of the burning amber whiskey. What were those things? Sean climbed to his feet and gave me a hand up. Birch crawlers. They usually don't cluster into super packs that big unless they're hunting or threatened. I figure we have Sheriff Warnoff to thank for that. My eyes widened and I stared out into the gutted battlefield, trying to count the bodies and failing miserably. Warnov? Our Warnov? I don't get it, man. Why would the cops do something like this? That's exactly what I asked the sheriff. Sean's face hardened into a firm frown. Right before he tried to blow my brains out. They've been lying to us, all of us, for years. My blood ran cold at the way he said that, but I refused to lose my cool. So, what do we do now? Picking up his rifle, Sean slung it over one shoulder and scratched at his stubble beard with a yawn. Well, I'd say it's about breakfast time, wouldn't you? Might as well get comfortable, Sanderson. Looks like you're going to be here for a while, since Warnov and his men are still out there. Too relieved to be alive and confused by the deluge of strange events that I witnessed, I shuffled out of the pillbox into the early morning breeze. Groans from wounded and dying fighters rose through the air, many of the nurses weeping and wailing as more of the critically injured began to die from blood loss. Most of the gunfire ceased. Only a few of the fighters still finishing off wounded birch crawlers with merciless hate. In the creeping daylight, a carpet of dead monsters laid piled up against the palisade wall, some so high I could have reached over and touched their still twitching claws. They had gotten close, too close, and I realized that my death had clambered within a few feet from me more than once this night. How these things even existed, I still don't know. It made no sense to me. None of it. Hey, new guy. I looked down to see a chestnut-haired girl waving from beside a metal oil drum, a fire burning in the center of it. Suit and exhaustion lined her face, but it still bore a soft, friendly smile. You frozen up there? Over. It was over, at least for now, and that was all that mattered. I survived my childhood. I survived the streets of Pittsburgh. If I could do that, I figured, then this strange park was no different. Just like before, I would take it one day at a time. I'd get some food, scrounge more ammunition, and see if I could find some decent cell phone service. Maybe the girl by the fire would lend me her phone. It'd be a good excuse to get her number. You know, it's kind of pretty here in the daytime. Taking a deep breath of crisp morning air, I shouldered my rifle and made my way down the wooden rampart steps. The smell of wood smoke in my nose and the echoes of guns still ringing 
in my ears. By now you've probably heard of the popular TV show that portrays the cordyceps fungus infecting humans and turning them into zombie-like creatures. But let me tell you, the real-life scenario is much more terrifying. I work in a lab that specializes in plant and fungi experimentation. Our primary focus is on developing new drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, including everything from anti-aging remedies to creating the next little blue pill. However, we also received significant funding from the Defense Department, and their research requirements are much more sinister. How are the new test subjects going? Steve, our lab supervisor, asked as he approached me, carrying a clipboard. He gestured towards the eight test rooms in front of us. Number four looks promising, and I think six and seven are starting to show signs, I said, looking up from my workstation. Inside the eight test rooms were five men and two women, one in each room plus a single empty room. It was left empty after a rogue chimpanzee from the earlier phase experiments had managed to escape its cage and break the pass-through window, which is used to transfer materials and instruments between sterile and non-sterile rooms. Stephen nodded, a look of excitement on his face. Excellent. We're getting closer. In the cages... Test subject 1, 2, 3, and 5 appeared to be behaving somewhat normally, pacing their small 8x8 eight eight cage or talking to themselves. However, test subject 4 had remained motionless now for about two hours, lying on his side with his back to us, with his chest rising and falling, his only movements. Meanwhile, test subjects 6 and 7 had recently become lethargic, barely responding to the electric shocks administered to their enclosure. All of the test subjects had been exposed to a variety of chemically altered cordyceps fungus. Typically, cordyceps cannot infect humans due to our higher internal temperature, among other factors. However, by modifying the fungus's genetic makeup, we were close to changing that. Let's keep a close eye on those three. Report back to me if there are any updates. Will do, I replied. With that, Stephen left the room and I returned to monitoring the test subjects' vitals on the screen. Interestingly, subjects 4, 6, and 7 had significantly elevated heart rates, almost 50% higher than the others. Additionally, their endorphin levels, the body's natural painkillers, were unusually high, indicating that they were experiencing intense pain, despite showing none of the typical outward signs. What do you make of this? I asked my lab partner, Mike, while pointing to the screen with my pen. He looked over the vitals on my screen. It looks like they are in intense pain. Those sorts of levels would be what I would expect to see if someone were on fire, he said dryly. Yes, that's what it looks like to me as well. Our test subjects were some of the worst criminals our government had locked up. The advantage of working for the Defense Department, especially where we required human subjects, was there was no shortage of forgotten criminals. Terrorists, murderers, and other violent offenders. These individuals were typically housed in maximum security prisons and were serving lengthy life sentences often. While the use of human subjects in Scientific experiments is controversial and subject to strict ethical guidelines. The Defense Department saw the need to conduct these tests outside the normal guidelines. Therefore, the rules no longer applied, and we had the green light to do whatever we needed to get the result. Let's do a blood test to see if the troponin levels have increased on subject 4, 6, and 7, I said to Mike. Mike nodded and left his seat to get dressed in his hazmat suit. With the heart rate and endorphin levels so extremely elevated, I thought it could be possible that the cordyceps is already spreading through the test subjects. 
paralyzing them while simultaneously causing immense pain. If my theory was right, then not only would we have successfully managed to infect the first ever human with cordyceps, but it would have taken effect within three hours of exposure. Cordyceps is a type of parasitic fungus that primarily infects ants, as well as other insects such as beetles and caterpillars. The infection process begins when a spore of the cordyceps fungus lands on the exoskeleton of an ant. Once the spore is attached to the ant, it begins to grow long, branching filaments that penetrate the ant's exoskeleton and start to invade its body. As the fungus grows, it releases chemicals that alter the ant's behavior, causing it to become disoriented and leave its colony. The fungus continues to grow inside the ant's body, eventually replacing its organs and tissues with a mass of fungal cells. We are not stupid. We know exactly why the Defense Department want to uh, essentially weaponize this. We do this because we are scientists, and pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and further understanding the world around us is fundamental to our role. Now fully suited up, Mike entered the first test subject's room, number four, and activated the cage squeeze function. The cage started to close in on the test subject, squeezing in from front and back. This process meant Mike could get up and close to the test subject without risk to himself. But just as the cage closed in tight, locking the subject in place, his skin burst from multiple areas and sharp, dagger-like spores fired out in all directions. Panicking, Mike turned and ran for the door he just came in through. I reached for the emergency lockdown button to prevent him from leaving and hit it a second too late. Mike ran out into the connecting corridor, screaming in pain. Some of the spores had penetrated his suit and were now drilling their way into his body as Mike screamed and clawed at the holes, ripping his hazmat suit while trying to get them out. I activated the alarms and locked down my door as Mike thrashed about in the corridor. A few minutes later, I heard security come running down the hall and yell at Mike to get down. But he was in too much pain to respond. The security guards continued to yell at Mike, tasers drawn, when Mike suddenly started running at them. Without flinching, both security guards tasered Mike, dropping him to the floor. They then slowly approached him to restrain him when suddenly Mike's body tore open and fired out more dagger-like spores. Impossible, I yelled at the camera as I watched both guards get hit by the spores. The cordyceps had multiplied and spread within minutes. The guards, now themselves in agonizing pain, ran back through the doors they'd come through and into one of the main lab halls where more than a dozen researchers were working. Watching through the cameras, I saw the researchers panicking and trying to escape by the now locked doors as the two security guards thrashed around. Then, just like Mike, the security guards' skin split open, firing multiple spores around the room. Most of the researchers had now been infected, and those that avoided being struck by the spores weren't so lucky a few minutes later as more spores went flying around the room. Soon every researcher was infected, screaming and writhing in agony. I stayed in my locked room for hours, watching as the infected slowly stopped moving. One by one, they collapsed to the floor or the tabletops, and I watched in horrified amazement as fungal growths started to grow from the holes in their skin. I eventually put on a hazard suit, unlocked the door, and left the office, slowly walking towards Mike's still body. By now, he was covered in fungal stalks and mushroom-like growths, and one had even gone right through his eye socket, popping his eyeball out to the side. But that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was his other eye, which was fixated on me. It had an expression of sheer terror and agony. He was alive paralyzed, and appeared to be feeling every horrifying moment as the cordyceps slowly dissolved his internal organs and replaced them with fungal growths. I'm sorry, Mike, I whispered, genuinely upset at his predicament. Mike was a good guy, but I knew I couldn't help him. The cordyceps 
were devouring his internal organs as he lay there. So I did what any good scientist would do. I carefully took a sample of the growth from his eye socket and a blood sample. I then carefully attached a mobile heart rate monitor to his arm through one of the ripped holes Mike had made earlier and then slowly backed away into the secure room, locked the doors, and awaited my rescue. The data I could get from Mike would no doubt prove invaluable for our next attempt. So here I wait. It has taken longer than I thought to be rescued. It has now been about 60 hours since Mike got infected. The bodies are now unrecognizable lumps of fungal growths, and Mike's heart finally stopped registering a pulse about 15 hours ago, which means he was alive for two whole days after the infection. He did seem to have multiple heart attacks during that time, no doubt from the pain of different organs turning to slush, but somehow he was kept alive. I have tried the internal lines multiple times, but no one is answering. It's probably a security protocol I'm unaware of. And I can't see the cameras outside this part of the facility. But I'm sure they're just taking extreme precautions. After all, the last thing anyone would want is for this to escape the lab. But I'm sure everything is fine. At least, I hope it is. It has now been 270 hours, or just over 11 days, since the first spores infected Mike. I have slowly accepted that help may not be coming, as some had suggested in the comments in my last post. So for the past few days, I've been planning my escape. I'm not sure what has happened outside my lab area, or the conversations my superiors have been having, but I'm assuming it has been deemed too risky to attempt a rescue at this stage. There are still no internal comms working. The phones are down and the internet chat is disabled. Actually, that's not quite accurate. The phones don't seem to be technically down, it's more like no one is answering them. The only item that is working is this tablet, set up to share documents and files on our internet only, which I managed to jailbreak and connect to an external cell tower somewhere. Unfortunately, this section of the lab is located underground and there is no reception. Every now and then, however, it does connect with a single bar. It's a brief connection, usually only seconds. And while I did once manage to connect a call, it dropped out almost immediately. But it was enough to upload my last report online. And hopefully it will be enough to do it again. There have been a few developments in my current situation that I need to share. These developments have impacted some of my plans, and have also put me under some pressure to fast-track my escape. Firstly, our test subjects. As mentioned earlier, test subject 4 was the one that showed the earliest signs they were experiencing a positive reaction to the cordyceps, which was later confirmed. I know some of you will find my use of the term positive as an oxymoron, but from my point of view, that's what it was. While it seems the cordyceps compound had also worked on test subjects 6 and 7, though it took another 72 hours for that to be confirmed, they had both been lying almost completely still in their cages, the monitors displaying their vitals indicating they were still very much alive, and, like four, in extreme pain. That's when Six started to violently convulse, thrashing about his cell like a puppet being pulled by all the strings at the same time. Not long after, his head suddenly jerked back at a seemingly impossible angle, Splitting him open at the neck as a long, wet fungal stalk pushed its way out of his throat. He collapsed on the ground and his vitals immediately flatlined as the fungal stalk unfurled and stretched across the small cage. Seven was more interesting. Shortly after Six's head popped off, Seven started to convulse. But Seven somehow managed to regain some motor control, scratching at his eyes and managed to scream out, Help me! before both his eyes were violently forced out of their sockets, as gray-green fungal stalks pushed their way through the path of least resistance. He continued to thrash and scream as his shirt rippled and moved, with dozens more stalks slowly ripping through the soft skin around his ribcage. 
Ten hours later, his screams had stopped, most likely due to the large stock that had worked its way out of his mouth. The other subjects, one, two, three, and five, showed no signs of delayed infection. They died from having no access to food or water for 11 days, which, in hindsight, seems like a preferable way to have gone. They, of course, had no idea what had happened to the others, and had spent the first few days screaming and yelling for help while trying to break out of their cages. I eventually muted their feed, but kept the visuals going in case a delayed infection presented itself. None did, though, which was a little disappointing. Also, on day six, the power cut out. The backup generators kicked in, along with the emergency lighting, casting the hallways and labs in a slow, flashing, blood-red hue. Mike's disfigured body in the hallway and those of the guards and lab technicians in the main lab hall became an even more terrifying sight in the low red light. The flashing lights almost gave the bodies a new life, casting dancing shadows around them. Also, the blood that had pooled around each body from the wounds where the spores had torn their skin had seemingly become the perfect ground for fungal growth. Large patches of mucus-colored growth spread out from the bodies like lumpy tentacles feeling their way across the floor and up the walls. And then, three days ago, Mike's head broke off and slid away. Yes, you heard that right. And I didn't even notice it happen. Mike was essentially just a large, semi-human-shaped lump of colorful fungal growths by then. But I had been observing him on the monitors long enough to notice that something drastic had changed. I had to rewind the security footage to see what had happened, and sure enough, at around 11.30 the night before, his head fell from his body and onto the floor. Then, like a fast-moving snail, it slid off down the hall toward my door, where it stopped for a few minutes and seemed to feel around the edges like it was looking for a way in. Then it turned suddenly and took off, continuing down the hall and around the corner where it moved out of sight. It was fascinating and terrifying at the same time. The fungal stalk from his eye socket almost seemed like a snail's eye, moving around as the head slid like it was directing it as it went. But the thing that had worried me the most was the question. Why did it stop at my door like that? Could it tell I was in here? Would it try again? I started to plan my escape at that point. This lab, as I have previously mentioned, primarily focuses on drug development for the pharmaceutical industry. The main building is a two-storied glass and brick building located in the mountains, 30 minutes from the city outskirts. The area I work in is located 30 meters directly below the main building. There are two main ways out. The elevator, which goes straight up to the main building, and an emergency exit. The emergency exit leads to a two-mile-long corridor, which eventually exits via a large metal door in the side of the mountain. To get to either of those exits, I need to get through the doors that the lab technicians were banging on before they were infected. Behind that door is a small hallway with a security desk. That then leads to the lobby, a large pentagon-shaped room where the lift and emergency exit are located. Three of the five walls of the lobby are colored, red, yellow, and blue, and they all lead through laboratories and testing rooms just like the one I'm in. The other two walls in the lobby are white, with the reception admin area on one, and offices for the senior managers and supervisors on the other. The emergency exit is located between these two areas. I'm currently in one of the research rooms at the back of the yellow lab. The biggest hurdle in my escape plan so far is a large fungal mass against the door in the main lab hall. Two or three bodies have become merged in a large clump of fungal matter, and it appears the bodies have, through what appears to be some sort of slimy mucus, become attached to the doors. The doors themselves will be unlocked now that the generators have kicked in, so at least it's not all bad news. The entire facility may still be in a code red lockdown, meaning I'm unlikely to receive a hero's welcome in the lobby as no one will be there. The red and blue labs would have been evacuated once I activated the alarm, so I am unlikely to see anyone until I return to the main lab above ground. I'm going to put on my hazmat suit and leave the safety of my office now. The suit is equipped with a camera and a voice recorder, so I will be recording everything on that from now on.
in case something goes wrong. I have downloaded all the data from our experiments onto a flash drive, which I will be taking with me. I also plan on trying to collect some samples on the way if it's safe to do so, so I will have a small bag with plenty of sample tubes, swabs, and tongs. I just heard some banging in the ducts. What sounded like something crawling quickly in there. So it's time for me to get out of here. Wish me luck. Note, the following was transcribed from a voice recording that was uploaded to the web. Okay, suits on, voice recorder, working, camera, camera. Shit, the camera's not working. Of course it isn't. Oh, that's annoying, but not much I can do about it now. Okay, got the flash drive, check. Bags and tubes, check. <sighs> Alright, I guess I'm ready. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Sean Johnson, lead mycologist in the cordyceps trial here at... Oh, damn it. Sorry, sorry, I just knocked over a tray table. Or was I? That's right, it's currently 8.46pm on the 17th of July, 2023. I am currently located in a top-secret underground research laboratory where there's been an, an incident that has resulted in many fatalities. I'm about to leave the safety of my secure room and make my way back to the lobby. Then hopefully up the elevator and, and back to the main lab building above ground. I'm making this recording while firstly as a record of, of what I see out there to assist with my future research, but also as evidence in case something goes wrong. I don't make it back. Okay, that's it. Shit. I didn't think I'd be this nervous. Okay, deep breath. Slow and easy. Here we go. Okay, I am now in the corridor where Mike's headless body is. The red emergency lighting in here is is not great, and my, my suit's head torch is barely making a difference. There is a slimy bloodstained trail where Mike's head traveled down the hall. I'm just going to grab a sample of that. Alright, well, I don't want to stand around waiting for his, his head to come back, so let's get a move on. I really wish it was brighter in here. This red flashing light is making me feel nervous. I mean, it's making it look like Mike's body is moving as the shadows bounce around him. God, he's a mess. I'm only a few feet away from him now. It... It's hard to describe the color of the growths that dominate Mike's body in this light, but it's uh, it's like a mix of dark greens, browns, and some dark yellow. I can see lines of dark purple, deep red running in the stalks, almost like almost like veins. The mucus webbing, which is more evident this close, is a, a light brown color, tra semi-transparent. It seems to web Mike's body to the floor and wall like a like a cocoon of some kind. I have to take a sample of this. This is very interesting. Carefully, does it? Shit! Wow. I'm 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 just slowly backing away from Mike's body. My heart is racing. Oh my god! Let me catch my breath. Okay, okay. My heart is pounding my ears. Okay, calm down. All right, I went to get cut some webbing for a sample. As soon as I, as soon as I touched it, Mike's chest, it moved. It moved a lot. I've backed right away. I'm right down the corridor now, next to the door to the main lab hall. I didn't get the sample. I'll, I'll try again from one of the other bodies. There's no point going back. Here I go. This room is normally, it's normally so welcoming and bright. Staff work around the clock in here. There's there's constantly something going on. It now feels like a, an apocalyptic murder scene. The red flashing lights, the, the piled up bodies, the fungal tentacles, which are much more prominent up close, stretch for meters across the floor and up the wall. Oh, wow. This is amazing. I've just found what looks like one of the spores stuck in the wall beside me. I almost missed it. Here, let me just, let me just grab this and bag it. It's amazing. It's... It's about the length of my palm, and feels like uh, like a piece of petrified wood, shaped sort of like an arrowhead. It has these, what looks like, tiny clawed feet, only a few millimeters long, all over it, which might be how it drills its way into the body. I can actually see them 
pulsating when I pulled it from the wall, but they have stopped. Now it's in the bag. Fascinating. Okay, I'm going to follow the wall around. There are there are too many bodies scattered in around the, the middle of the room to, in between the research tables, not to mention furniture and office equipment all over the ground. Okay, this route, this route looks... It appears to be the clearest, at least until I get closer to the door, that is. <laughs> you know, if this were, were a movie, I'd be expecting one of these bodies to, to jump up and charge me. I wish the camera were working so you could see what I'm seeing. I've made it up to the corner of the room now, another 20 meters or so, I'll be at the exit doors. <laughs> Shit. I just stepped on one of the fungal tentacles. I didn't even see it, but... Three meters away is a body of one of the lab techs. As soon as I stepped on the tentacle, the body moved. Let me try this again. I'll just find something to poke it with. Uh, this will do. Here we go. Okay, it moved this time, almost like the body was turning towards me. His shirt is ripped off of him. His skin is lumpy, greeny-brown. It looks like a split in his skin. Opened up slightly. I need to... I need to know what that is. I'm going to take a closer look. Okay, the split closed up again, but... I'm going to poke the fungal tentacle again and see what happens. Amazing, the skin split open again. This time I could see in maybe half a dozen areas. And the pointy ends of the spore poked about half an inch. It's almost like a trap door or spider trip line reacting when something is touching it. I'm, I'm going to roll a chair onto the tentacle and see what happens if there's sustained pressure. Incredible. That was about two seconds. A dozen or so spores ejected from the body in the direction of the chair, tearing it to shreds and embedding themselves into the wall behind it. My initial assumption had been that once the bodies had fired out the spores once, that would be it, but it appears that is not the case. The body is somehow regenerating them, remaining weaponized and linked trigger trip lines. This is beyond my greatest expectations. Amazing as it is, on the other hand, it has just made the task of getting out of here much more difficult. Sh shit, how long has this been off for? Hopefully not long. The voice recorder appears to have cut out there for a bit. I'm hoping I've got most of that recorded. I'm at the doors now, and there's no way through. The bodies are well and truly webbed to the door. Any attempt to remove them uh, would likely result in a barrage of spores firing out. I've also noticed some holes in the doors as well, about the size of a small coin. I couldn't see those on the screen earlier. Did did one of the guards fire a gun in here? I don't recall. It was so long ago now. All is not lost, though. There's a, a vent on the floor, big enough to crawl through. I'm pretty sure this vent leads to the hallway on the other side of this door. I just need to remove this cover to give me a just give me a moment to do this. Okay, all right. Got that off. Now let's see. Okay, I can definitely fit through this. It'll be tight, but I can see a turn in the vent, which does look like it leads to the hallway. All right, here I go. What was that? I just... I just... What was that? Was that a rat? What the hell is that? Holy shit! It's a fucking hand. It's coming after me. It's it's covered in mushrooms. Oh, wow. I just fired a bunch of mini spores. They all missed me and went to the vent above my head. God, I just... I just kicked it back down the vent. I'm getting out of here. Okay, I'm putting that vent back on. That bloody... That bloody thing is not going to follow me in here. That was a fully detached hand covered in small mushrooms, crawling like that hand from the Adams family. It wasn't fast, mind you, but still. And the fact that it could fire spores as well, this is a... This is a completely unexpected development. I wonder if Mike's head could do the same thing. Well, there are no bodies in here. I'm in the hallway between the main lab and the lobby. It's just a short hallway, maybe 10 meters long. There's a security desk, but it's unmanned. There's there's a gun lying on the floor. The security guard's gone. He must have dropped it when they were evacuating. I think I'll take this with me, just in case. So just through these doors, hopefully the lift hasn't been deactivated. There will be a... Shit. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Is this why they haven't sent a rescue team? How did this happen? The doors were sealed. None of the infected made it through. The holes, the holes in the doors, they weren't from bullets. They were from spores. 
Some spores must have fired straight through the doors and into the security guards that would have been on the other side. It looks... It looks like a war zone. There are bodies everywhere. I, I can see holes in the walls and the lift doors, shattered glass. There has to be a hundred, maybe more, bodies covered in that same fungal slime and growths as the others. Blood is splattered on every wall, all parts of the floor. Even the high ceiling has blood splatters on it. The red emergency lights are flashing in here too. No, no one was here to turn them off. My path to the lift is blocked with bodies piling up near the lift doors. Bloody growths creating a, a maze to try to get past. I, I'm going to have to go for the emergency exit door. The path around the, the side of the lobby is a little clearer, though still a few hazards. It, it won't be a walk in the park, but it, it's doable. Uh, hello? I, is someone there? Uh, y yes? Hello? Who, who am I speaking to? Oh, thank God. Uh, are you part of the rescue team? Uh, no, not not quite. I'm actually, um, trying to get out of here. Where are you? Uh, I'm here, uh, in the back office. It's the safest area. Uh, where did you come from? The yellow lab. Have you been in here the whole time? The, the yellow lab? Isn't, isn't that where all this came from? Uh, how did you get out? I thought everyone in there was was dead. Yes, I, I I was in a secure room. Are you one of the managers? No, uh, no, sorry. Um, I, I'm Doctor Paul Gallen. I work in the in the red lab. I was in the bathroom by the break room when when the emergency evacuation was sounded. When I came out, people were queuing for the lift. Some were heading for the emergency exit. When a security guard came running through the doors from the yellow lab, screaming and, and scratching at himself, he... he exploded. What were you working on in there? Others, they, they started screaming and, and clawing at themselves, and I just ran back into the break room and locked myself in there. It, it was like they were infected. I could hear them screaming and bashing against the doors and, and each other. It was horrible. Do you know if, if any infected people made it out on the lift? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure. When I eventually opened the door and came out, there were bodies everywhere. I just locked myself back in the break room. There's food and water in there, so I, I figured I could just wait for the rescue team there. I, I don't think they're coming to rescue us. Not with all this. I think they may be keeping us locked down in here while they decide what to do. Or it is spread up there too. Yes, I guess I can't rule that out now. So what's your plan? The lift is out and the emergency door will be in lockdown. It should have reset when the power went out. I'm pretty sure we... That's not the only issue. I've been hearing sounds, shuffling and scratching over the last few days. I thought maybe mice or rats, but it sounds bigger. Which is why we should move now. Is there another hazmat suit anywhere here you could put on? I would love to be able to use the camera and record this. No, not that I've seen. Why? Do you think it's airborne? What is it? No, it's not airborne. I'll explain on the way. Follow me and avoid stepping on the blood splattered fungus. It seems to be a trigger line. Okay. I just want to get out of here. A trigger line? Yes, me too. Watch your step here. See this trail leading to the bodies over there? If you put sustained pressure on it, it activates the spores from the body. You step on this and you'll end up like them. Spores? Yes, the things that exploded from the guard you saw. Spores that carry the infection are how it spreads from one person to the next. Jesus. What was that sound? It sounds like someone else might be alive back there. I don't think so. Shit. Is that... Is that a head? Crawling at us? Move it! Quick, it's coming. Help me with this door, it's heavy. It's an arm, too. Quick, close it, close it, don't let them out. My god, they're fast. Oh, that was close. 
Let's get out of here. I think it's just under two miles to the external door. <sighs> that was a fucking head and arm. How are you so calm? What were you working on in there? I'll explain on the walk. I'm just... I'm just going to stop recording here. I, I think I'm getting low on recording space. It appears the recording was stopped here. We are unsure what was discussed during this point. Okay, it's back on, I think. We are here at the external door, and it looks okay. The entire exit tunnel was clear. There's no signs of anyone infected or not having made it down here. Oh, God. Fresh air. I was starting to think I'd never breathe you again. It's dark. This torch isn't going to give us a lot of light back to the lab. No, we can't go back there. We need to report this to the authorities immediately. Hold on, hold on, no. We just need to return to the lab back up the hill and- No way. They left us in there for two weeks. and They're probably all dead. And from what you were just telling me, what you were doing was unethical, illegal, and the authorities need to be made aware of what has happened. Are you new here? You know this is what we do. Risks are part of the research and- And nothing. You have obviously gone too far with this, or you didn't follow safety protocols. Either way, everyone is now dead because of you. An unfortunate event, yes, but... No buts. What you have done goes beyond what we do here, even for us. Hold on. Everything we do here is cleared by the Defense Department. You know that. Manslaughter is not. Honestly, I hope they lock you up and shut down this whole operation. Wait, Wait, hold on now. Just, just, just put that down. I can't let you do that. Uh, hold on, put the gun away. H- haven't you done enough damage? Uh... I'm sorry, that's... That's... I, I can't let you do that. My, my research is far too important. What I have done here will change the world. What I have done here... What I know how to do... I now have the power to bring down entire cities. Countries. Yes. That's what I need to do. I need to scale this up. Test it on a larger population. The results here were great, but... What happens in an uncontrolled environment? I think I'll head down to the city. It's time for phase two. The recording ends here. We are unsure of the origin of the recordings, but it appears to be authentic. Please, if you see anything similar to what was described here, contact the authorities and the CDC immediately. I never believed in love at first sight before all of this happened. At 16 years old, I had never even had a girlfriend. And although I'd been infatuated with girls at school, I'd never been in love. That all changed when I laid eyes on Clementine Sweeney. It helped that she saved my life that day and was also my first kiss, all in the span of a few minutes. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I should probably start at the beginning. My name's Jordan. I've been a minimum wage employee at Wicked and Wild Water Park since I was 16 years old. I'm 18 now. Practically a senior citizen around here. I've spent two summers working at the water park, and this will be my third. Some people ask when I figured out this place was rotten. I tell them I knew from the day I met Clementine that there was something wrong with this water park. That was when I realized it was named Wicked and Wild for a reason. We're opening up for the summer again, and I'm both excited for it and dreading it at the same time. Working at a water park is a lot less enjoyable than visiting one, after all. You stand out in the hot sun and just get to watch while other people have fun. They're laughing and tossing around beach balls in the icy blue waters of the wave pool, and you're just roasting in the heat wishing you could jump in. You probably know the type of place I'm talking about. You likely have one where you live or or something similar to it. Can you picture it? On the sign out front, The K in Wicked is flipped around backwards to give it a fun and friendly sort of vibe. The letters are tilted playfully, painted in bright rainbow colors. There's cut-out cartoons of dolphins and orcas flanking the brick pathways leading towards the entrance, 
where you can buy an overpriced entry ticket. It's the sort of place you go to on a hot summer day, when you're desperate for ice-cold water, waves, and a few thrills. The smell of chlorine and tanning lotion permeates the air, and everyone walks around with towels around their waists or slung over their shoulders, lobster red with fresh sunburns, little orange key fobs dangling from their shorts for lockers they paid exorbitant rates for. There are slides, a wave pool, and a lazy river, a midway with rides, games, and concession stands. Everything you would expect from a cut-rate, water-themed fun park. But it's far from perfect. Several of the older slides have bumps and divots in them, a result of neglected maintenance over the years. And these will scrape holes out of your back while you ride down them. This is especially common when the water pressure is poor, which it often is. Our wave pool has a history of dirty needles and broken glass bottles being found floating in the murky water, among other things. Soiled diapers, used band-aids, and tampons, to name a few. Still, I have yet to mention our wealthy owner's obsession with building bigger and bigger slides and more and more dangerous attractions, all of which he forces us to test for him. There have been other issues as well problems that have been growing increasingly concerning to me. Sinister things. Things that I only learned about after becoming a manager. I'll get to that, I promise. I'm only 18, but since getting promoted, I'm the closest thing to an adult working here most days. And that's beginning to feel more and more obvious. Of course, there's also our owner. An obese, predatory-looking, red-haired gentleman who insists on being called... Uncle Bob, but he hides out in his office most of the time. When he does venture into the park, he draws all sorts of stares. The man has a pale, freckled face and bright red frizzy hair which grows sparingly in tufts on the side of his balding head. Uncle Bob wears a similar outfit every day, despite the high temperatures. Always he's in baggy pants and suspenders bright pastel shirts with long sleeves and polka dot bow ties. Sometimes he'll add a clashing plaid sports jacket that looked like it escaped from the 1960s. Most people think he resembles a big, sweaty clown, although probably unintentionally. Uncle Bob is the only adult around here most of the time. This is the sort of place where parents drop off their kids and run since it doesn't cater to them and borders on outright hostility towards grown-ups. When unsuspecting adults do venture in, they leave quickly and never come back after the first visit. The general consensus is, this is our territory, a place for kids and teens. Uncle Bob knows this and capitalizes on it. He makes parking so expensive that most people would have to be independently wealthy to afford it. There's no alcohol served in the park. Another deterrent to keep adults away. None of us totally understand why Uncle Bob wants to keep the grown-ups out, but most of us have theorized it's because of the frequent incidents, as we like to call them around here. We have a lot of mishaps. Somehow Uncle Bob always manages to sort it out, though. The wave pool, as I've mentioned, is particularly hazardous. Not only for those who can't swim, for everyone. On the day I'm going to tell you about, the day when my world turned upside down, I I had to jump into the water to save a kid who went under. This was during my first season on a hot, busy day towards the end of August. When you've been lifeguarding for a while, you learn to spot the people who can't really swim. The ones who got peer pressured into going out into the deep end or just don't know any better. Maybe they think they'll float. People who can't swim do this distinctive little sideways hop with each incoming wave. Their eyes wide with fear. They go deeper and deeper. Each time relying on the precious floor beneath their feet to save them. And yet, still they go in further. By the time their terrified faces go under, it's too late. But we've usually spotted them long before that. On that particular day, I remember it was hot and sunny as hell. The humidity was making it even worse and I was itching to get into the water. That's when I saw this one youngster hopping sideways into the waves, not treading water, just bouncing on stilted legs into the deep. 
It was a kid who looked about 12, and he was difficult to keep track of amidst the crushing crowd. The pool was packed shoulder to shoulder that day. I looked across at the lifeguard on the other side of the pool that day, and he looked back at me. We both saw the same thing. I made a V with my index and middle fingers and pointed them towards my eyes, then towards the kid, towards my eyes, towards the kid again. Keep your eyes on him, that's what that meant. The other lifeguard stared at me blankly and shrugged. The young kid in the water had long, shaggy blonde hair, and he was doing the little sidestep jump into the pool, going deeper and deeper with each bounding step forward. He was tittering, looking back and forth between his friends' faces, but it was a nervous laugh, because he couldn't swim. I could tell that already. His friends went in deeper, treading water when the next big wave came, and he followed. He jumped off his tiptoes as the huge wave rolled in, going up with it. But then it rolled past, and he came back down, his head going under the surface of the water. His friends resurfaced when the wave was passed, but he didn't come back up. His pals didn't even notice. They rarely do. I stood up in anticipation of the inevitable and waited for a few moments, hoping he would reappear. When he didn't, I blew my whistle. A siren began to sound and I dove from my high perch into the icy waters and began to swim towards the middle of the pool. The kind people made a path for me and allowed me through, while others stared at me with cold eyes as I paddled past them, upset at me for spoiling their fun. The wave machine had been shut off temporarily for the rescue attempt. When I got close to where he'd been seen last, I went under. Opening my eyes under the water, I felt the sting of too much chlorine burning them. It was easy enough to see his vague shape down there at the bottom of the pool, thrashing and struggling. I swam quickly down towards him, going as fast as I could and fighting against my own buoyancy. When I finally reached him, I saw something I didn't understand. The rough, white floor of the wave pool looked like it was holding him there. Finally, I got close enough to see what looked like quicksand sucking him down at the bottom of the pool. The kid's eyes were wide and terrified, and and I couldn't help but feel afraid as well, looking at that unnatural sight. It looked as if the bottom of the pool was drawing him down into it. I heard a loud slurping noise and saw his foot went in deeper, and he was now up to his ankle in it tendrils like fingers were wrapping around his lower leg and pulling him down into the permeable surface at the bottom of the pool. I grabbed hold of him under his arms and tried to swim up towards the surface. He was thrashing and trying to grab hold of me the whole time, desperate not to die, so it took a while to get into the proper position. Kicking with all of my strength, I struggled to free him from the bottom of the pool. It was useless. My breath running out, I looked down at his face, purple with lack of oxygen. His desperation had faded into a groggy look that made me think he had passed out. His arms were limp and his fingers appeared blue in the water. Thinking I had no chance of rescuing him, I did what I always did instinctively when underwater, running out of air and anxious to get to the surface. I kicked off from the bottom of the pool. Stupid. The tenacious surface grabbed onto me like the suckers of an octopus tentacle, latching onto his prey. My foot was completely trapped in it, and my panicking mind could not handle this new turn of events. I struggled against it and pulled with all my might, but it would not relent. With the world beginning to turn different shades of yellow and then red, I felt absolute dread rising up in me. Nervous energy that made me feel like I was dying as I watched the kid and I had tried to save do just that his eyes rolling upwards, his face bluish-purple like a bruise. That horrible, slurping sound came again, and then I felt my foot go in even further, sinking into the floor of the wave pool. This can't be how I die, I thought to myself. Please, not like this. Pulling harder, straining with every muscle in my body, I tried to yank my foot out of the nightmare goo that was living on the floor of the wave pool. I felt someone grabbing onto me, heard their muffled screams under the water, and then the world faded into blackness. My dreams usually fade, and I don't remember them typically. But I remember what they were like that day, when I passed out at the bottom of the wave pool. I dreamt I was back in Uncle Bob's office, getting interviewed for my job all over again. 
feeling the same nervousness and anticipation that I had felt, the same uneasiness. It was my first time meeting him, and he was both scary and funny-looking at the same time. His red hair poking out at the sides, growing out of his ears. His pale, freckled face smiling at me in a friendly way, asking me questions about my job history and then frowning at my answers. But then finally he settled back on smiling again and started to talk about when I would start and how long my training would last. I realized I was getting the position. You seem like you'll fit right in here, Jordan, he said, standing up and reaching across his desk for me to shake on it. I stood up and reached out to grab his hand, and only then did I notice I was dripping wet, covered in water which was soaking the rug beneath me where I'd been sitting. The water dripped from my arm down onto his desk, all over some important-looking papers which were stacked there. Embarrassment rushed through me, and I felt my face burning hot. But I looked up and saw Uncle Bob was still smiling, as if all of this was no concern to him at all. Welcome to the team, he said, grinning broadly. Purple tentacles covered in suckers could be seen sprouting from his sides, ripping through his pastel pink shirt and tearing the fabric. That was when I looked down and saw my dream hand signing something. A long and ominous looking contract written in spidery cursive. The pages were stacked high and my name was printed at the bottom where my half-finished signature was now accompanying it. Terrified, I backed away from it, or at least tried to, but it, it felt like I was underwater. Stuck in slow motion. I couldn't breathe, I realized, panicking. Finish signing it. Uncle Bob said, his eyes black as midnight now, purple tentacles whipping around him like a lightning storm. I opened my mouth to speak, and water poured into it down my throat and filled my lungs. Gasping for air, terrified, I grabbed the pen, my hands moving too slowly, and finished signing my name. I woke up after that, and she had her lips on mine, blowing life-saving air into me. I sat bolt upright, coughing water out of my lungs, my head instantly aching like someone had hit it with a sledgehammer. There she was, looking at me. Concern in her eyes when I finally came to my senses. Her pale, freckled face was rounded, reddened with too much sun, just like all of us who worked here. I had never seen her before. Her fine orange hair whipped around in the wind, making her look even more beautiful. Are you okay? she asked, looking a little annoyed. I realized it wasn't the first time she had put forth the question. I had just been too stunned to hear her. My first feeling was embarrassment for some reason, as if it was my fault I had almost drowned and she had had to save me. I lowered my gaze, but then realized quickly how foolish that was. I had been trying to save the kid. I suddenly remembered why I had dove into the water in the first place. He's still down there. We, we have to save him. Her eyes went wide and she put her index finger to her bright red lips quickly to tell me to be quiet as the crowd gasped in horror around us. I'm right here, said the kid from nearby. He was almost the same as the kid I had seen drown at the bottom of the pool, but he looked a little different somehow. His eyes were a little meaner, a little less human. Thanks for saving me. But I didn't. Before I could finish, the whole crowd was cheering like mad. Everyone was clapping for Clementine, and now they were cheering for me as well, since the kid claimed I had rescued him from drowning, even though I had failed miserably at it. Don't say anything, she whispered in my ear. I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck when she did that and would have happily agreed to do whatever she said. I nodded. Later on, when the commotion had died down, she slipped me her phone number. At the top, she'd written her name and a message in big block capital letters. Trust no one but me. Clementine Sweeney. No girl had ever given me their phone number before. I felt my flesh break out in goosebumps as she handed me the slip of paper, her hands brushing lightly against my wrist as she did. She smiled at me, and I saw her blush, and I realized suddenly that Maybe she liked me too. But how was that possible? She was beautiful and I was... me. I called her that night. The first time she didn't pick up and my heart began to pound nervously, my lips and mouth dry suddenly. 
I sat there waiting, debating whether I should call again, but then my cell phone began to ring, causing me to jump. Picking it up in my hands, I stared down at the screen. Clementine Sweeney calling. Sliding up with my thumb on the phone screen, I put it up to my ear. Hello? Hey, she said. It's me, Clementine. Oh, hi. I said, trying to sound casual, feeling awkward and judging every word that came out of my mouth too harshly. How's it going? I'm okay, she said. How are you doing? I don't know, I said honestly. Did you see the same thing I did at the bottom of that pool? That kid was dead, right? Please, tell me I'm not crazy. Honey, are you okay up there? I heard my mom shouting from downstairs, and I realized I was speaking too loudly. Fine, just, uh, playing video games. I yelled back, hoping that would somehow explain what she had just overheard. It seemed to, since she left it at that. You need to keep it down about this stuff, said Clementine. You don't understand what you've gotten yourself into. I let her words sink in for a minute before responding, contemplating. I finally spoke. How am I alive? That thing had me. It wasn't letting me go. Her breathing was the only thing I could hear on the other end of the phone line until she finally told me the truth. My blood went ice cold when she did. It didn't just let you go. Uncle Bob never lets anybody just go. You signed the contract, didn't you? How do you... Because I did it too. It's hard to say no when you're drowning. That's... That's how he gets you. At that point, you'll sign anything he puts in front of you. That was... Real. She said. All of it. I couldn't say anything. My hands trembling, my knees buckled, and I almost fell to the floor. I think you better sit down for this. The morning after the wave pool incident, I went back to work at the water park. My nerves were shot after discovering the truth about what had happened, but I knew I had no choice except to report in for my shift. The consequences of failing to do so had not been revealed to me yet, and I didn't want to find out what they were. My supervisor, Brett, flagged me down before I could find Clementine. She had been in trouble with her parents and wasn't supposed to use the phone. She told me hurriedly the night before in whispered tones that she'd have to explain the rest at work the following day. All I knew was that both of us had signed a deal with someone or something that we didn't understand. I was dying to know the terms of the agreement and Clementine said she had some of those answers, but certainly not all of them. Hey, Jordan. How's it going, man? Brett's wide, toothy grin was hard not to return. Just instinct, really. I found myself smiling the minute I walked into the park, even against my wishes. Gonna need you to head over to the boss's construction project over yonder, he said, gesturing to the towering colossus that was supposed to be a water slide at some point in the future, although the idea of that terrified and astounded me. I said no problem, and began walking in that direction. The behemoth structure of rickety steel columns and wooden planks supported a series of haphazard turning tunnels ascending upwards to the heavens. There was a roofed structure at the peak, where I could make out the vague shape of someone standing. I was immediately concerned for their safety, as it looked like the thing could collapse at any second. It seemed to sway and bend in the wind. Uncle Bob had nicknamed the project the beast, and it had been in various stages of construction for years, long before my arrival at the park. The slide was a behemoth. It was towering and steep with sharp curves, big drops, and a chute at the end that shot you into the air for much further than should have been legally allowable. In fact, I'm pretty sure any inspector would have shut the place down if he knew Bob was testing the thing. But of course, he was. Uncle Bob was standing at the very top I saw as I approached. He was holding a garden hose, pouring water down the slide. As I got closer, 
I saw he had a kid up there with him. Not only that, but a bunch of watermelons for some reason. I quickly figured out what that reason was. He sent a few test watermelons down, and we heard their echoing rinds crashing against the plastic tunnel slide as they neared the bottom. There, they shot out, zipping over the water of the swimming pool below at extremely high speeds, cracking on the hard pavement far past the landing zone. It didn't surprise me when they exploded on the ground in a spray of pink fruity guts and black seeds, since the landing zone was a narrow, inflatable pool that looked to have been hastily filled with a foot or two of water. It was not even close to deep enough or big enough to provide any sort of cushion for such an aggressive landing operation. Looking up at the opening where the kid was supposed to shoot out from the bottom of the slide, I was filled with a horrible sort of dread. I wanted to scream out to tell the boy to stop, to save himself while he still could. I realized who it was immediately. The kid I had tried to save in the wave pool the day before. His name was Jimmy, I found that out the day prior, and he had apparently taken a job at the water park. What a complete surprise, Uncle Bob had trapped another one. The big clown-haired boss man sent Jimmy down to the labyrinthian-looking maze of a tunnel slide, and I waited for him to come flying out the bottom. Several of us milled about and muttered about how we hoped he wouldn't wind up cracking his head on the pavement, spilling his brains out of his skull like the pink fruit inside the watermelon. None of us mentioned it, but we knew we'd be the ones cleaning it up. Strange thing was, he never came out of the tunnel slide at all. We waited around looking at that dark opening, and eventually Uncle Bob came downstairs and gawked at it with us. When it became obvious that, regardless of how much longer we stood there, Jimmy was not forthcoming from the tunnel slide, Uncle Bob randomly picked one of us to go in and look for him. Smiling at me cryptically, he pointed at me and told me to start moving. He had some sort of home-brewed spray in his pocket that he, without asking, applied to my knees to give them more friction so I could get up the slide without too much trouble. Uncle Bob gave me a flashlight and a big kid lifted me up on his broad shoulders and sent me climbing upwards from the bottom. The dark interior of it quickly dried out on the hot day and the sticky plastic was easy to climb in my shorts the spray-covered flesh of my knees rubbing abrasively and painfully with each move forward. Pretty soon they felt raw and achy, and I, I guess they would be bruised black and blue in the morning. I knew I would only get so far. There was a steep incline up ahead where riders traveling from the top would gain speed before the bottom, and it would be impossible for me to climb up that section. I, I tried to tell Uncle Bob this fact, but he had insisted that I try anyway. It was hot in the tunnel, without any water to cool it down. In the darkness, the echoing sounds of someone breathing heavily from far up ahead caught my ear. Jimmy? Is that you? But then I realized it didn't sound like a kid breathing. It sounded like someone much bigger. Most of the tunnel up until that point had been dark, but now it was getting to be completely pitch black. As I moved further into a section that had been covered with a wooden structure from the outside... It was meant to scare riders even further, I guessed, since they would have just come from that last big drop at the point in the attraction to next be plunged into darkness, but the wooden structure looked much bigger than it needed to be. My dim, crappy flashlight was now flickering and going out. The beam from it had been practically useless anyways. Clearly the batteries had been nearly dead. I decided to keep going, since I was almost there by the sounds of it. Moving into the blackened space, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I could hear breathing much closer now in the pitch-black section of the tunnel slide. Jimmy? I called out. In the darkness, I felt like the walls were closing in on me, suffocating me as I crawled forward. I was suddenly very hot, sticky and humid in the darkness, making it difficult to breathe. I realized that in the tight space I couldn't turn around. It had gotten very narrow in the tunnel, which explained why Jimmy had gotten stuck. But why would Uncle Bob design a slide that trapped people? Oh. Screw this, I muttered to myself. It's a setup. I tried to scramble backwards, but it was already too late. Where are you going? Asked not Jimmy's voice from up ahead. Don't you want to play with us? Flickering, the flashlight beam came on for just a moment. 
just long enough for me to see Jimmy's rotting, waterlogged face just in front of mine. He was being eaten alive by white maggot-like worms and fat black leeches that had taken large pieces from his cheeks and nose. His eye sockets were black holes, dark and empty, and he was grinning like a madman, teeth missing in places from his mouth. He was surrounded by a structure that was not the tunnel slide. I was disoriented when I saw wet, ridged walls extending past him that looked like the insides of some great creature's guts. Veins could be seen running through the translucent mucous membrane, and I realized what I had heard breathing. It wasn't this undead boy just in front of me. He didn't need to breathe. It was the beast. The light went out again, and I was plunged into darkness. I tried to back away, but felt sharp, talon-like fingernails digging into the flesh of my forearms when I did. Not Jimmy raked my arms with his claws and pulled off strips of skin as I desperately tried to pull away. He was quick and his nails were sharp and long. My gushing, bloody wounds began to pour and that was probably the only thing that saved me. Screaming, I began to slide downwards. My blood was everywhere, creating a sufficient lubricant that allowed me to escape. It spouted from the cuts in my arms, creating a slippery, sanguineous river that thankfully brought me sliding down the terrifying twists and steep drops straight out the opening at the bottom. I went shooting out at high speed into the inflatable swimming pool, which caught me just barely. The small amount of water cushioned my fall just enough to prevent my death, and it quickly went Kool-Aid pink with the vast quantities of blood I had lost. Kids dragged me out of the pool, and I remember hearing the sound of someone barfing when they saw what had happened to me. "'Where's Jimmy?' one asked. "'I think the beast got him,' I told him between groans and profanity-laden outbursts of anger and agony. Uncle Bob was already gone, of course. Back to his office, wherever that really was. The son of a bitch had failed at trying to kill me the day prior, and so now he was quickly trying to off me again. It wasn't enough that I had signed his contract, I realized. He wanted to kidnap and clone me like he had with Jimmy, keeping an undead copy for himself and sending one home to my parents, essentially ending up with two life-bonded indentured servants one of them undead, to fulfill who knew what horrible secret tasks for him. I guessed that he needed the soul of the real person to create a copy, but that was only a vague assumption based on what I knew so far. What the hell was I going to do? Someone had brought the first aid kit, and I looked up from my bleeding hands and forearms to see it was Clementine. Hey, I said, trying to act cool. It was difficult because of all the blood loss. Shut up and lie down. What the hell were you thinking going up there? Her words stung me more than I thought possible, and I felt my heart ache for a moment. But then her face softened, and she looked more worried than upset again. I realized her eyes were green. How, how would I not notice that? A soft, emerald green like nothing I'd ever seen before. I'd always told people when they asked that green was my favorite color. She started to clean my arms with some liquid, saying cold as she sprayed it from the bottle. Then she began wrapping them with gauze, not minding that my blood was dripping on her bare hands as she worked. I guess they probably didn't have money for gloves in the first aid budget. Then I realized there probably was no first aid budget. I wondered if she had bought these items for herself. You're good at this, I said, admiring her handiwork. Thanks. I, I used to want to be a nurse before all this. Her face looked truly sad for the first time since I had met her. Everyone else had left, leaving us alone at the bottom of the huge water slide. You can still do that. Can you? She slowly shook her head, applying medical tape to the bandages to keep them secure. I... We're both in the same spot, you and me. It's not just us, either. A whole bunch of kids around here have been replaced by... Uncle Bob's little doppelgangers. It's hard to know sometimes which ones. They're completely loyal to him. Same as the undead versions of them. And who knows how many copies he can make if he wants to. He could be building an army of teenage zombies for all we know. So how did we get so lucky? To have free will if the rest are so subservient to him, why were we saved? 
Because I saved your life, dummy. She smiled as she said this. I pulled you up from the bottom of the pool and gave you CPR, otherwise you'd be a mindless zombie too. Oh yeah. Did I say thank you for that yet? Thank you for saving my life. And then, I guess kind of doing it again right now. Who knows what kind of nasty infections I would have gotten if you weren't here to clean up those wounds. I think you might be my guardian angel. I would wince at that cheesy line later that night in bed. There's more like us too, you know. Other kids managed to survive Uncle Bob's attacks but ended up signing the contract, same as us. Like I said, when you're drowning or dying, that's how he gets you. He invades your mind somehow, and at your weakest moment, he lies and offers you the one thing he can't even really give you. In fact, by signing, you're... She broke off there, seeming hesitant to continue. What? Nothing. Never mind for now. I'll tell you later. I don't want to overdo it too much on your first day of the contract. Your head's probably spinning as it is. It was, but uh, again, that might have been due to blood loss. I'm, I'm good. I lied. Okay, tough guy. Let's go to the break room for a minute. I want you to meet my friends. I stood up on shaky legs, and she put an arm over my shoulder to support me, and I smiled, feeling the warmth of her against me. Happy to be back with her again. She was taking me to meet her friends. That was a good sign, right? I couldn't help but feel hopeful, despite how terrible I'd felt a few moments prior. Clementine seemed to make everything right, even though there was so much going wrong. We walked over to the structure nearby that had been set aside for our breaks. A ramshackle hut, which had been constructed by teens at some point in the past. A thing born of necessity, as we all needed a reprieve from the sun. However, the lack of air conditioning, windows, and any real airflow turned it into a sauna. Still, it was shady, and more important, private. The kids called it the box, due to its small size and lack of windows. I also found out later that this was some sort of sexual innuendo, since it was where many kids lost their virginities as well. Yeah, I know, guys are pigs and all that. But come on, I, I didn't come up with it, okay? Don't shoot the messenger. When we got into the box, it was hot as usual, but not as bad as on some days, since it was still morning. Two kids about our age were in there waiting, looking anxious, whispering in hushed tones about something as we entered, then immediately stopped talking. But then they saw Clementine's face and jumped up, smiling. Hey, Clem, you made it! The two girls embraced. There was another guy a year or two older than me who Clementine walked over to next. She hugged him tightly, and I immediately felt a pang of jealousy. It was like an arrow through the heart. Suddenly I realized I had never even asked her if she had a boyfriend. Had I misread the whole situation? Ah, damn it, I was going to be alone forever. All the good ones were taken, I thought to myself, thinking five steps into the future. I was already picturing Clementine kissing him, turning to me and saying, Oh, by the way, Jordan, this is my boyfriend, Ben. Isn't he the best? Jordan, hey, Earth to Jordan. I realized I was standing there, stupidly zoned out in my own head. They were all looking at me, and I was staring off into space. Oh, uh, sorry. It's been a rough couple days. And I'm pretty sure I just lost way too much blood. And any hope of happiness. It's okay, said the guy. I was just saying, my name's Ben, and this is Marissa. Everyone around here calls me Mayor said the girl, sticking out her hand. I shook Marissa's hand and then Ben, squeezing his too hard for a moment before realizing I was even doing it. He didn't seem to notice. So, has uh, Clem told you about our little situation? Did she tell you about her batshit plan yet? Clementine's face went red as a strawberry as she stared daggers back at Marissa. It's not batshit. It would work if you guys gave it half a chance. I was struggling to catch up, and the world felt like it was spinning and going red around the edges. I barely know anything, just that we all signed a contract under duress, and now we're stuck here with some hellish creature we don't understand. Oh boy, I think I need to sit down, I said, grabbing onto the table. They helped me into one of the crappy folding chairs, and I plunked myself down a little too hard into it, and was surprised when it didn't break. Maybe this isn't the best time to lay another Uncle Bob bomb on him, said Ben, looking worried. Oh, no, I can take it, I said, trying to sound tough, feeling a bit better after sitting. 
Look, just tell me what I've gotten myself into, okay, please? Uh, maybe I can figure some way out. Clementine sighed, and they all sat down around the table with me. Thing is, we don't know all the details either. But we all had the same experience. Drowning, being forced to sign the contract. And it wasn't just us, there was more of us. Others. Until recently. Ben said this and looked at Clementine as if asking for permission for something. She nodded, tears in her eyes. Uh, Clem's boyfriend, Tom. He signed the contract, too. Managed to survive a couple weeks before Uncle Bob finally caught up with him. Now he's got a doppelganger running around, and Club said she ran into the undead version of him one day recently. Didn't go too well. Clementine was crying next to me, and I put my arm around her, wanting to comfort her. She put her head against my chest and began to wet my t-shirt with her tears. She was sobbing and shaking as she grabbed onto my t-shirt and wept. He was falling to pieces. And he said, he said I'm next. It wasn't him anymore, I know that, but I just, I never wanted to see him like that. She looked up at me with reddened eyes, leaking tears. After a few moments of silence, an idea occurred to me. We can stop him. I, I know how. The four of us can do it. We just have to take him out. No more Uncle Bob, no more contract, right? Ben looked at me, shaking his head, stunned. <laughs> Man, you sound just like her. Clementine was staring off into space, tears still streaming from her eyes, but there was a hint of a smile flickering at the corners of her mouth now. At least until I said what I said next. By the way, guys, I think you should know the beast. That slide Uncle Bob has been working on. There's something really messed up inside of it. I think if he opens that attraction, a lot of people are going to die and get turned into more soldiers in his zombie army. Clementine jumped up and looked around the room at us with wide eyes. He told a bunch of us this morning that he's opening it this weekend. That's the whole reason he was running tests today. The Beast is open for business starting this Saturday. That's what he said. We resolved right then and there we had to do something. The four of us were the only ones standing between Uncle Bob and his horrible, evil plans coming to fruition. Somehow, we had to topple the beast. Have you ever liked someone romantically who didn't like you back? It stings, right? By 16 years old, I was an expert at it. I've had plenty of crushes at school, none of whom knew I existed, and was too scared to talk to any of them. Clementine was different. In her, I sensed something which I had not felt before. The way she looked at me, the way she snagged every opportunity to touch my hand or my shoulder, my forearm or my hair. All these little signals told me she liked me too, despite my self-conscious mind's objections. What I sensed in her was a reticence similar to a war widow afraid to dishonor the memory of her MIA husband, only one who was doomed never to return from battle. It was like she still held out hope for her lost boyfriend, Tom. The one who Uncle Bob had taken like he had taken so many others. The poor guy was still out there, sure, but he was a mindless zombie now. Couldn't she see that? The selfish part of me wanted her to forget about him, but I knew that was terrible of me. She needed time. And besides, we had other more important things to worry about for now. Hey, did you hear me? I asked if you're ready. Clementine was waiting expectantly, standing next to me in the darkness. The tall, chain-link fence, topped with barbed wire, stood before us. And beyond that, the water park. Sorry, kind of get lost in my own head sometimes. Yeah, I'm starting to get that. That's okay, I still like you. Clementine's face lit up in a small, freckled smile. Just don't forget I'm here, too. Taking her hand, I looked over to Ben and Marissa. Everybody set? Ben and Marissa nodded nervously. Not really, said the looks on their faces. All right, let's do it. Ben took the thick blanket out from his backpack and managed successfully to throw it over the top of the barbed wire fence so that it lay over the peak, protecting us from the sharp spikes up there. Nice job. Okay, make sure we've got everything and let's go. We threw our supplies over the fence and began to climb. 
This past week had been non-stop planning and preparation, which had led us to this. We'd spent all of our savings on the equipment to do what we were about to do. Uncle Bob's water slide, the beast, had to be brought down. We had come here under cover of darkness to do just that. I had discovered earlier in the week that the slide was no ordinary attraction. There was something hidden within it. A massive creature which I had only glimpsed a part of. I had seen the insides of its digestive system while climbing up from the bottom of the slide to rescue a kid who was supposedly trapped in there. But of course it had turned out to be a trap set up for me the whole time. That's the last time I ever listened to Uncle Bob, I told myself. But then I remembered the contract I had signed, the one I thought was a dream, a nightmare, but in fact was reality. I had signed my life away. That was what I had begun to realize. Maybe more than just that, perhaps my soul as well. My afterlife could end up being just as cursed as my regular life. The thought of working at this godforsaken water park for the rest of eternity was more than I could handle, and I was beginning to realize that Clementine was right. We needed to kill Uncle Bob. That was the only way. But we had to do this first. If not, who knew how many would die? The four of us climbed over the fence and only sustained minor injuries negotiating the barbed wire at the top, since a thick duvet now separated us from it. We all wore gloves, black clothing, and ski masks as well, which we pulled down over our faces as we entered the park. I wound up with a couple painful cuts on my thighs where the barbed wire had found its way through the blanket. Warm blood trickled down my legs as I wondered how deep the wounds were, and how rusty that barbed wire was, mentally counting the years since my last tetanus shot. Our destination was easy to spot. It towered over everything, just a black silhouette against the starry night sky. The beast. We assumed Uncle Bob had a few security guards roaming the ground, so we stuck to the dark places and walked in the shadows, weary and watchful of any flashlight beams or hiding sentries. The area we had entered near the perimeter was full of vendors and concession stands, so we tucked ourselves tightly up against the walls of these buildings and avoided the light hoping no security guards would see us. Strangely, there was no one. The place was eerily silent. As we crept along, we became bolder, seeing nobody patrolling the park. We started to whisper to each other occasionally and began to betray our initial instincts to move stealthily. Finally, we arrived at the tall and imposing water slide. It towered above us, twisted and chaotic-looking. Looking up at it, I felt nervous and jittery, my hands trembling and my stomach tied in knots, thinking about what we were about to do. Are we sure about this, guys? Asked Ben, mirroring my concerns. Clementine looked resolved, though, and I followed her lead when she nodded. As sure as we're ever going to be. We gotta stop him. This is the first step. Ben nodded, and he pulled the tank of fuel from his backpack. Well, he's just mostly wood. If we can get it going, the rest of it should catch easily enough. I looked up to see where the ignition point for our fire would be, trying to determine which section of the water slide was most flammable looking. Of course, the one place that caught my eye was the spot where the beast was slumbering, hidden beneath a wooden structure that covered a section of the slide. This was where riders would be plunged into darkness on the attraction as they descended downward, only to be swallowed up by the thing which lay inside. Then their bodies and souls would belong to Uncle Bob. The slide was scheduled to open up the following day now. Up there. The wooden structure near the middle. Then another fire at the base of the stairs, and, and I think the whole thing should go up. We had discussed things beforehand, but now that we were here, the holes in our hasty planning were becoming more obvious. Our nerves and adrenaline had taken over, and everything felt slipshod and tentative, like we could be caught at any second. Marissa and I will take the stairs. You guys head up to the middle of the slide, okay? Be careful. Clementine was the voice of reason remembering the important details and reminding us to execute our part. Ben and I made our way up towards the base of the slide. When we got to the place where it opened up at the bottom, I boosted up Ben on my shoulder so we could get up the ledge holding it up. Then he reached down and helped me up as well. The beast was built up on a hill, so we were able to climb up the dirt slope from the embankment, although it was steep and difficult to traverse. As we climbed up towards the structure at the center of the slide, I looked back down to see Clementine pouring gasoline on the base of the staircase. We better hurry. There could still be security guards out patrolling this place. Clem and Marissa are pretty exposed down there, I said to Ben. The steep slope was tough to negotiate, but eventually we made it to the covered section. 
The wooden structure was shadowy and dark inside, but I heard the sound of something enormous breathing noisily from within. The beast was snoring, I realized. I put my finger to my lips, indicating for Ben to be silent. His shocked face told me he had already heard the sound of something enormous breathing, though, and he had no desire to wake that thing up. As quickly and quietly as we could, we began to pour the gasoline. Once the structure was soaked in it, I heard the sounds of disturbed sleep from within. Sniffing sounds and movement like it was waking up. Terrified, I started to move away from pulling Ben with me. Moving away from the structure, we dropped a burning Zippo and watched as it went up quickly in flames. The fire spread, and as we descended the hillside to escape, we heard the shrieking, high-pitched cries of something large and evil dying within the tunnel slide. It howled in pain and fury, and the entire structure shook and began to crack in places. As the monster inside bucked and thrashed, burning, attempting desperately to escape. But it was too late. The inferno was swelling up into the sky now, and the wooden structure was roaring with a massive gasoline-soaked fire. Looking down to the bottom of the staircase, I saw Clementine had accomplished her objective as well. The wooden stair structure was engulfed in flames. But I couldn't see Clem. At least not at first. Once we got to the bottom of the hill and jumped down onto solid ground again, I saw her. Actually, I heard her first. She was screaming. Her high-pitched cries for help were intermittently muffled as if someone were covering her mouth while she was violently resisting them. Ben and I ran from the bottom of the slide over towards the stairs where we had seen her last. They were about a hundred yards away, and once we got there, it was already too late. Marissa had escaped, but Clem wasn't so lucky. Looking up at the growing inferno, I saw Clementine being carried up the stairs by several of Uncle Bob's undead servants. They looked like teenagers about my age, but their eyes glowed red in the night. Their flesh was melting and singed black from the fire as they climbed the burning steps, but they paid no mind. Clem was burning as well, her ski mask and black clothing smoking on fire in places as they carried her up the stairs, away from me and towards the top. Up high at the top of the burning slide where the roof structure stood, I saw Uncle Bob. His face could be glimpsed grinning in the glow of the fire. Ben was holding me back as I screamed and cried out, begging him to let me go, trying desperately to run up the stairs and chase after them. The flames were hot as hell and I eventually relented the heat of the inferno on my face, bringing me back to my senses, forcing me to retreat from the base of the stairs. Clementine was up at the top now, appearing to have passed out unconscious from the smoke. I saw the zombie children were blank-faced and impassive as they showed her to Uncle Bob. He pointed at the entry point of the slide and they threw her down into the opening at the top. I imagined her sliding down the tunnel on the liquid heat of melted plastic and her own burning flesh. No. No, 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 no. My mind couldn't take any more of that. It shut it away, hoping somehow it wasn't true that this was all a trick. No! I screamed, but it was too late. It was already too late. My knees buckled and I fell down to the ground, unable to comprehend what had just happened. At that moment I was sure that Clementine was gone forever, but of course, around here, dead doesn't always mean gone. Even though often that would be a relief. The flames were licking up the wooden structure now, almost completely consuming it. But the owner of the water park did not seem to care. Uncle Bob seemed to bask in the fire, embracing its intense heat. His hands stretched out wide like a pastor during a prayer service at an evil evangelical church. A dark prophet, a fire demon, a bad omen for everything. As it consumed everything around him, he stood taller and looked as if he grew larger on the flames. Part of me wondered if it was the fire he was feeding on, or a pain and suffering. Maybe it was both. You will need more than that to stop me, children. His voice boomed like thunder from the top of the monstrous water slide. The sound of the beast dying inside had ceased, and now there was only the sound of his voice and the crackle of flames burning all around us. In the distance, I could hear the wail of a fire truck siren and perhaps a police car coming with it. We need to go, said Ben, pulling my arm. We can't save her, man. We gotta go. I'm sorry. Marissa was gone, too. But we met up with her outside the park during our escape. She had gotten away after seeing what happened to Clem. 
unable to stop it. The three of us ran from there and got away without incident. Our small town police force never did figure out who started the fire. We were all devastated after that night. I thought for sure we had lost Clementine. But then, three nights later, I heard something rap against my window. Like a pine cone or a small pebble. A few seconds after that, it happened again. I opened the window and looked down to see a familiar face. At least, half familiar. It was Clementine. She looked up at me and her green eyes met mine, sad but hopeful. I heard myself gasp and it seemed like the world was spinning in circles around me. I backed up, unable to control my shaking legs. They propelled me away from the window, away from my would-be girlfriend who stood outside, despite the fact that she was dead. When I looked back out there again, she was gone. My voice caught in my throat as I called after her, trying to get her to come back. Clementine was alive. But she did not look like how I remembered her. Her face was split down the center like a black and white cookie. Like Two-Face from Batman or Hell from Norse mythology. On one side was the freckle-faced girl I had fallen in love with. On the other was a burnt and melted visage, purple and black with mangled and warped scar tissue. Muscle and bone could be seen beneath that, shining bits of skull protruding. But she was alive. And I got the impression it was still really her. Uncle Bob's Wicked and Wild Water Park is open for the season. God help us all. The smell of sunscreen and chlorine fills the air yet again, and as I walk around the park doing my managerial duties, I'm reminded constantly of how much I'm missing out on. My youth, my summers, and plenty more than that. Gone to this hellhole. All around me are people my own age, laughing and flirting, having fun in the sun, while I take laps around the park in my sticky-with-sweat polyester uniform, attempting to keep the employees somewhat in line. Basically ensuring they show up for work and aren't blatantly high or drunk. When I started the saga, I told you all these things happened to me a couple years ago when I was 16. I'm 18 now, and things have only gotten worse since then. Since we set fire to the beast, since Clementine was captured by Uncle Bob and everything turned sour. Thanks to circumstances far beyond any of our control, Uncle Bob was forced to take last year off from his recruitment activities. The water park was shuttered over that time and is only now reopening for the first time in two years. The lost summer, as Uncle Bob called it mournfully, was instead spent upgrading the park's features. All of these tasks were performed by us, of course, his living and undead teenage servants. At least you still have a job, my mom told me reproachfully over dinner one night last summer when I was looking glum. She had been laid off a short while before that and told me I should be happy I was still living there rent-free considering how much money I was making working at the water park. I couldn't even tell her the truth. That I no longer received a paycheck for my indentured servitude. Things were tense for a bit, but she's since gotten a new job and things are looking a bit better. Anyways, summer's back again and the park has opened up for the year. Our nefarious owner is up to his old tricks once again, and several kids have mysteriously disappeared in the wave pool and on other attractions only to reappear later on, much to the surprise of their anxious friends. Uncle Bob instructs us on how to delay these kids' friends from calling their parents for as long as possible, while he sorts out each unique catastrophe in its own special way. I've found I now have little willpower to resist his instructions these days. It's like his controlling influence is a sickness, and any immunity I once had has dwindled away over the past few years, the longer I've been here working for him. These days, Clementine is my only glimmer of hope in the world. The only glimpses I get of her are when she leaves notes outside my bedroom window late at night. She always covers her face with a hood, keeping it cloaked in shadow. After that first time when I saw her and looked so stunned and afraid. 
I whisper to her out the window that she's still beautiful. I leave her notes to show my affection has not dwindled over time. But all she remembers is my initial shocked and horrified reaction at seeing her half-mutilated face, missing flesh and pieces of muscle in places where shining bone protruded. Her eye sockets and tendons and muscles opening her jaw when she spoke were all visible, and I, I still can't help but shudder to think about that. I'm sorry, Clementine. I, I know it wasn't your fault. For the past couple of years, I've tried desperately to think of a way to get her back to her old self again, but all I can come up with is the idea that if we can somehow get rid of Uncle Bob, then maybe, just maybe, everything will go back to normal again. I know it's a long shot, but Clementine, she seems to have a plan. When I was leaving work a few weeks ago, I saw someone peeking from the shadows below a sewer grate, lifting it up just enough so I could see their eyes. Who it was, I couldn't tell, but it, it frightened me badly. Over the next few weeks, I saw the same thing again and again, someone watching me, observing me from the shadows. It wasn't Clementine, I knew that much based on their movements and features. Then, late one night, when I was walking home from work, they grabbed me. All I heard was a rustling sound coming from a shrub off the sidewalk, movement and voices surrounding me, and, and then I was plunged into darkness as someone shoved a sack over my head and rough hands laid hold of my arms and picked me up, carrying me away. I tried to scream, terrified, unsure what was happening or who was doing this to me. The hands which held me roughly were slippery and wet, a smell of rot and decay emanating from my captors. It was difficult to breathe in their stink as they dragged me back towards the water park, kicking and screaming. Uncle Bob was finally going to turn me. I knew it. My life was over. I had worked as a contracted employee for too long, far longer than anyone else. For a time, I had thought I was special, that he was going to let me live, but it was not to be. At least I would get to be with Clementine. That was the one thing that kept me from breaking. Kept my mind from snapping like a dry twig. They dragged me down the stairs and along musty-smelling corridors, down more stairs and into what I assumed were sewers beneath the park. It stunk like human waste in still water. Bugs buzzed around my head and landed on my face, some of them biting me, despite my muffled screams of protest. Rats and mice could be heard on the floor, but I could not see them through the bag which covered my head, cloaking the world in darkness. I felt them brushing against my legs, though, when I cringed and gripped my teeth, hoping they wouldn't climb up my shoes and ankles as I picture them doing just that. Their furry, diseased bodies bumped up against my shins, and I couldn't stop myself from yelping in panicked fear a couple times. Finally, it seemed my kidnappers were satisfied, and we'd reached our destination. They pulled the bag off my head, and I blinked against the bright lights, which assaulted me like an interrogation room in a police station. Mutilated faces surrounded me, their grotesque features barely visible in the shadowy room, in the halo of the bright lights which blinded me. Zombie kids in various states of decay huddled close around me on all sides. The stench was extraordinary. Like the smell of month-old roadkill mixed with stagnant, coppery blood. Like a dead raccoon in your attic that you find a year after expiration. Like an abandoned slaughterhouse or a broken trash compactor full of old meat. You're here, said a familiar voice, kind, warm, filled with concern. We've been waiting, said the same voice, only different. Now cold, impassive. Clementine was standing in front of me, her head turned so that the rotting, dead flesh looked at me. Worms and maggots feasting and squirming within, her right eye puffy and black with necrotic tissue. Her face still split down the middle, alive on the left, decaying corpse flesh on the right. Clementine? What's going on? What is this place? A cold, hard laugh came from her then. But that was cut off abruptly when her beautiful face turned to look at me again, this time the living side of it that I knew so well and had fallen in love with. She smiled and spoke with sincerity and warmth once again, but the words were serious and grave. This is where we've been hiding. Where we've been planning our attack against him. Against the son of a bitch who did this to all of us. Her face turned, revealing the corpse flesh once more. 
and her voice changed back, causing my chest to tighten with fear. I realized then this was not the same girl I had fallen in love with at first sight, the one who had saved my life. This was someone else. At least half of her, anyways. A knife gleamed in the dull light, and I realized she was holding a long blade behind her back. We're going to kill Uncle Bob, Jordan. Are you with us? Or are you against us? She gripped the knife more tightly as I hesitated and waited for my response. I only hoped that when I replied, it would be the answer she wanted to hear. How do you kill an immortal being? We had seen Uncle Bob standing in the midst of a burning pyre, laughing like a demigod. He could breathe underwater, blending in like an octopus in the reef. He could move around the park with impunity, seemingly invisible at times. The water park was his habitat, and he was the alpha predator, the top of the food chain great white shark of the place. How do you kill that? Still, we knew it was the only way, and while I worked my last day shift before the big event, I was forced to consider again how dangerous it all was. Standing on the shore of the wave pool, I watched as the crowd went up and down in lazy parabolas, sinking and rising with the swells. Many were lounging in bright yellow inner tubes, others dangling from the pool walls in the deep end like underage Spider-Men screaming with joyous abandon as the lifeguards shouted and blew their whistles at them. The sunburnt masses of teens were oblivious to the dangers lurking below the clear blue water. A couple summers ago I nearly drowned right where you're swimming, I wanted to yell. The girl of my dreams saved my life and now she's a half-dead zombie and we're planning on killing someone together later tonight. I didn't yell that of course, but Part of me wanted to for some perverse reason. Just like part of me can't help picturing what it would be like to fall off an overpass and land in the midst of the speeding traffic below whenever I walk over a highway bridge on my way to work. Is that weird? Maybe I just have a vivid imagination. I felt like I had to get it all out there, all these secrets and lies and deceits, despite the deadly consequences, just to see what would happen. But that was probably just Uncle Bob's influence, I realized, as I came out of the trance, shaking my head. He couldn't read my mind, but he had spies everywhere, and his influence on me was strong and difficult to negotiate. I had to be vigilant. The sun was beating down hard on my neck, and I felt sweat dripping down my back, swamping my shoulders and armpits in the thick polyester uniform. I decided to go stand in the shade for a few minutes. I went over to a nearby concession stand where there was a small lineup. We were allowed free tap water, no soda, at any of the concession stands, but we didn't get preferential treatment. We had to stand in line just like everyone else. What's up, buddy? A guy standing in front of me in line was eyeballing me, and I wanted to ask him what the hell he wanted. I wasn't in the mood for a joking kid who thought I was his punchline. You work here? He asked, the snooty grin spreading wider. He lowered his shades and looked me up and down. He had long, wavy blonde hair and was wearing a bright orange bathing suit, a white tank top, and flip-flops. Yeah? What's up with the owner of this place? I hear he's nuts. I wasn't sure what to say. Part of me wanted to recruit the guy on our mission, but that was far too blatant, and for all I knew, he was a spy. I decided to err on the side of caution. I wouldn't know about that. He seems completely normal to me. The line was moving, but the guy wasn't. I, I pointed ahead, but he just ignored me. I noticed again that he was a half foot bigger than me, and he had some rather large muscles. I wondered if we were going to have a problem. My adrenaline began to kick in as he ignored my attempts to move the line forward and just stared right through me instead. He began to emit a low growl, and his upper lip quivered, revealing sharp incisors. The sun was beating down hot on my neck, and the shade looked so close. The guy was probably just high on meth or something, I decided. These things happen. I began to walk away, then edged around him nervously, moving gradually towards the concession stand very awkwardly. 
He turned mechanically and followed me, taking long, deliberate strides inching closer, still growling low in his throat like a dog. I really didn't want to turn my back on him. I moved away from him towards the cool shade, thinking I would ask the clerk at the concession stand to call for police or for some backup to kick the guy out. I looked back quickly and found the line had cleared away with unnatural speed. The area was abandoned. I was now by myself with a scary-looking guy and the clerk behind the counter. Hey, call for somebody to come here quickly. This guy's all hopped up on something, I said without looking at the employee. There was no answer, but I had sworn I had seen someone standing behind the counter a moment before. The long-haired kid moved a step closer, looming large over me now. He was still growling, fists clenched, cords standing out on the side of his neck. Did you hear me? I asked, agitated now, afraid to turn around. Call the cops. This guy looks like he's about to eat my face or something. No answer. The terrifying figure stepped closer, and I spun around, ready to jump into the booth to get away. I froze, surprised to see Uncle Bob, of all people, standing behind the counter instead of the clerk. He was dressed all in white with the paper hat, red bow tie, name tag, and everything. He would have looked ridiculous if not for the fact that it was all so horrifying, like seeing an adult dressed in child's clothing waiting for you in a dark alley at night. What the hell was he doing working behind the counter of a snow cone stand? It caught me off guard, and I felt for a moment as if my heart stopped beating in my chest before it kicked in again and began to pound rapidly. He smiled and seemed amused by my horror. I had just been thinking about shouting how we were all going to kill him, and now he was standing right in front of me. His eyes bore into mine as the low growling continued from behind me. I felt sure then that he could read my mind as he watched me with growing interest. You're planning on killing me, aren't you? Good luck with that, kid. I heard his mocking voice in my mind as plainly as if he were speaking to me. I hoped it was just my imagination, but then wondered if it was just wishful thinking. Hello, Jordan. Hi, Uncle Bob. His hands were behind his back and he leaned forward expectantly. Are you thirsty, Jordan? I nodded, my mouth dry. I hadn't realized before just how much I needed a drink. It felt like I hadn't taken a sip of water for a week, a month even. I couldn't remember the last time. How on earth had I forgotten to hydrate on such a hot summer day? That's how you get heat stroke. Even a rookie knows that. Here you go, my boy, he said, handing me an ice-cold, frigid-looking bottle dripping with perspiration. I licked my dry lips with my sandpaper tongue and reached out for it desperately. As my fingers touched it, he pulled it back out of my reach and my knees buckled with desperation. A hoarse groan escaped my lips and I looked to see him grinning even more broadly than before, relishing every moment of this exchange. You want this? Then tell me. What is she planning? I know she's planning something. Now tell me. The hot breath of the guy behind me was on my neck. It made me feel claustrophobic since he was standing so close I could feel his body heat. Uh, who? I asked, playing dumb. You're a little bitch. The one you've been seeing behind my back in the sewers. Outside your window at night. You think I don't see you? I see everything. He lifted me up by my shirt collar, and I looked around to see the entire park all around us was abandoned. All noise had ceased. Everyone was gone except the three of us. I don't know. I don't know. I shouted, resisting his eyes as they bore into mine and attempting with every fiber of my being not to let my fear take hold. Think harder. He was holding me up by my throat now, and the world began to turn shades of yellow, then red, and finally black before I managed to squeak out a word. I'd regret saying it, but at that point it was done. That one word seemed to be enough for him. I fell to the concrete and skinned my elbow badly, and when I looked up, he was gone. Ez was the guy with the long hair. Screams were coming from somewhere nearby, and I realized it was me. There were suddenly customers in line again, and a normal kid was behind the counter, serving them colorful, fruit-flavored snow cones. It felt like I had fallen into an alternate reality for a moment and come back again, just like that day beneath the wave pool. You okay, dude? You don't look so hot. There were people reaching down to help me up, and their concerned faces told me everything I needed to know. 
They thought I was having a breakdown of some sort. To their eyes, I had just been standing there one second, and then I was on the ground screaming a moment later. Water. I croaked. My mouth and throat were parched as if I hadn't taken a drink in days. Maybe I hadn't. Was Uncle Bob messing with my mind to get information out of me? Or just to punish me? Both, probably. Get this guy some water! People rushed around, and a few moments later I had a tall glass of water in front of me, which I proceeded to take long, greedy sips from until I started to gag. Dude, you really need to stay hydrated better. It's summer. What are you, a rookie? I finished my shift and left the park, feeling guilty. But why should I feel guilty? I couldn't remember. There was something I was supposed to do, but I couldn't remember that either. It was like parts of my mind had gone missing. That feeling was wholly unsettling, and I went home with an uneasiness that didn't go away. A growing sense that I was forgetting something really important began to gnaw at me. I thought about it and thought about it, going round and round in circles in my mind, and then it came to me finally. I was supposed to be killing Uncle Bob. He had gotten to me when he confronted me at the concession stand. He he had wiped out that part of my memory, or at least tried to. But I had gotten to him as well. Bolting out of the house, I rode my bike back to the water park as fast as I could. I checked the time on my phone as I fell down the street and saw I was running late, but if I hurried, I could still get there in time. Clementine was waiting for me in the sewer tunnels. Her face was shadowed in darkness, and I could barely make out her half-mangled features. You're late. I know, sorry. She didn't say anything more about it, so I didn't explain, just followed after her as she began to quickly march down the tunnel. I suddenly realized we were not going to the location she had told me was the target. She was taking me somewhere else. The storage room where Uncle Bob kept our life contracts was on the other side of the park, and Bob would be guarding it closely since I had confessed it was our target. But it wasn't. You know that even after this is done, even if this all works out, things will never be like they were between us. You know that, right? Her words shocked me. I hadn't even considered it. I had just assumed that when this was all over, things would be normal again. That everything would go back to how it was when we first met. Why not? Why can't things be the way they were? I I miss you. She spun around, and even in the darkness, I saw tears in her eyes as she spoke. Because just look at me. Look at my face. Her half-dead, half-human face was split straight down the middle. Shadows obscuring most of the worst details, but I could still see the necrotic flesh on one side, puckered and gray with worms and millipedes crawling in and out of the eye socket. It's never going to be the same. Now, let's just get this over with. I can't... I just... I can't talk about it right now. It's, it's hard enough as it is. She began to walk again. From behind, I saw her. Half of her hair was still orange, while the other side was now mostly bald. Dead scraps falling out in clumps with her movements. Finally, we reached a ladder which took us down one more level. It was dark down there and I could barely see. Okay, the rest of them should be setting fire to the park as we speak. By the time we get back up there, this place will be nothing but cinders. But that won't kill Uncle Bob. He'll just rebuild. Using us like labor like he did last time. Clementine's voice was quiet, and I followed her along the narrow passageway. Right, but you said you had a plan. You have a plan, don't you? She had said during our planning that my contract with Uncle Bob had left me susceptible, but that she wouldn't get into the specifics of it. It hadn't occurred to me until now, hearing the hesitation in her voice, that she didn't want to tell me what she was going to do. Where are you taking me? Clementine let out a long sigh and rested her hand on the door we'd come to in the darkness. This isn't going to be easy. I knew that. But I had no idea just how difficult it was going to be. What isn't going to be easy, Clem? Show him! Shut up! Just shut up! It was her other side, the dead one speaking. It had a different voice, hoarse and harsh, laced with malice. You're going to have to show him eventually. Get it over with. Why else did you come down here? What else if not now? Why can't you just shut up? She pushed the door open and it revealed a dim blue light within. Clementine entered and I followed after her, 
unable to resist my curiosity. Despite a growing unease, a worry which had crept into my gut, leaving a cinder block of dread there. I walked in behind her and found the room was filled with a huge aquarium. It took up most of the enormous underground room. A gigantic creature filled most of the tank. The thing looked like a large, flesh-colored octopus covered in a blue-purple spotty pattern. It had many eyes which were all closed as if it were sleeping, and breathed in and out regularly. There were hoses and wires hooked up to equipment on either side of the room which looked complex and advanced, far beyond anything known on Earth. What the hell is this? I whispered, terrified of waking the thing up. Clementine walked up to the tank and laid her hand on the glass gently. Then she turned around and looked me dead in the eyes. Say hello to the real Uncle Bob. It turned out that Clementine did have a plan. Not an altruistic or good plan, but a plan nonetheless. What do you mean, the real Uncle Bob? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was the largest octopus I had ever laid eyes upon, being held aquatic prisoner under the park. But Clementine was claiming this was actually the devil who had caused all of our woes. There's something I need to tell you about me. Something I was scared to tell you before, but... Well, I'm still scared, but... You're gonna find out soon enough. What are you talking about? What the hell's going on, Clementine? I wanted to tell you sooner, I just... I wasn't sure how you would react. Tell him! The decaying side of her face was screaming again. I am... Jordan... I'm... How do I say this? Um, Uncle Bob, he's my dad. My jaw dropped and I stared at her in shock. I backed away, suddenly terrified to be near her. She looked up at me and appeared crestfallen. She had the same look as when I saw her mutilated face after the accident. I told you he wouldn't understand, said the dead side of her. With a cold look on her face, she ripped out one of the tubes from the side of the tank and water began to spray on the floor, gushing from the opening like a fire hose. Alarms began to sound from the machinery in the corner. Clementine pulled an electrical cord, then another and another. Her face was a blank mask, emotionless. Sparks flew, and with all the water on the ground, I was scared of being electrocuted. Backing away from her, I saw the look on her face of betrayal and spurned hope. My hand found the door behind me and I pushed it open just as the eyes of the massive octopus popped open and it began to thrash about in the glass cage. I ran out of the room and fled from there, down the dank basement tunnels and up the ladder and out of there as quickly as I could. When I got to the surface, popping up from a sewer grate and sticking my head out like an escaped convict, I saw the water park was on fire in the distance. My heart was pounding and I was sweating from my escape. My mind tried desperately to make sense of what I had just seen. The only conclusion I could come to was that she had just committed patricide. Clementine said Uncle Bob was her father, but that strange psychic octopus alien creature was likely not capable of giving birth to a human child. My guess was that it had been telepathically controlling a human host, the one we knew as Uncle Bob, and that Uncle Bob had found a woman to partner with at some point who had given birth to Clementine. I really didn't know any of that for sure, but it made sense to me. Another part of my mind pictured the spider creatures from Alien that latch onto people's faces and then implant their young down the throat of the unsuspecting victim. For all I knew, Clementine had a little octopus creature living inside of her, pulling her gears and operating her like a piece of machinery but that seemed more unlikely. All these thoughts ran through my mind as I ran from the water park as fast as my legs could carry me, and at a certain point I heard a loud, shrill, ear-splitting scream from behind me where I'd come from. It cut through the air like a knife in the darkness and pierced my ears. They ached for days and I still hear a faint ringing sound non-stop. But the good thing was I felt him let go. I felt Uncle Bob's grasp on me disappear, his control. It was gone. She was gone. 
I was sure of it. There was no way she could have survived that. Or so I thought. A few days passed and the fire was all anyone in town was talking about. Everyone said it was sad the owner had passed away. Even though he was a controversial character, Uncle Bob was a fixture around town, and his supposed love of children was well known. A local reporter began to ask around town and came to talk to me since I had worked there for so long. He wanted to know if the tales about the place were true, if it had been as wild at the water park as the stories said. I can't really talk about it, I told him. I'm still under contract. The words slipped out naturally, and I didn't realize I'd even uttered them until later. I see, he said dubiously. Okay, just one more question. Do you have any thoughts on the new owner? She's a bit young to be running an amusement park of that size, don't you think? This is the first I'm hearing of it. Uh, what's the new owner's name, I asked, already knowing the answer already knowing who my new boss was going to be. Clementine Sweeney, he said. Did you ever work with her over at the water park? I let out a little chuckle. Uh, yeah, she, uh, she saved my life once upon a time. The reporter raised his eyebrows, brought his pen up to the notepad once more, and settled in looking curious. I got a story about that, actually, if you want to hear it. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Sewall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blair Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajetti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, and Big Joe. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.